All righty, why don't we um, take a seat and we will get started on today's festivities. Um, today we have uh, primarily a highly migratory species and then some ground fish, but I'll first turn to our executive director, Merrick Burden for morning announcements. Yes, good morning, Mr. Chairman and council members. A couple announcements this morning. Uh, one, just to keep you all updated on uh, COVID, uh, have not heard any news of any additional cases this morning. Um, so that is uh, good news. Um, on a less good news uh, slant, um, I recently learned that our colleague Dave Jenks passed away recently um, of a brain tumor, I believe was the, was the issue. And as many of you know, Dave was a pretty influential figure in this process, um, did a lot with the, Marie, the Midwater Trawlers Cooperative, had a big impact on our Trawl IQ program, um, and he will be missed. So I'm sorry to hear of that, I uh, wanted to let you all know. Um, and that is the, the end of my morning comments, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you very much. So we will get started. I understand that John Ugaritz is in the chair for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. So welcome, John. And we'll get started on agenda item G1, the NIMS report. I'll turn to Kit for an overview. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I will turn it over to Lyle shortly. Uh, just to mention, uh, there is no Southwest Cen Center uh, Science Center report, although we listed it on the agenda. Um, and uh, then there is one supplemental public comment letter that came in. It's uh, on our website. Aside from that, uh, I'll turn it over to Lyle to give the uh, region report. All right, welcome Lyle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Our NIFS report provides updates on two issues, both related to the drift gillnet fishery. First, the West Coast Region Observer Program has been coordinating with Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission staff to make observer data more accessible through APEX reports stored in the PACFIN reporting system. These reports allow for more functionality in filtering data by fishing season or calendar year to allow users to generate data summaries in Microsoft Excel format. Observer data through the 2021-2022 fishing season are now available in APEX report, um, accessible through PACFIN. And at this time, the observed catch, trip, and set data are complete. But the APEX reports do not yet include total effort data, which is needed to determine observer coverage levels. When the APEX reports are fully functional, they will include this information along with metadata. Our report includes two tables which summarize the available observer data for the drift gillnet fisheries 2021-2022 season. Table 1 is an observed catch summary and table 2 contains details on fleet and observer activity and percent coverage. Second, on May 10th, NIMS announced we are issuing a permit under the Marine Mammal Protection Act to authorize the incidental but not intentional take of the Endangered Species Act listed California Oregon Washington stocks of humpback whales and sperm whales in the drift gillnet fishery. We have determined that the fishery meets all necessary permit requirements for a negligible, negligible impact determination under the MMPA and those requirements are listed on our report. More, more information can be found on our website and that concludes my report. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Are there any questions on the NIMS report? Dr. Braby. Thank you, and, and thank you for the report. I just wanted to ask about the, the progress on the recovery plan, um, and if you could give us some details about what that process and timeline is gonna look like. I don't have full details on the recovery plan for either of those species. More information should be available on, on the website for the NID. There could be links there, but I don't have that personally. I apologize. Thank you. Any further questions on the NIMS report? I'm gonna go to, I'm not seeing uh, the online right now. So uh, John Ugaritz, if you have a comment or further a question of why I'll speak up, otherwise, We'll move on. All right, so that, thank you for the NIMS report. Uh, we have no other reports under this agenda item. 
we have uh, no public comment. And so uh, let's see if there is any council discussion on this agenda item. All right. Kit, how are we doing? We're doing good. All right. Well, that's, that's really good to hear. So, um, may set a record there. Hopefully, I don't think the whole day will go this way, but. So let's move on to agenda item G2. I think there's a change in seats. If uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service will give them a moment to do that. All right, Kit, why don't you uh, get us started here? Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll just read from the situation summary on the international management activities. Since the March 2022 council meeting, the National Marine Fisheries Service has held three stakeholder workshops focused on harvest strategy development for Pacific bluefin tuna and North Pacific albacore. The Pacific bluefin workshops were held on April 1st and May 4th. The first workshop solicited input on the development of a harvest strategy at the international level, while the second workshop followed up on harvest strategy recommendations, along with a discussion of considerations for domestic management. The North Pacific Albacore workshop was held on April 5th and focused on harvest strategy development in light of the completed management strategy evaluation. NIMS will report on the outcomes of these meetings. Uh, the, uh, International Scientific Committee will review stock assessments for North Pacific striped marlin, North Pacific blue shark, and Pacific bluefin tuna uh, at their meeting this summer in July. The bluefin assessment is an update assessment rather than a benchmark assessment. Based on the stock assessment information, the ISC will make conservation recommendations to the WCPFC Northern Committee. Attachment one is a draft executive summary from the 2022 Pacific Bluefin Stock Assessment, which was provided to the IATTC Stock Scientific Advisory Committee for their meeting in May. The assessment indicates that spawning stock biomass reached its initial rebuilding target in 2019, and projections indicate that under all examined scenarios, the second rebuilding target, that's 20% uh, of uh, unfished biomass is reached by 2029, which is 10 years after the initial rebuilding target uh, with at least a 60% probability. And under the current conservation measures, the second rebuilding target would be reached by 2023 with at least a 60% probability. As of this writing, the, the dates and venue of the next Northern Committee meeting have not been announced, although the WCPFC 18 summary report, that is the report of their last annual meeting in December, states that the meeting will be held in Japan. In the past, in-person Northern Committee meetings have been held the first week of September, but in the past two years, they were held online in October. Should the council wish to make any recommendations to the US delegation for this meeting, you could make them now at this meeting, and that's under the assumption that the Northern Committee meeting will happen that first week in September. And then um, if it is deferred into October, um, you could you'd have a second chance to follow up at your September meeting. And then the uh, IATTC has scheduled their um, 99th slash 100th meetings uh, at the beginning of August. The 99th meeting is just to um, select a new executive director and the 100th is their regular meeting. At the council's March 20, 2022 meeting, NEMS reported on US priorities for the IATTC 
and uh, they uh, will update you here. There is one of their reports in the uh, in the meeting materials that um, covers that. And then, likewise, they have in their report have a comprehensive list of upcoming regional fishery management organization and relating meetings, related meetings. So you can look at that. Um, I didn't uh, include that here since they have that information. Um, the IATTC and WCPFC Northern Committee Joint Working Group on Pacific Blue Bluefin Tuna Management uh, is uh, has scheduled a meeting actually subsequent to the uh, drafting of this summary. Uh, they announced their meeting and um, Basically, it's uh, July 11th to 13th, I believe. And so that's intended to, so it can occur before the August IATTC meeting. And in, in, should there be substantive recommendations that need to be taken up at that venue? Uh, they, the J JWG, the Joint Working Group, will be reviewing the management and fishing activities of member countries, discussing whether to recommend any modifications to the current conservation measure for Pacific blue, blue fin. So there, there's one in the IATTC referenced here, C2105 and a companion, if you will, resolution for the Western Central Pacific, CMM 2021-02. And they will also work, uh, be working to further develop the long-term harvest strategy for Pacific bluefin tuna. And uh, we have Ms. Dorothy Lohman with us today. She's the Joint Working Group co-chair so she can um, give you an overview of what, what's happening in, in, um, in that forum. So um, in terms of the materials that you have, uh, there was one document, which was the executive summary of the Bluefin assessment in your advanced briefing book. Um, and then there's a supplemental attachment, which is simply the announcement of that joint working group meeting in July. And then there are uh, six supplemental NIMS reports covering a variety of topics, but focusing on those activities that uh, I overviewed in the first, the beginning of this summary. And then you have uh, reports from your advisory bodies, the HMS management team, and also the advisory sub panel. And there is also, I believe, one uh, written public comment on our website under this agenda item. So, um, with that, just to, to read the council action, it's to provide recommendations on U.S. positions at upcoming meetings and other forums as appropriate. And that concludes my overview. All right, thank you very much, Kit. Are there any questions of Kit on his overview? All right, thank you, Kit. So before we go to the NIMS report, we have a couple of other uh, reports. Uh, we'll start with uh, our former council chair, Dorothy Lohman, who, um, see, I looked up the full title here, um, co-chair of the joint IATTC WCPFC Northern Committee Working Group on Pacific Bluefin Tuna. So welcome, Dorothy. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair, um, and um, it's good to see all of you guys. And so I just kind of wanted to uh, give you a broad overview. Kit kind of covered the basic agenda items that are being covered at this, at our seventh joint working group meeting. Um, I, you know, in addition to what he had in the um, briefing materials or in a situations overview, um, and you have in your materials a summary of the uh, stock assessment that was done, the update stock assessment. So that the good news on that is that we are rebuilding Bluefin rapid, more rapidly than we thought. Um, the, um, what that means for the joint working group uh, work, however, is that we need to spend a little bit more focused time on developing our long-term harvest strategy for how things will be managed post um, rebuilding. Um, you know, if you can recall the target date originally for reaching the second rebuilding um, target of 20% uh, was, uh, 
2032. And we may need it as early as uh, the end of the fishing year of 2023. So you can see that's quite a, a shift in the timing. Um, you know, it takes a while to uh, reach consensus on all the things you need, um, reference points, harvest control rules, uh, uh, management objectives. So uh, at this meeting, we do want to start to really uh, be a little more focused on what, how are we going to get there? What are the important elements? How can we make progress on it? Who will be responsible as we move forward uh, on a potentially slightly, I, I, you know, it will take longer than 2023 um, to get there, but, um, but we do need to make progress and think about what, uh, how we proceed after we reach that target. So um, that will be uh, a larger, perhaps, uh, agenda item than it has in the past. So I think that's, I think uh, Ryan's got a lot more, uh, you know, substantive material on <laughs> related to some of those uh, uh, tasks that now forward, um, but um, that's it for now. If anyone has any questions, it will be on July 11th through the 13th. We've been a little more challenged this year because um, unfortunately we're not meeting in person, but also we're challenged because it overlaps with the ISC, who's the science provider for, you know, uh, uh, to the Northern Committee and, and therefore to the Joint Working Group also. Um, it overlaps with their plenary meeting uh, where they review and, and uh, approve the, the working group's work. And, uh, and so we're likely to have the virtual meeting starting in the um, later afternoon to um, early evening or maybe later evening <laughs> uh, in order to try to be sure that when we need to have our science providers available for, uh, for advice that we can have their, their expertise. So that's all I have. Anyone has any questions? Thank you very much, Dorothy. Are there questions of Dorothy? Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now hear from uh, our council member, fellow, our colleague, Krista Svensson, who's commissioner on the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission. All right, well, thank you and good morning. As we have heard from both Kit and Dorothy, uh, it's been busy for HMS, uh, both through the spring and will be continuing throughout the summer. And um, there are really a number of reports in there that have been summarized and I'm sure we will be discussing, but I am choosing to keep my comments focused on a few meetings that we haven't heard a lot about uh, that have happened in the last week. So the first would be the US-Canada um, Albacore Treaty. And that meeting was a consultation that occurred on Tuesday, June 7th. All in all, the exchange went fairly smoothly, which was encouraging. Um, sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't. The primary talking points were the need for the US to increase the logbook submission rate and um, in general, the benefits of having the treaty. And I would just recommend that as we're talking um, to Albacore troll and pull online fishermen who are considering making trips into Canada this year um, that a couple of specific items were raised. The first being that some vessels are only carrying the cover page of their license and they really need to have a full copy of that license with them when they're up in Canada. Uh, the terms and conditions of those licenses are contained within the full document. Um, and that includes the time frame for when the license is valid. So just making people aware of that. The second is that Canadian licenses are only valid for albacore. And so incidental bycatch, including things like Humboldt squid, which some people use for bait, um, is prohibited as is personal consumption of other fishes. So just being aware uh, that if you're up there fishing for albacore, please stick to albacore. And then the next meeting tentatively is set for around the week of Halloween. So maybe think about marking your calendars for that one. The second meeting that occurred last week was on Wednesday, June 8th, and that was the PAC meeting for uh, WCPFC. 
A number of items were discussed, including how we plan on prioritizing issues for 2022. And when those recommendations are put forth, we'll provide an update. Um, key to West Coast stakeholders are, you know, Pacific Bluefin and North Pacific Albacore Harvest Strategies and Control Rules will be coming up. Um, both at ICAT, the Northern Committee, and possibly WCPFC. Um, and I'll note that um, in the uh, North Pacific Albacore MSC workshop that was held in April, I, I attended, um, the June meeting was designated as one of the vehicles for stakeholders to provide comments. So we may hear some of that today, hopefully, um, and uh, through our advisory reports. Um, on the commercial side, I've heard from several North Pacific stakeholders not to include harvest control rules in the U.S. proposal until 2023. Uh, this is in line with the Northern Committee's uh, work plan as outlined this last year. Um, so just putting that forward. And then um, to make sure that we give credit to our REC folks that are also active participants, um, I really appreciate that they continue to highlight the need for work around Northern Stripe Marlin. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions, um, but I'm looking forward to working with many of you and seeing many of you at the upcoming international HMS meetings. Thank you very much, Krista, for the report and for your work. Uh, are there any questions of Krista on her report? All right, thank you very much, Krista. We'll now go to the NIPS report and Ryan Wolf, and you might want to change your name. There, so no one's confused. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so NIMS has provided six supplemental reports. Um, my apologies, those weren't in the advanced briefing book. Uh, so I do want to take a little bit of time to walk through them today. Um, however, I'm going to take a slightly different approach. I'm going to try to address this a little bit more thematically versus walking through them uh, chronologically. I think this will be easier to digest, to digest. So I'm going to start kind of with the overarching international issues, and then I'll turn to everything Albacore, and then I'll turn to everything Bluefin. So NIMS report one is our broad overview. It gives an update on the IATTC meetings that have occurred since March, talks about our priorities for the upcoming meeting uh, in the joint IATTC WC, WPFC working group on Pacific Bluefin Tuna that you'll um, hear more about, as well as a list of other international meetings. <clears throat> Regarding priorities for the United States at this upcoming IATTC meeting, uh, we're going to continue ongoing efforts, as we have been for some time, to improve compliance, uh, to establish a minimum size circle hook for our sea turtle bycatch and, and that resolution, uh, and also to maintain progress on the Commission's electronic monitoring work plan. As far as resolutions and proposals for this year, uh, since we adopted um, three-year measures for tropical tuna and bluefin at <clears throat> last year's meeting, um, the U.S. focus will be working on a proposal uh, regarding an albacore harvest strategy, which I'm going to go into more detail uh, in a minute. <clears throat> Other priorities for this year is selecting an executive director. So if you're confused why there's a 99 slash 100th meeting of the commission, the 99th meeting is on August 1st. It's in the morning and it is solely to select the executive director. That's the only agenda item. The hundreds meeting is the essentially what you would um, think of as the normal annual meeting for this year. I did want to call out a couple other things in this report as it relates to not just these commissions, but uh, a number of them. Um, we are soliciting uh, NIMS is NOAA is uh, nominations for non-federal commissioners for a number of RFMOs. Um, there are a number of links here into various federal registers and websites <clears throat> and information uh, for folks that want to put their names in. Uh, I believe it's open through July 8th. Um, the administration is looking for interested nominees, for, again, for non-federal commissioners. Uh, that will be a pool they will pull from for the following uh, regional fisheries management organizations, uh, IATTC, ICAT and WCPFC, so those three tuna RFMOs, 
<clears throat> uh, the North Atlantic Salmon Conservation Organization, or NASCO, the North Pacific Anadromous Fish Commission, or NPAFC, uh, the North Atlantic Fisheries Organization, or NAFO, uh, IPHC, which you're all familiar with, and one of my favorite acronyms to read, SPERFMO, um, the South Pacific Regional Fisheries Management Organization. Uh, the goal here is trying to not only improve transparency regarding these positions, um, the availability of them, and the amount that we do um, have the lead for and that we do appoint. Uh, we're trying to promote equity uh, and hope to establish a really diverse pool of candidates for these positions. <clears throat> uh, I will underscore this does not mean it's a wholesale um, change of current commissioners. Um, current commissioners have been asked to indicate their interest in remaining in these positions and will also be part of that process and part of that pool. Um, so this will play out and hopefully this will end up with um, streamlining of uh, presidential appointments, which usually uh, are attached to a number of these and are, are sometimes a challenge to get through. Finally, um, I won't go and read them here. You can see there's a various list of upcoming international meetings, which I just I mentioned at the beginning. Okay, turning to Albacore. So I'll start with our supplemental report two. On April 5th, uh, NIMP's Pacific Islands and West Coast region hosted a virtual meeting to gather stakeholder input on North Pacific Albacore on a harvest strategy for both the IATTC and the WCPFC. We were looking for comments on management objectives, on limit reference points, target reference points, uh, and in anything related to <clears throat> general process and next steps. Uh, there's a very long detailed summary of our discussion, which you can read, but I do want to provide at least a summary of the comments since we sent this in a little late. Um, and it may be relevant to discussions today. Uh, regarding management objectives, participants uh, suggested that the WCPFC objective that's currently in resolution there be revised using objectives identified uh, through the stakeholder process as well as tested in the Albuquerque MSC. Regarding limit reference points, um, in general, the majority of participants expressed support for either a limit reference point of 14% unfished stock, spawning stock biomass or 20% unfished SSB. Regarding target reference points, uh, similar to the comments on limit reference points, it was suggested it be chosen from one of those tested in the MSC, and in particular, either F40 or F50, because both appeared to achieve the conservation target. Regarding process and next steps, participants supported proposing a harvest strategy at both RFMOs this year, uh, beginning, of course, just with general timing, uh, of the annual meetings with the IATTC. Uh, some participants suggested proposing a full harvest strategy, including control rules, not just objectives and the reference points, <clears throat> because at a minimum, this would start to socialize those concepts, even if members weren't ready to adopt the full strategy yet. Um, so that's my summary. Again, there's a lot more detail that you can see uh, recorded from that discussion. But, but given that discussion and the fact that making progress on this strategy, uh, which we deferred because of <clears throat> the ongoing discussions on Tunis last year. Uh, it is a U.S. priority for this meeting, uh, but it's not just a U.S. priority. We have already been approached by the delegations of Canada and Japan, uh, both of which who want to adopt a harvest strategy at IATTC, both of which want to work on a joint proposal for consideration. Um, since we are getting close to, I believe that proposal deadline is July 11th for the IATTC. Uh, so what you can see in your briefing books as NIMP's supplemental report three is a draft proposal um, that reflects where discussions are today. But again, I just want to reiterate, this is draft. You can see there's a lot of bracketed text, which is our international annotation, if you will, for things that are still being discussed. Um, and yet you can see in a number of them, represents a range of, of things that we're considering. Uh, so we're hoping here at the council meeting, <clears throat> not just here, but of course, over the next few weeks, uh, we want input from as many, um, not just the council, stakeholders, anyone who wants to uh, give us input on how we might improve this proposal. Well, we did solicit, as Chris noted, to the PAC um, June 8th to get some advice there. We're going to be using doing the same thing to our IATTC advisory bodies, the General Advisory Committee, 
and our scientific advisory subcommittee, which meets June 29th and 30th. Uh, that will also be before that July 11th proposal deadline. So we're hoping to get a lot of input before things um, get finalized and submitted to the commission for discussion in August. And then finally, turning to Bluefin, um, as Dorothy noted, and thank you to all of Dorothy's continued work uh, and hard efforts in the co-chair role, which is, which is quite challenging at times, especially during, um, and during the pandemic. So we really appreciate that. But that meeting is now set. It will occur July 11th to the 13th. <clears throat> and just as you noted, the stock is rebuilding ahead of schedule. Um, and the fact that there are currently no harvest control rules to dictate management after rebuilding once we've hit that second rebuilding target, which could come as early as next year. Uh, our priority for the United States is to start working on a long-term harvest strategy for bluefin. So to get conversations going, uh, the Pacific Islands region and the West Coast, NIMS, we co-hosted two meetings this year over the past couple months, um, specifically aiming at getting input from stakeholders on the long-term harvest strategy. Um, and they are summarized in NIMS report four. Um, so for our first meeting on April 1st, we solicited feedback on management objectives and performance indicators and participants indicated general support for developing management objectives around four broad categories, that would be safety, status, stability, and yield. And you can see in table one of that report, a list of a broad list of potential operational management objectives and performance indicators that were suggested during the webinar. Then on May 4th, we held a second workshop. This one was facilitated by Kearns and West. It was focused on domestic management, but we gave an overview of the April 1st meeting. Uh, and we also noted that we were seeking additional comments for those that weren't part of that or that still wanted to comment on the long-term harvest strategy if they desired. Uh, and they commented on uh, the risk tolerance of breaching the biomass limit reference point, uh, the importance of maintaining the stock above uh, spawning stock biomass MSY, they gave us some more views on the candidate limit reference point and the proposed performance indicators that were discussed in April. Uh, and there were some comments noting that we should continue to pursue a management strategy evaluation uh, on Bluefin to support developing a long-term harvest strategy. And again, uh, a lot more detail in the report. That's my summary, but you can see that in supplemental report five. And finally, Mr. Chair, <clears throat> uh, we have supplemental report six. Uh, so this is kind of a next step based on those uh, stakeholder meetings. Um, it narrows down. We've narrowed down a little bit some of the indicators and objectives based on feedback we've received. Um, also tried to streamline and re reduce redundancies uh, and reflect uh, key U.S. priorities. Um, so this is another chance for us to get input um, from the council here or others on operational management objectives and performance indicators that are in this. Um, and this is a Again, something that we would consider proposing next month to the joint uh, IATTC WCP, WCPFC working group. So this would be a good time to get feedback on that. Uh, and as I noted, not just here, we'll be doing that through our various advisory bodies and other uh, delegation meetings before we get to those meetings. And thank you for indulging me in my long report, but I had to go through six uh, and I hope I covered um, the range and breadth, but I'm more than happy to take any questions. All right, thank you, Ryan, for that report. Let's see if there are any questions from around the table here or online. John Ugaritz. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Ryan. Just uh, checking, Mr. Chair, can you hear me? You bet. Thanks. Uh, Ryan, I just wanted to clarify, going back to Albacore, strategies you mentioned a july due date and august discussion when would those go into effect assuming they moved forward yeah thank you mr Eugers, for the question so this would be a proposal for a management measure or a horror strategy at the commission it would go into effect essentially once it's adopted by the commission uh, at the end of the august meeting so for 2023? Correct. Any further questions on the NIMS report? 
Thank you, Ryan. Um, we have two further reports. We'll hear from the uh, HMS management team, Celia Barosa. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Celia Barroso with the National Fisheries Service West Coast Region and a member of the HMS management team. This report uh, covers two topics, ultimately, on North Pacific albacore and bluefin tuna. First on albacore, the HMS management team generally supports progress toward an international harvest strategy. The MT evaluated the pros and cons of reference points proposed in NIMS report three and does not have strong opinions about the included options. This report does, however, provide the council with the management team's observations for consideration. The limit reference point of 14% unfished spawning stock biomass generally equates to the level of spawning stock biomass that supports maximum sustainable yield which makes it more conservative than the domestic trigger for an overfish determination under MSA. Uh, that trigger is the minimum stock size threshold. As a result, this limit reference point, if adopted by the Inter-American Tropical Tuna Commission, could help the United States avoid a need to address its relative impact on an overfish stock, while the international community would not be obligated to do so. There was also substantial discussion in the joint briefing with the HMS advisory subpanel on the target reference point, which is represented by fishing intensity. And there is a definition of fishing intensity in the footnote. And this discussion was around whether the management objective under paragraph A2 of that draft proposal would include an intent to constrain the fishery to a fishing intensity below that target reference point. The management team considered a target reference point of F50 as potentially more constraining to international uh, fishing effort than past fishing effort. Given that since 1994, the average fishing intensity has been um, F46, a target reference point of F45 would be unlikely to constrain fishing effort relative to past fishing effort. If there are concerns for potential expansion of a for foreign fisheries in the Pacific Ocean, a target reference point of F50 may be preferable. On Pacific bluefin tuna, the National Marine Fisheries Service briefed the advisory bodies that there are currently no international agreements uh, guiding harvest of bluefin after the stock reaches the internationally agreed second rebuilding target of 20% of unfished spawning stock biomass. Acknowledging that that second rebuilding target may be met within the next couple of years, the management team thinks it's important that the United States continue to prioritize developing a long-term harvest strategy for bluefin. And that concludes the management team report. Thank you. Thank you, Celia. Are there questions on the management team report? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we'll now get uh, the report of the HMS advisory subpanel. Mike Conroy, welcome, Mike. Good morning. and uh, the microphone. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Mike Conroy, member of the HMAS Advisory Subpanel, and I will be uh, introducing our report into the Council record. Um, the HMSAS received a presentation from Celia on recent activities related to Pacific bluefin tuna. We address the stock assessment in two stakeholder meetings separately. With regard to the stock assessment, according to the 2022 update, the stock is likely at levels not seen since the beginning of the population decline in 96. The stock is recovering from historically low levels and has proved resilient with the 2020 spawning stock biomass, spawning stock biomass estimated at 10.2% of that, which would be expected in the absence of fishing. However, recruitment continues to be a concern with observations of low recruitment in eight of the last 10 years. So continued precaution and emphasis on rebuilding is necessary. Uh, the initial rebuilding target was reached in 2019, five years earlier than originally planned by RFMOs. And under current conservation measures, the model projects that the stock could recover to the second rebuilding target by the end of next year. These projection results are highly dependent on assumptions regarding recruitment, so some precaution is warranted. 
The assessment confirms that overfishing had ended in the most recent years if assessed against reference point commonly used by the RFMOs. In 2020, catches of bluefin will likely rise based on the 15% quota increases adopted last year, and the impact of this will not be confirmed until future stock assessments are conducted. The end of overfishing for this stock is a significant milestone for the fishery, and the AS recommends that any changes to management to the management measures do not result in overfishing. We remain concerned that there may be additional efforts by some nations to seek quota increases again during the upcoming joint working group meeting. The AS supports continuation of the current conservation measures until such a time that the second rebuilding target is met. However, in the event that increases in catch are agreed upon, the U.S. should ensure that it will not only that it will not result in overfishing, with a very high probability. In addition, we expect that the U.S. would be allocated additional catch, Western versus Eastern Pacific and U.S. versus Mexico, in order to provide the Eastern Pacific a more equitable split of the Pacific wide harvest and the U.S. a more equitable share of the Eastern Pacific allocation with Mexico. The AS supports NOAA's efforts to prioritize and develop a proposal for the joint working group that will advance a comprehensive harvest strategy for Pacific bluefin with intention to advance manager objectives and performance indicators in 2022. These efforts could be furthered by continuation of development of an MSE for Pacific bluefin, including U.S. analyst capacity. The AS advises that further technical changes under operational management objectives are needed to clarify the U.S. proposal to ensure that it ensures object to ensure that it achieves the objectives agreed by U.S. stakeholders in the recent workshop, particularly that it will maintain stock levels at that which can achieve MSY. We recommend the council support the AS position and communicate that in the form of a recommendation to NIMS as a U.S. position. Um, we briefly touch on the two stakeholder meetings that Celia represented or referenced. The April 1st meeting, AS members who participated in this meeting appreciated the opportunity to share their perspectives and generally agree with the information provided in Table 1 of that NIMS Report 4. With regard to the May 4th meeting, the AS members who participated in this meeting found it very informative and suggest holding meetings like this more frequently. There were a number of topics discussed which may be worthy, worthy of additional discussion and conversation, for example, ranching versus caging versus other forms of delayed harvest, especially as anticipated increases in commercial harvest are allowed. With regard to albacore, uh, we received a presentation from Celia on recent activities related to North Pacific albacore. Uh, we addressed the April 5th stakeholder meeting and the draft IATTC resolution separately. Uh, with regard to the stakeholder meeting, the AS members who attended this meeting very much appreciate how this meeting was conducted, in particular the abilities of Celia, Valerie, and Dr. Steve Teo to communicate these somewhat difficult to understand concepts in ways that were more easily understood. Last year, the Northern Committee of the WCPFC established a work plan for North Pacific albacore. For 2022, the Northern Committee set, the expect, set expectations that included, based on MSE results, consider retention or modification of limit reference point, and consider adoption of a target reference point to complete, combat, to complete task B2. And we throw a link where you can get that information. Um, that document also set expectations for 2023, which include further development of harvest strategy, including development of harvest control rule and threshold reference point to complete task B2. The April 5th stakeholder meeting carried forward that stepwise approach, as is indicated by the materials presented for discussion. Both before and after that meeting, fishery participants were briefed on the management objectives as well as target and limit reference points. It was generally understood that obtaining international agreement on reference point and the management objectives in the form of a harvest strategy would then pave the way for the development of harvest control rules based on the harvest strategy. Given the likelihood of different approaches to controlling harvest of directed fleets, surface fisheries versus longline fleets, which directly or indirectly harvest North Pacific albacore, the stepwise approach is a logical one. Discussing nuances of harvest control rules, total allowable efforts for the surface fisheries, versus tax for other fleets could thwart the ability to get consensus on the foundational elements of the harvest control rules, both target and limit reference points. Against this backdrop, we addressed the IATTC draft resolution on harvest strategy for North Pacific albacore 
provided in Supplemental NIMS 3. The first indication that the U.S. was going to include harvest control rules in a proposed resolution was when AS members received a copy of the draft resolution on Wednesday, June 1st. As noted above, fishery participants did not discuss the possibility of harvest control rules in advance of this council meeting. We note that some participants have already started their seasons and those that have not yet departed are busy getting their vessels ready for departure. Based on reports from US based longline vessels and albacore vessels returning from the South Pacific, there is optimism about this upcoming season. While we note the draft resolution is a good start to a resolution on a harvest strategy for albacore, it does not address some critical issues we think are important to maintain U.S. access for the U.S. fleets, such as, while well, the draft resolution specifically mentions the troll and pole and line fisheries that target the stock in the convention area of the ITTC, there is no mention of the potential impacts of the longline fleets that operate across the Pacific. We recommend the language introducing section one be amended to read, a harvest strategy shall be adopted for all fisheries which harvest North Pacific albacore in the convention area. There is no discussion of controlling the incidental harvest of North Pacific albacore by vessels operating across the Pacific. At present, we are un unaware of any generally accepted metric for determining whether a trip is targeting albacore or some other species. Now, we recommend developing guidelines for determining targeted versus non-targeted harvest. Uh, in management objectives 1A4, to the extent practicable, or practical, this could benefit from including the MSC's performance indicator that there should be a low probability of management changes resulting in a 30% or greater decrease between consecutive assessment periods. Aside from the arguments raised above, we also have the following additional support for our recommendation. Time is not of the essence from a biological standpoint. The 2020 stock assessment for the stock from the IC indicates that North Pacific albacore is neither being overfished nor is it in an overfished state. Um, our recommendation is that the AS supports NOAA's intention to advance a comprehensive harvest strategy to the IETTC for North Pacific albacore with an intention that any future harvest strategy be adopted and adopted in the WCPFC be compatible. We also agree with and generally support sections one clauses A through E as currently provided in the draft resolution, including management objectives, reference points, acceptable levels of risk and monitoring with the modifications as presented above. The AS is concerned that there has not been sufficient time to review, discuss and develop a position on the contents of any proposed harvest control rules. The AS requests that NOAA allow for further discussion with stakeholders on the harvest control rules. In particular, additional specificity is needed to outline an appropriate total allowable catch and or total allowable effort to control impacts from non-target fisheries and provide clarity on actions at reference points. The AS further recommends that the council instruct NIMS to move forward with seeking international agreement on management objectives, reference point, acceptable levels of risk and monitoring while seeking further consultation from domestic stakeholders on harvest control rules so that fishery participants have had a chance to review, discuss, and develop a position on the contents of that. Uh, our final item is with regards to the Intergovernmental Conference on Marine Biodiversity of Areas Beyond National Jurisdiction. The May report of the May Council Coordinating Committee makes mention of the fourth session of the UN's Intergovernmental Conference on Marine Biodiversity of Areas Beyond National Jurisdiction. On May 30th, a new draft of the agreement under the UN Convention on Law of the Sea on the Conservation and Sustainable Use of Marine Biological Diversity in Areas Beyond National Jurisdiction was published through a link to that. The AS encourages the Council to receive regular updates on development of this agreement and perhaps give a general endorsement of the twofold process as outlined in the Council Coordinating Committee meeting report. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Mike, for that thorough report. Are there questions of the AS? Dr. Braby. Thank you, and thanks for the report. And you, you mentioned in the report the need for additional um, engagement, encouraging the U.S. to move forward with the current strategy, but then to also concurrently um, conduct more work uh, in the US and just wondering if you had some specific ideas of what that might look like. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, we discussed that 
quite a bit. The, in, it, in our opinion, well, generally our opinion was that the U.S. moved forward with items included in the harvest strategy except for the harvest control rule part of the conversation and rather have that occur after NOAA had a chance to engage more with industry. And in our opinion, that probably couldn't happen this year given that folks are already on the water or getting their vessels prepared to go on the water. Any further questions of the AS? All right, thanks very much, Mike, but please don't go away. Uh, that completes uh, all of our reports and takes us to public comment. Uh, and Mr. Conroy, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks uh, once again. Good morning, council members. My name is Mike Conroy. I'm here uh, speaking on behalf of the American Albacore Fishing Association. Um, want to address the North Pacific Albacore harvest strategy, as you can probably well imagine. Um, I will be brief. Uh, just wanted to throw another additional item with as to why moving forward with the harvest control rule portion of the harvest strategy could benefit from additional time and additional engagement with the, the, the fishery stakeholders. Um, and that is that from a marketing standpoint, time is not of the essence. Um, the West Coast North Pacific albacore fishery was the first tuna fishery to achieve MSC certification, and the fishery maintains that certification to this date. Um, like most tuna fisheries worldwide, the certification currently has a condition attached to it, which reads in part that well-defined harvest control rules must be in place. The AFA and WFA, the certificate holders, have been pushing for this and fully expect to have this condition cleared, but within the current timeline, which is either December of 2024, or could extend out as far as May 2025. So we don't believe that delaying conversations on harvest control rules until 2023 will affect that timeline at all. In fact, as noted above, getting agreement on management objectives and reference point may actually expedite the processes as we have an agreed upon harvest strategy, which will need to be implemented. And then just wanted to piggyback on something that Krista had said with regards to the treaty consultation call. Um, AFA shares Krista's concerns about compliance with Canadian laws. Um, there are nuanced differences between port hails and fishing hails, and we encourage all U.S. harvesters contemplating entering Canadian waters, whether it be to fish or for port access purposes, to understand the difference and act in accordance. And AFA remains concerned about the low logbook coverage compliance, which has been 79 to 83% from 2016 on, and, and would, would hope that we find ways to address that. So thank you. All right, thank you, Mike. Any questions of Mike? Krista Svensson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you for uh, the HMSS report, but also for providing testimony this morning. Um, I know that you do a lot of work with WFOA um, as well, and you mentioned them in your uh, comments in terms of MSC. And I'm just wondering, this your testimony this morning was specific to AFA, um, but has there been conversation um, from WFOA as well that you could elaborate on? Are they, are they generally supportive or or? Do you want to leave that one alone? No, no. Th th thanks for that question. I, I would say that they are generally supportive. You know, when Wayne, Doug, and I in the AS room were discussing this, I, I think that we were we were all on the same page. I didn't have a chance to clear what I was going to read by by either of them, so I didn't want to attribute my comments to them. But I would, I would say that they would be in support of those. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions of the AS? or other of Mike Conroy, <laughs> I get wearing two hats here. All right, thank you very much, Mike. Well, that uh, completes public comment and takes us to council action, which is to uh, discuss the reports and provide guidance as appropriate. We did receive some very specific recommendations from the AS, so we do have opportunities to comment here, so let's Let's see what sort of advice we want to provide. Krista? Sure. I um, 
I'm appreciative of really all of the um, work that has gone into all of the meetings, all of the stakeholder participation and engagement, uh, the opportunities from uh, NIMS to provide public comment um, and specifically to, to designate this meeting as an opportunity to provide comment. And I think we heard some of that uh, throughout the meeting this week, but also moving forward. Um, I'm in favor or I'm supportive of um, moving forward with the recommendations from the HMSAS. I think it's important that they put ideas out there um, and I would like to pick those up. I don't know that we need um, a motion for that, but I definitely am lending support for adopting those recommendations uh, and moving with them. So interested in hearing one about other people's thoughts on that, but two, if if there does need to be some sort of motion, it would be a pretty basic one. But um, if somebody else doesn't have something, but that would be my general thoughts surrounding this item. All right, thanks for that, Krista. Let's see what additional thoughts we have around the table. Ryan, oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Raby. Yeah, I'll uh, offer general support for picking up the recommendations in the AS report. Um, I just kind of falling back to the, the two key stocks that we've heard about this morning and, and continue to be really important um, stocks for the council. It's just so encouraging to hear about the rebuilding progress in Pacific Bluefin. Um, remarkable that that stock is as resilient as it is uh, apparently demonstrating to be. Um, so I just wanted to kind of provide a collective cheer that that's happening um, and appreciate the reports on that. Obviously, there's uncertainty about what that timeline will ultimately look like, um, but uh, glad that we're in that situation and really encourage uh, NIMS and our international partners to be ready for, for um, moving into a more maintenance situation with that stock. Um, and uh, wanted to reflect on the MSE process in particular um, and encourage development of that tool um, specifically that's in support of, of the NIMS reports as well as the AS report. Um, but I'm just, you know, underscoring that and, and look forward to hearing how that moves forward. On Albacore, um, I, I also feel really encouraged that there's kind of collective international agreement to work together on proposals on how to move forward with that um, and just feel encouraged on that. Uh, and um, I think the, the only um, questions that I have uh, relative to that work um, is around this issue of addi additional engagement and, and would love to hear um, from NIMS today about, you know, what you read in the AS's suggest suggestions on that front and if that's consistent with um, ne next steps that you're already planning and thinking about. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Corey Niles. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair, and, and thanks, Karen. Just briefly before NIMS responds, I'm, I would, yeah, I have the same overall thoughts and I'm also looking to what the team is pointing out in the report and what this resolution would look like compared to say how we would man manage Petroli Soul. Um, and there's some real questions there about how I think people with looking to the science will react to some of these um, proposals. So, but yeah, I would, I would, um, I hear it for the AS. This is a good thing. We're asking for it. Um, yeah, but the question about the engagement, and I'm always uncertain on thin ice, as you say, about how to best um, advise advise the U.S. delegation at international forums. So, general thoughts, um, very similar to Karen's, and yeah, I also just wanted to add before before Ryan responded. Thank you, Corey. All right, well, um, I guess I've heard general support for the AS recommendations. Uh, Ryan? Yeah, I did wanna respond just before you started to sum up. I was just pausing to see if there were any other comments so I could respond to all at once. Go for it. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, thank you. Uh, I want to thank the the AS and the MT um, for their uh, all of the content in their reports. And um, the MT noted, you know, while I share uh, Dr. Braby's collective cheer regarding uh, Pacific Bluefin, we we also note that there is some uncertainty, right? And we do have to pay attention on the recruitment side and uh, and start to shift either way towards these thinking of the long-term strategy. So, uh, but I'm hopeful for that. Um, and this has been a good discussion and will will help us continue those. And we will continue again with our advisory bodies and, and the various uh, other delegations as we start to work on Bluefin. When it comes to Albacore, I fully hear the concerns from the AS. Um, I think they've raised some good points. I would reiterate again that the proposal before you is not necessarily a U.S. proposal that we are saying this is what we want. This is reflective of just what we have heard from not just the U.S., but from other countries that are interested. In. So it's a collated draft to start to get feedback on. So I think based on that and the time that we still have, uh, we, are, are, we have already begun working since we heard some of these concerns over this week, trying to start to think how we might modify text how we might address this in a way that is satisfactory and still allow um, for at least some of the key components of the harvest strategy that there seems to be some consensus on to, to move forward on, but yet um, allow for um, maybe softer text on the control rule side uh, or, or some other solution that would still allow that engagement in those other stakeholder discussions in a satisfactory manner from their perspective, uh, which, of course, we could re revisit in an iterative fashion. These uh, proposals can always be modified, like they noted, in future date to add on or to augment or to get more specific um, on things like control rules as, as we have those discussions and are ready for those internationally. And, and not everything does need to be done at this year's meeting, but I'm glad that there is a at least a consensus to get some core components of a harvest strategy out there, and, and the discussions um, here have been helpful. Uh, and then to your point, Corey, this this is all helpful feedback from the U.S. delegation. You know, the council meetings here, um, we do have our general advisory committee on June 29th. So for those that still want to be engaged, there is public comment there. Uh, that's I know it's only a little over two weeks away, but we will have a, a number of discussions with our with those other international delegations between here and now. So a revised version of this proposal will be shown to that advisory committee on that day. Um, so that's another chance for engagement, not just for those on the committee, but, but uh, members of the public uh, at that meeting. Um, so that's my general and overarching response. I think this has been really helpful and, and good guidance, and we plan to take this all into account as we continue to move forward, furthering both of these efforts. Thank you, Ryan. Let's see if there are any other comments um, from around the table. And so um, maybe I'll ask Kit to uh, sum up, up, oh, we see a hand, Corey Niles. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll keep my response brief. Thank you, Ryan. I guess um, reiterating what the, what the AS and others saying, I guess I would have expected, I understand the timing is not under your control. Um, I, would, I would have expected more time and more attention on the councils uh, for the, the uh, advisory bodies on these uh, and the science and the NSC brought, brought in forth a little bit more. Um, um, the ideal, I'm talking speaking of the ideal, that we might expect that's, that's um, not gonna work this time, but I think we would like to treat it more like we would uh, a harvest control rule decision of our own, and that would be providing more time and, and the science to be deliberated a little bit more. You know, I know we've had opportunity before to look at it, but aligned with the discussion item, I think my preference would have been to, to really have spent some extensive time on this, but we are where we are and, and I hear what you're saying. So we'll be looking for those opportunities to provide feedback. All right, anything further before I go to Kit? All right, Kit. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, um, yeah, I think you've uh, provided some uh, recommendations here, essentially endorsing the contents of the HMS advisory subpanel report. I think that um, NIMSA took that in and uh, we'll be considering those comments in terms of further development of that um, harvest strategy for North Pacific Albacore. Um, and 
I believe just the general endorsement of the idea of uh, moving forward expeditiously on the development of harvest strategy for Pacific Bluefin and the Joint Working Group Forum and um, understanding that uh, uh, we collectively, internationally, however you want to look at it, um, are somewhat under the gun to look at a management framework uh, for a, a stock that could be considered perhaps rebuilt or at least um, achieving the rebuilding target that was set internationally in the very near future. So, um, and uh, Ryan mentioned uh, these continuing opportunities for input from stakeholders leading up to the IATTC meeting um, and their intention to consider working with their uh, international parties, uh, partners on the, on the development of this resolution for uh, submission and consideration uh, at the IATTC annual meeting. Very right, thank you, Kit. Are there any final words from around the council table? And if there are not, I will pass the gavel to Vice Chair Brad Pettinger, who I think will give us a break. Thank you, Chair Grelnick. Uh, well, good work, everyone. Uh, we're ahead of schedule, so we're going to take a short break before we start off on G3 and um, be back here at um, 9.20.
If we all take our seats, uh, we'll get started. Okay, uh, we're back on the G3, and I will turn to Kit Dahl to uh, start us off. Kit? Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. I'll read the situation summary for this item. It's exempted fishing permits under the HMS management plan. So your operating procedure 20 lays out an annual June and September schedule for reviewing exempted fish, uh, fishing permit applications for HMS fisheries. And according to the schedule that is laid out there, uh, the team, HMS management team and advisory subpanel review the applications in June at this meeting and make recommendations to the council for action. And then final action on a recommendation for EFPs uh, occurs in September, to your September council meeting. And only those applications that were considered in June may be considered in September. Um, however, as you're well aware, over the past few years, you have been following a one meeting expedited, pro expedited process for the review and approval of deep set buoy gear EFP applications. Um, maybe qualify that for, for the kind of the gear as has been specified uh, in uh, for past EFPs in terms and conditions for past EFPs. So uh, you see here in, in the summary document, a table that lists the 14 applications that were received by the deadline. And um, of these, uh, five of the applications were for gears other than uh, the standard configuration of the gear, either the, the standard standard or the linked standard linked configuration. Uh, and those are indicated in the, uh, in the table there. Um, I should note there was one, I think it's Harold, uh, G. Harold, that is listed as standard deep set buoy gear, um, but uh, in fact, uh, well, in, he, he also has a request in there uh, to fish in state waters. I think you've confronted this before last year, essentially that's sort of outside the purview of the council. So uh, it may be immaterial to a recommendation, which would only be about issuing a federal permit and doing anything in state waters would require a separate process that he'd have to deal with with the state of California. Um, so uh, in addition to the applications, the, count, the operating procedures were, were require those uh, EFP holders to submit a report on work completed under their EFP and that analysis of data that was collected and any conclusions to recommendations. And uh, this has been incorporated into the terms and conditions that NIMS uh, applies when they issue these permits. And so a compilation of all the reports that were submitted for 2021 fishing activity is also included in the materials, that's att attachment 15. Uh, and then NIMS has submitted a supplemental report with some additional information on the status of uh, previously issued EFPs. I will not steal their thunder in any way, let them speak to that report as appropriate. And um, then in addition, uh, just a note that all extant EFPs 
HMS EFPs expire at the end of this year, as has, I think was flagged last year, uh, it would be helpful for the council to make a recommendation on whether to extend uh, those EFPs or reissue those EFPs, if you will, um, for uh, next year, essentially, or to extend them beyond this year. And it says here, if so, for, for what duration? Although I think really, um, if they sort of go on a one-year duration and are reissued, but again, that's something maybe if NIMS chooses to speak to, they may. Uh, so in terms of the materials, there are those 14 applications as uh, numbered as attachments one through 14. There is the compilation of those activity reports as attachment 15. And then you have um, uh, some advisory body reports. Let me make sure I get them all. So I already mentioned that there is a supplemental NIFS report with some information. Uh, and then you have from both of your HMS advisory bodies, management team and sub panel submitted reports. There's also a report from enforcement consultants. Uh, there was one very brief um, written comment that you could look at on, online on our website. And I see here also for public comment, there is a um, some presentation slides that have been made available that will be presented under public comment. And that's from uh, uh, Dr. Chugi Sapovoda, who uh, works for the Flager Institute. Um, so aside from that, let me get back here and read uh, your action under this agenda item, which is preliminary review of exempted fishing permit applications. And that uh, concludes my overview. All right, thank you, Kit. Uh, questions for Kit on his overview? Okay, not seeing any. With that, we'll go to the NIMS report and Lyle Enriquez. Lyle. All right, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Our NIMS report provides updates on deep set buoy gear exempted fishing permits. First, we talk about the, the permits that are issued for this year. So for 2022, we have 15 linked and 35 standard deep set buoy gear EFPs that are currently issued. Those expire at the end of this year. Uh, three to five standard and one additional linked exempted fishing permit can still be issued when and if final qualifications are met, which include attendance at a protected species workshop and assessment of vessel observability. And there are also several EFPs issued for 22 that have not yet been signed by the captains or owners and they are not yet effective. So that number that I mentioned at the beginning that could raise just, just a bit. And also one night set buoy gear EFP for 2022 is pending issuance following completion of our ESA consultation. So that's what's going on, the, going on in the EFPs this year. Um, next, I'll turn to EFP summary data. In previous years, we included summary data on effort and catch for both standard and linked deep set buoy gears as part of our June council meeting reports. However, we do not have that detailed summary for 2021 deep set buoy gear EFP performance at this time. Uh, past, past summaries came from an integrated data set, including observer logbook and landings data. And again, similar to the drift gillnet data, this is being moved to an APEX reporting system stored in the PACFIN reporting database. So at this time, the 2021 data are not yet available for quality control and cross-validation with previous versions of the integrated data set. We just weren't ready to present that this year because they need to be quality checked before we do that. However, vessel captains or owners reports on 2021 EFP activity are available in the briefing book. And turning to, you know, the process of these EFPs expiring at the end of this year, you know, all the currently valid EFPs have been issued through December 2022, and we can renew these for 2023 and beyond. Uh, Kit did mention a council recommendation may be helpful for that. And however, if we do extend these EFPs, they would be, need to be revised if and when a final rule becomes effective for authorizing deep set buoy gear. And that's because there will be a period of time between when the final rule becomes effective, requiring a limited entry permit, and when those limited entry permits are actually issued. Um, we propose to modify these permits to also exempt them from the requirement to have a limited entry permit until we actually are able to issue those limited entry permits because there will be an application and appeals process between the 
final rule and the limited entry permit issuance. So, and following that, we would either revoke or expire these EFPs once the application period is complete and limited entry permits are issued. This is consistent with the council's recommendation for a phased in approach to issuing limited entry permits. So just touched on a couple EFP points in this report and I'm happy to entertain any questions on the contents here. Okay, thanks Lyle. Questions for Lyle on the, the NIPS report? Okay, Karen Braby. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. And I'm not exactly sure what my question is, but I'm just trying to think through how that would work and, and what guidance from the council today would be helpful. Um, for example, um, my preference would be to be as least disruptive to the fishers in this transition period. And so that's a general comment, but I, I'm not sure if that's useful and exactly what you're looking for from council discussion and guidance today. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I, I, I think we are proposing a process that would be least disruptive to fishermen. It would offer these EFP holders the opportunity to keep fishing in the bite between the time the final rule come, becomes in place and that they actually receive a limited entry permit, which could take up to a year after the final rule. So we're just proposing a process here and, you know, council just agreement that that seems reasonable and that would be beneficial to keep them fishing in that period that, that may be helpful. So if we cover that in council discussion and guidance today, then that would be what you're after. Yes, yes. Thanks. thank you. Thank you, Karen. Further questions? Okay, thanks, Lyle. Um, next, we'll go to the HMS management team and uh, Matthew Craig. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the council. My name is Matthew Craig. I'm from the National Marine Fisheries Service Southwest Fisheries Science Center, member of the highly migratory management species, <laughs> the HMS MT. Uh, I'll be reading supplemental report on exempted fishing permits. The highly migratory species management team discussed the 14 exempted fishing permit applications submitted for council consideration at the June 2022 meeting. Eight of these applications request permits to use deep set buoy gear, either standard or linked as previously approved by the council and issued by National Marine Fisheries Service. The remaining six applications request a permit to fish modified versions of deep set buoy gear. That is by increasing the number of pieces of gear increasing the gear footprint or fishing at night. The team acknowledges the thought and effort that went into developing these proposals to test modified approaches as a means to increase the economic benefit of targeting swordfish off the West Coast with DSBG. The team feels that these new applications are potentially motivated by economic considerations, such as large increases in operating cost. The original limits on footprint and number of hooks have potentially limited the economic viability of currently approved deep set buoy gear configurations, which leads to new attempts at increasing revenues production to offset increased operation cost. A summary table of submitted applications is available in the situation summary for this agenda item. References in this report to numbered applications correspond to the label in that table. For applications one through four, seven, nine, 13, and 14, which request EFPs for the already approved deep set buoy gear configuration. The team supports the council recommending these applications to NIMPS for issuance at this meeting. For application five, which request fishing standard buoy gear within three nautical miles of the California coast, issuing an EFP for fishing in state waters is outside of NIMPS and the council's purview and would require a state issued EFP. Aside from that, the team recommends the council approve this application for fishing in federal waters at this meeting. The remaining applications contain proposed changes that can be grouped into three categories, increase in number of gear pieces, increase in the size of gear footprint and use of night set buoy gear. For proposals requesting permission to fish at night, the team recognizes that night fishing presents additional challenges and potential bycatch risks. 
However, night fishing has previously been conducted without any observed interactions with protected species, no lost gear, and has had no unmarketable catch. The team believes that an increase in the number of vessels fishing nights at buoy gear will add valuable data to inform the feasibility of this fishing activity on a larger scale and supports these applications being moved forward to September for final consideration. For application 10, the team has concerns with potential ambiguity in data collection among day versus night sets. Given that day and night buoy gear may have different environmental impacts, the team desires to maintain distinct data sets for day and night and has reservations about a combined day and night approach. For the request in application six to increase the allowable footprint for deep set buoy gear, the team has concerns that such an increase may decrease the ability to actively tend the gear while increasing challenges to enforcement and potential for gear conflicts with other fisheries in the Southern California Bight. For applications 6, 8, 10, and 11, which request an increase in the number of pieces of standard buoy gear, the team recommends an increase to no more than 15 pieces of standard buoy gear with no more than 30 hooks total. The team feels that this represents a precautionary approach that simultaneously mitigates potential risk while generating valuable data on the ability to manage and maintain an increased number of gear pieces and on economic and environmental effects. If applicants still wish to try more pieces of gear after a year of fishing 15 pieces, they may submit an additional EFP application to the council and request consideration for additional pieces. For application 12, the team understood that the intent of the proposal was to evaluate scaling up of linked buoy gear for use by larger vessels while fishing outside of the Southern California Bight and in areas north of Point Conception. While the team recognizes the need to evaluate the feasibility of scaling the gear to satisfy economic interest of larger sized vessels, concerns were raised regarding the proposed footprint, 10 nautical miles as opposed to five nautical miles, and the ability to service the gear in a timely manner. However, given that the proposed fishing activity would occur outside of the bite, the team expects <clears throat> that the potential for gear conflicts would be reduced. The application would benefit from more explicitly stating the proposed location as the team views the larger footprint and many more buoys to be incompatible with other EFP permitted vessels that almost exclusively fish south and east of Point Conception. The team has some reservations regarding the proposal to use a lighter weight as it is unclear if less weight would be sufficient to maintain proper gear configuration to avoid entanglements in bycatch. However, the HMST supports the trial and anticipates receiving an update on its performance at a later date. To conclude, the team suggests that the council approve applications one through four, a slightly modified five, seven, nine, 13, and 14 at this meeting, and consider the aforementioned points when issuing its final recommendation for the remaining applications at the September 2022 meeting. Thank you, and I'll take any questions. Okay. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, questions from Matthew on the uh, management team report? John Ugritz. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thanks for the report. Uh, just quickly, um, did the team discuss observer requirements for these new configurations of deep set buoy gear? We didn't have a long conversation about it. Um, but I would expect that the observer coverage would be in line with what has previously been approved by the council. Thanks. Okay, thank you, John. Further questions for Matthew? Not seeing any, thank you. Um, next up is the HMS advisory sub panel and uh, Dave Rudy. Good morning, great to see everybody in person again. Uh, rather than reading my report, I'm gonna kinda of go behind the logic of our discussion. First of all, in the HMS advisory subpanel, for any of you who have been in our room, we have a wide diversity of opinions and ideas and some strong personalities. So when, when we tried to go through line by line for the EFPs, it just was not possible. So we decided instead to split the EFPs into two categories. 
the standard ones and the non and the new ideas. For the standard ones, we had concerns about uh, not bringing new data to the table, but we also had a big concern about um, these new applicants might get started and be only able to use their permit for six months to a year. And I think if they are issued, we need to warn them that it's not going to be a, not likely to be a two-year process. It may likely only be a one-year process. For the for the new ideas, I think that's what we were most excited about uh, the ability to try new things. But we also felt that because of the potential crowding in the bite and gear conflict, that these new ideas with additional buoys should be tried outside the Channel Islands. There are several definitions of what the Southern California bite is, and we've seen various maps, but we're proposing a new map, if you see on the screen here. And it's just outside the islands, rather than using a straight line south of Point Conception, or using a, you know, the 130 or something, we decided to do just the outside of the islands. That creates a lot more fishing opportunity, especially some of the areas outside Clemente and south of Clemente are potentially good fishing spots that would be removed from a straight line. So again, we felt that these new ideas should be tested in this area, and it's an opportunity for larger boats that have uh, more expense to go to an area where there may be more fish that the little boats can't go to. So again, that's our general proposal and I'm open to any questions you have and that's our, that's the summary of our report and how we okay. got to it. Okay, thank you, Dave. Questions for Dave on the advisory panel report? Chair Groenick. Thank you, Vice Chair uh, Pettinger and uh, thanks, Dave, uh, for the report. Um, could you detail the conflicts that this proposal would seek to avoid? Are they conflicts with existing deep set buoy gear uh, participants, conflicts with sport? What's Yeah, thank you for the question, uh, Chairman Gorlick. Um, yeah, so currently there are EFP holders where, which are using 10 buoys. And if you have another EFP that uses 10 or 20 or 30 buoys in the same area, that, that seems a little bit unfair, I guess. And also the concern about just so many buoys on certain high spots, since a lot of the fishing occurs on like the nine mile bank and places like that, it would really increase the number of buoys in some of these areas. And there's, we haven't really seen any fishing outside the islands or in North of Point Conception. So we wanted to encourage those boats that are big enough to fish in those areas, give them, give them a little support by giving them the extra 15, 20, or 30 buoys that they need to try to try it out there. And they're using some new technology, some GPS trackers on the buoys, so they feel that they can they can track more than 10 buoys with the, these GPS trackers. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mark. Further questions uh, for Dave? Okay, thank you, Dave. Um, next up would be the EC and um, a report with the Greg Bush. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. My name is Greg Bush. I'm with NOAA Fisheries Office of Law Enforcement and Chair of the Enforcement Consultants. I'll be reading agenda item G3A, Supplemental EC Report 1. Enforcement Consultants Report on Exempted Fishing Permits. The Enforcement Consultants have reviewed the documents pertaining to Agenda Item G3, Exempted Fishing Permits, and provide the following comments related to the five EFP applications requesting changes to the standard deep set buoy gear or linked deep set buoy gear EFP terms and conditions. Night setting, attachments 6, 10, and 11, the EC previously submitted an EC statement at the September 2020 Pacific Fishery Management Council meeting on the use of night set buoy gear and recommends continuing to mark in light gear so that it is clear whether the gear was set during the day or night. Extended gear footprint, attachment six and 12. The EC previously submitted an EC statement at the November 2018 council meeting, noting concern about a vessel's ability to tend gear when spread out over a large area where multiple other vessels are operating. The use of GPS tractors noted in attachment six would mitigate our concern related to tending gear 
but gear conflicts are still of concern as is enforcement's ability to determine if a vessel is actively tending their gear. Additional gear, attachments six, eight, 10, 11, and 12. The EC continue to be concerned with potential overcrowding of vessels and gear in localized areas as vessels will likely converge on schools of fish within areas like the Southern California Bight. This may create difficulty for an enforcement officer to readily identify gear and attribute it to a specific vessel, as well as determine if that vessel is actively tending the gear within the required footprint. In addition, this, this situation could further contribute to gear conflicts, safety and navigation concerns. For reporting of lost gear, and I would note that our intention was this would apply to all EFPs starting in 2023 for the deep set and linked gear. The EC recommends the reporting of lost gear be as soon as practicable to assist law enforcement in determining whether gear is lost or not properly attended. The following language is recommended as replacement to the current 24 hour after landing reporting requirement contained within the deep set buoy gear EFP terms and conditions. In the event that any pieces of gear are lost and not recovered on board the vessel, notice must be made immediately upon returning to port to the NIMS West Coast Region primary contact listed below. And if departed from or landed to a California port to CDFW primary contacts listed below. Notice must include the last known GPS coordinates of the gear and the prevailing direction and current drift. This concludes the EC statement. Thank you, Greg. Um, questions on the, uh, Greg, on the EC report? Okay, not seeing anybody. Thanks, Greg. Um, well, that takes care of our advisory bodies and uh, takes us to public comment. And I think there's like eight signups, I believe I saw earlier. So we'll wait for um, Chris to get it up here on the screen. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Um, first up will be uh, Jeff Shester, followed by Chugi Issues, followed by the Jeff. Great. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Am I coming in okay? We can. Great. Um, yes, uh, this is Jeff Shester speaking on behalf of the conservation organization Oceana. Um, our organization supports a strong, expanded domestic fishery for swordfish and other highly migratory species off of our coast, as well as fishing opportunities uh, to support local fishermen and support fishing communities. In September 2019, based on the success of deep set buoy gear under EFPs that showed the gear is profitable, highly selective for swordfish, and has minimal bycatch and bycatch mortality, the council unanimously approved the permitting and authorization of a limited entry deep set buoy gear fish as part of the HMS FMP. We are concerned that NIMS has delayed implementation or issuance of those permits, uh, despite commitments in 2021 to finalize the authorization and issue permits by spring of 2022. We've now recently learned NIMS has no plans to do so in 2022, nor did the agency uh, provide an update uh, in its uh, in its NIMS report on HMS regulatory activities. Yeah, we know NIMS is allocating its workload and resources toward advancing uh, pelagic longline EFPs. Uh, we, we urge the council to first indicate that NIMS must complete the authorization and permit issuance of deep set buoy gear as a top priority as taking over three years to, to um, actually implement a council recommendation for a new uh, gear type uh, seems to be too long. Uh, regarding the suite of VFP applications before you, we are pleased to see the diversity, nature, and intent of the applications submitted. Uh, we're excited to see the new ideas and provided their safeguards in place, uh, including those uh, recommended by the enforcement consultants. So, um, similar to the kind of very the categories of EFPs that others have discussed, we, we have the following comments specifically on each of uh, these categories. So, at least for, uh, one category is the existing deep set buoy gear EFP holders that are hoping to extend or renew their EFPs. Um, so that they can continue to fish deep set buoy gear until the limited entry permits are issued. We strongly support this uh, to make sure there is continuous use of the gear and, and minimize disruptions to the fishermen. 
The second category is the new entrants uh, that seek to, to get new traditional deep set buoy gear EFPs. Uh, we don't feel as strongly here, um, but after listening to discussions and careful consideration, we do support issuance of these permits as well, provided this does not create additional NIMS workload that would further delay the issuance of the limited entry uh, permits. Uh, deep set buoy gear is a clean gear, and if there are serious new fishermen interested in investing in the use of the gear, we think the council should encourage this to expand the fishery. Uh, the third category is exploring the use of deep set buoy gear at night. Um, we do note that earlier trials several years ago of night sets uh, did have some concerns, particularly I think with, with uh, shark bycatch. However, we are hearing the recent work is uh, selectively targeting bluefin tuna with minimal bycatch. We would like to see the actual bycatch data to confirm this, uh, but provided that it is confirmed, we would support these EFPs insofar as they're building and expanding upon the successful buoy gear model. Um, potentially, this may be a, a fishery that does warrant higher levels of observer coverage for, for this type of activity to get better data. Um, regarding the proposals to increase the number of gear pieces, uh, we support efforts to scale up. Uh, the buoy gear design uh, that uh, has been shown to be successful at 10 buoys uh, or pieces of gear to, to more than that. Uh, however, we do agree that with more buoys, there is increased concern of the ability to actively manage the gear and maintain low bycatch and low mortality rates of bycatch. So uh, with that in mind, we support the management team's recommendation to approve these, but limit the number of gear pieces to 15 so that the scale up can be done incrementally. Uh, and and um, this may be also be another area where uh, increased observer coverage could be helpful to make that confirmation so we could have confidence that the gear is being scaled, scaled up and continuing to have success. And then lastly, uh, I would have liked to see uh, Dr. Sepulveda's presentation first, but uh, I did review it online and... Um, We've taken a, a close look at the extended link buoy gear EFP. We really appreciate and commend the efforts by the Flager Institute of Environmental Research who have pioneered deep set buoy gear and have a history of, of caution and a strong conservation ethic. And, and there's using uh, seasoned fishermen that have been using buoy gear for a while. Uh, we, we note there were some real thoughtful discussions at the management team and advisory sub panel about this. Uh, we hope to see the council advance this and uh, encourage further dialogue so that uh, the Flager Institute has the opportunity uh, to make any revisions to address any issues that were raised at this meeting uh, so that this can be something that moves forward with broad support. Uh, so in summary, we appreciate the full suite of EFP applications and the recommendations by the management team and enforcement consultants. Uh, the, um, the focus uh, on building upon the success of deep set buoy gear so that it can provide additional opportunities for a wider suite of vessels, fishing businesses, and even additional target species to be uh, targeted. Uh, we believe this is the right approach to provide higher volumes of responsibly caught domestic, highly migratory species seafood. And we uh, ultimately ask uh, the council to have NIMS prioritize finalizing the deep set buoy gear final rule, issuing permits, and supporting the suite of EFPs uh, before you today. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Questions for Jeff on his testimony? Okay, I see any. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, next up will be um, Chugi Shapovita, and uh, I believe he has a presentation. So, there we go. Good morning, uh, Council. Mr. Chair, th thank you very much for um, allowing me to come to speak and, and provide some justification and rationale behind my, um, well, this EFP submission. Um, so for the record, my name is Chugi Sepulveda. I'm a fisherman and also a scientist. I'm the Director of Research and Education at the Flager Institute of Environmental Research for a small nonprofit in Oceanside. Um, today, I'm, I'm hoping to spend a few minutes tailoring my comment slightly just so that I can address some of the comments that came up from both the um, AS and MT and hopefully address any um, questions that you guys might have as well. Um, first off, the extended link buoy gear application, this is uh, something that we were trying to do five years ago. So five years ago, we had the plan to try to provide two gear types for the fleet because we had two different vessel sizes in our existing fleet. We had a harpoon and nearshore gill net fleet. Those are smaller vessels that trips are three to five days. And we have the bigger boats that, that fished offshore. Several of those larger boats have continued to fish with, with the drift gill net 
because they simply can't make ends meet with a small artisanal gear type, like 10 pieces of buoy gear. Um, their operating expenses are roughly double daily. And um, the, um, today I'm, I'm pretty excited because I have three, I've looked at the amount of background um, that I've been able to, um, to uh, um, or support from the fishermen. I've got three fishermen that have over 100 years of collective drift gill net experience that are gonna be fishing this, this EFP if and when it gets uh, approved. So I think that that's the type of, of seasoned fishermen that really gonna help us test whether or not this gear works. Um, so next slide. Um, one thing I also wanted to mention is when I mentioned the, um, the development of the gear, this has largely been NOAA funded research that has led to where we are now. Um, so just a little bit of background, this is kind of Cliff Notes version in case anyone didn't want to read 14 pages of, of text. Uh, we're taking three seasoned fishermen, ideally gonna also incorporate a couple of alternates to avoid any in-season changes. We've seen that that's one of the lessons learned over the past um, seven years is you need to have multiple fishermen because life does happen and not everyone can go every year. Um, the design we're gonna be presenting uh, or that we have presented is linked buoy gear, however, it's extended. It's very, very similar. All of the um, um, mitigation features that we've developed over the past several years are incorporated. And we've also incorporated a few other ones to try to satisfy NIMS concerns. Um, the main modifications or changes are, um, we're gonna try to increase the number of hooks per section from three to five. I personally think that once the fishermen deploy enough pieces of gear, they'll realize that they'll probably go back to three. However, there's interest in going from three to five. Mind you that these are, we're increasing deep set hooks, hooks that normally catch swordfish and not much, not much else. So we'll be, I don't believe that there's a large conservation concern for increasing the number of deep set hooks. Um, personally, if a fisherman wanted to put 10 on a piece, I don't see the benefit, but I, I don't see the, that there's a big concern. We also want to consider the use of um, alter, alternative or sorry, a range of descending weights. Currently, the weights that we're using on our piece of link gear are 41 times greater than the pieces of lead that are used on a shallow set long line. So sorry, currently they're 82 times larger, but I'm asking to go down to four pounds because there's a lot of drag on that line and there's, there's a lot of reasons, but the amount of line that can fit on the smaller spools that the vessels already possess is that we will have to gear up and purchase spools to be able to accommodate a larger line, the, the larger line size. But if we go down in line size, which actually could provide some, some benefits to line parting in the case of uh, entanglement, we can use the same gear sets, but we're afraid that the four pounds is gonna be too much. Uh, sorry, the eight pounds is gonna be too much. So Fishman have voiced this concern. Um, I anticipate there'll be um, further discussion. I can provide the MT with data on sink rates as well. We know that the gear sinks just as fast, especially if we go down in mono size. Um, we're increasing the uh, hook count from 30 currently to 100. That's a maximum. I believe we will see after a, few, a year maybe of trials that we're gonna probably settle on right on 75. That's what the fishermen are probably gonna be using because there's an optimal number of hooks. For fishing for swordfish, these baits are relatively expensive and they're not gonna be wanting to deploy a lot more bait and gear than, than necessary. Um, but this is just the upper range. Also, I have a discussion on the, the footprint, which I'll say for the next slide. But um, when I say well, we, I think everyone always focuses on the large number. Um, the proposal is up to 10 nautical miles. That means the vessel, the gear could not exceed that footprint. And likely fishing would probably be around 7.5 to, to eight nautical miles. Um, so a little bit of rationale behind this. Um, Leak buoy gear has shown high selectivity for swordfish, low bycatch. As I discussed earlier, the uh, larger DJM vessels need additional options, especially since time is running out on their gear. And um, fishing further offshore requires additional uh, catch to, to meet uh, 
to make ends meet. A lot of California, I'd say most of it, is currently unfished when it comes to the waters between um, inside the EEZ. And uh, we are proposing for the action to take place outside of existing deep set buoy gear effort slightly. Um, I'm just going to keep going so I'm not, um, so I don't run out of time on us. Um, the proposed mitigation measures that, that are already in place are on the left. There are also some on the right. Um, I don't need to go through all these. They're all described in the um, EFP proposal. I'd say the largest factor when it comes to avoiding bycatch is that top left one. It's daytime fishing at depth. That's how you avoid bycatch. And that's what we've done. That's been, that's the most important um, mitigation feature we have uh, going for us with this gear. However, we have all these other things included. Um, I also wanted to point out that, especially after what we've seen happen in the last two, three years, two years now, I think electronic monitoring is something we need to consider in the future because it really can help fill those gaps when staffing people on boats is not convenient, not practical, or not possible. So um, we, we've just finished, uh, we'll be publishing a study this summer looking at the comparison of observer versus cameras for both link buoy gear and buoy gear to show that um, you, can, you can assess catch composition and fishing activities with a camera just fine. So uh, um, for the footprint, mind you that, that a um, 10 nautical mile footprint for any swordfish gear type is really small compared to any other fleet in the world. Um, we've, we've made this calculation based on the number of fish we're, cat, we're seeing caught right now per section of gear. So uh, if you catch 2.2 swordfish per section of gear, and we think that these vessels, I mean, it could, it's gonna go up, especially with fuel prices, but they need to be between three and five swordfish per day to make ends meet. That's an average number across the season. Um, we're hoping to, to scale up. I, I'm nearly certain that the gear will probably be around seven and a half nautical miles when settled. That's, that's what we're looking at. But because this gear has large, long vertical legs and it could stretch, that's why you need a larger footprint to accommodate just any type of stretch. Um, the, um, here's some of the specifics, but basically uh, six to 10 nautical mile footprint, hook count of uh, 100 or less. And um, target depth would be below the thermocline, below 90 meters during the daytime. Um, how will strike detection be used? This is something I've, I've heard come up the next uh, several times. Um, next slide, please. Sorry. Um, so so far, we've seen very little protected, well, very little protected species or, or bycatch in general. So I'm 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 thinking that strike detection is less critical now than it was at the onset of the year. However, I stu still think that it's a really valuable tool when it comes to mitigating any potential entanglement or mammal interaction. So these, this gear is deployed during the day. The vessel can motor it multiple times during the day. It's very similar to having a very short, short soak period. You can see if something's on the line. If it's an elephant seal, you can mitigate, you can deal with the problem and reduce the, the um, the uh, likelihood that there's a mortality. And you can do this with three miles, you can do this with five miles. You can just drive the gear. When you see the buoy up, like you see in the picture there, you know, something's on the line. The fishermen want to service that. They do not want to wait till the end of the set because it's harder to pull the line. Well, you, you may lose the fish later on. So with that, I'd like to conclude. And if I'm here if there are any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Shugi. Um for your presentation. Questions for Shuvi? I think we're good. Thank you. Sure. Oh, I'm sorry. Pete Asma. Oh. <laughs> sure. uh, thank you, Vice Chair Pettinger, and, and thanks, Shuvi, for the presentation and the application. Um, the EC uh, consultants have expressed a concern about uh, gear conflict. And um, I think you've touched on it, but I'd just like to give you an express opportunity to respond to the EC report. I believe that um, the AS, and this is great, it's, uh, because I, I wanted to talk about this, but there's only so much you can say in 10 minutes. I believe the um, AS was able to draw a, a um, line 
on a map. And that's just a general line. I think it can be straightened out, but I think that that's a line that makes sense from a fear conflict perspective. I think that if you look overlay all of your, your um, current bluefin fishing, recreational fishing activity, as well as deep set buoy gear activity, you'll see that it falls largely inside of that line. And um, it also provides valuable territory for the fishermen. Um, a straight line, even though it's convenient and from an enforcement perspective, it's ideal. It really doesn't make sense. I, I, to be honest, I probably will lose the applicants I have currently if the line is straight because they're with fuel prices and with potential gear complex inside there, there's very limited area they can go to and still make uh, ends meet. So I do think by fishing offshore, we're gonna see less gear conflicts just because there's very few individuals out there, especially at the time when swordfish fishing is happening. It's likely they won't see anyone. And, and by straight, you mean a line that would come directly south from Point Conception. That would move your zone too far offshore. Correct. I, I think that I would be back here in a couple of years asking for more gear because the resource aggregates and it becomes tighter and tighter as it moves closer to the beach. And that's why we're able to target it with a very small amount of gear. Offshore, it's more diffuse and we'll have to use more gear. And that's why the longline fisheries fishing outside the EEZ are using 50 miles. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Further questions? Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Chuggy, for coming forward and presenting this. Very informative. Um, if we were limited to five miles as a footprint, how much gear could you actually fish then and, and safely and within those confines? That's what I'm doing right now. That's what we're doing right now. We're limited to five, mi five, five nautical miles and we fish 3.7 nautical miles of gear. Because if you go outside of that, it could stretch to five nautical miles and you'd be in violation. So we are currently fishing within a five nautical mile footprint, but our gear is 3.7. We're roughly gonna double that. We're probably gonna go up to about seven nautical miles and we would like a, a 10 nautical mile footprint. And the footprint is mainly from a, for a uh, consult for the EC side. So they, everything has to stay inside of there, but it's not necessarily, because it's not a shallow set long line, which has almost no sag, we have to account for that stretch. So we're inside of that, those. Um... Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Anyone else? Okay, thank you, Chuy. All right, next up will be uh, Sai Fukushima, followed by Teresa Labriola. Good morning, everybody. My name is Sai Fukushima and I'm 19 years old and I'm a commercial fisherman down in San Diego. I mainly fish set gill nets for halibut and white sea bass, but I recently put in an application for buoy gear, which I could hopefully add to my portfolio, portfolio of fisheries. I have fished buoy gear and linked buoy gear for about four years with my father, Kelly Fukushima, and I've made over hundreds of sets with it. I've seen how buoy gear can help and has been able to support our family for the last five years. And I would like the opportunity to be able to support my own family in the future if my application gets accepted. If I receive the privilege to fish buoy gear, I will actually go fishing. I fish only with my cycle net. I only fish about five to six miles away from the area. So, and I already have the gear set up. So I'll be able to go fishing relatively easy. And I know you guys have concerns about new data and new data and everything, but every year is different and there could be new data obtained every year from new people. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Sai. Questions for Sai on his testimony? Krista sits with it. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And thank you for coming. I uh, saw your um, application in the packet and thought it was pretty amazing to see a 19 year old and a 17 year old that had graduated early uh, apply for an EFP yeah. and just 
appreciate really you coming up here. I know it's it's a trick and it's a bit scary to come <laughs> testify in front of the council. It's sometimes scary to be a council member and talk in front of everybody too. So uh, you're in good company. And um, just one quick question here. Um, we're in the process of having this become a, an active gear type. Yeah. Um, and typically EFPs are for two years. You heard Mr. Rudy is the chair say, hey, we kind of need to let people know you may not get the full two years on it because you'd have an authorized fishery. Yeah. And do you think that the work and the effort, um, if you got only, say, six months, um, is still worth going through? Are oh, you yeah, game certainly. for that? Yeah, it definitely is worth going for the six months, even if that's the case. Okay, no, thank you. I appreciate it. And, and again, I really appreciate you coming up here and testifying for us. Thank you. Thank you, Krista. Um, I see John Ugarts had his hand up, right? And they put it back down. John, just, just making sure. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. That Krista covered what I wanted. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Seeing no hands. Thank you, Sai. Thank you, guys. You bet. Okay. Next up is Teresa Labriola, followed by Chris Honings. Teresa. Um, good. Yeah. Good morning, uh, Vice Chair Pettinger. I'm Teresa Labriola, representing Wild Oceans. And thank you for the opportunity to give a few short comments today on exempted fishing permits. Um, Wild Oceans is uh, 50 years almost old next year. And we've been dedicated to protecting healthy oceans and fishing opportunities for future generations. And we could achieve this goal in part by sustain supporting more sustainable fishing methods that catch more of our target species um, like swordfish, and fewer of our non-target and non-marketable species like sharks. Um, and, and of course, not catching protected species like sea turtles. So to this end, we've supported the exempted fishing permits um, for those uh, for deep set buoy gear and linked buoy gear over the past seven, eight years. They, these permits that are scientifically based and they adhere to um, best scientific methods for testing new gear. And I want to reaffirm our support for continued research and development of gear that starts with buoy gear and linked buoy gear as the configuration. Um, buoy gear was designed to take advantage of our knowledge and understanding of swordfish daytime behavior and to target swordfish deep during the day. And the deliberate design and testing resulted in um, gear, which is hopefully on the verge of authorization final authorization, um, that catches swordfish with more than 90% efficiency. Um, this gear is now being tested elsewhere, and we're, we're starting to export our good ideas in sustainable fisheries. Um, so we think that can, can, we believe continuing to encourage the testing and use of buoy gear and linked buoy gear is in sync with our collective values of protecting biodiversity. Uh, knowing that the California current ecosystem is really a hot spot for biodiversity. A few, one of the few known rookeries for large sharks, including blue sharks, white sharks in the, in the entire Pacific Basin. And um, so we are cautiously optimistic that by starting with buoy gear and linked buoy gear, um, we can expand fishing opportunities. Um, so in short, um, we support the recommendations of the management team including approving the applications um, for standard and linked buoy gear. Uh, uh, we recognize, uh, I really appreciate that the testimony um, just before me, um, there are fishermen that are interested in, in um, being uh, deep set buoy gear fishermen. They will continue to give us important information until the fishery is authorized. And, and we'd like to continue to see those um, permits fished um, at this time, we'd ask the council to conditionally approve the um, permits that ask for expanding deep set buoy gear opportunities with uh, a, very, a small step, such as increasing the number to 15. Um, and then uh, to come back in September, I guess it is, with a final um, look at those. Uh, we support approving the night set. EFP conditionally and see clarification on the catch composition to date. There's one report that says there's no bycatch, another that says it's only marketable species, but I really, I don't think there's, I haven't seen a, a actual, the composition of what that catch is. Is it 
is there blue shark in there? Um, we've had concerns with catching a lot of blue shark at, at night. And then finally, conditionally approve the peer EFP for expanding linked buoy gear um, and, and new fishing opportunities there. And we are cautiously optimistic um, about those expanded buoy gear opportunities. You know, these applications are, are, when I look at them, you know, they set discrete limits on hooks fished, the depth of hooks, the time of day, the duration of set, the areas fished. And this is what we like to see from wild oceans in an application. Um, EFP should have sufficiently discrete parameters. They should clearly define configuration and tending procedures and limitations on when and where they can operate in order to provide valuable information to assess the success of targeting swordfish while avoiding bycatch and incidental take. So I really appreciate the thoroughness of some of these applications. Um, and you've heard me talk about this before, but in addition to approving applications or preliminary appro preliminarily approving some of them, we really ask you again to take steps to clearly define your goals for an HMS fishery with metrics for applicants to consider and strive for. We all agree we want to reduce bycatch in fisheries, um, but more specific targets, such as the percentage of bycatch uh, that we are looking for or to, to attain, um, should be a goal. Um, we can have a frank discussion about our ecosystem values, including parameters on bycatch and incidental catch and selectivity ahead of time, and set goals for new gear development. And by doing this, we lay a course to make objective decisions about advancing sustainable gear in the California current ecosystem and transitioning to innovative and selective gear, which we can then export to other fisheries to use. Um, so we urge you to set your sights on a future built on sustainable, innovative, efficient gear for swordfish and tunas that catch a higher value product with less waste. And we, um, you know, in final, just really prior ask you to prioritize the... Um, the, uh, our, I guess, ask NIMS to prioritize the authorization of deep set buoy gear. We, we hope that that and some of these um, new configurations um, can be a win-win for fishermen and consumers and the ecosystem. So thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Questions for uh, Teresa on her testimony? Okay, thanks, Teresa. Next up is uh, Chris Hillings, followed by Nathan Perez. Chris? You on there? Uh, Chris, you're, you're muted. I'm muted. There we go. Okay, am I showing up now? You are. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Chris Hillings. Rather than uh, go on who I am and, and what I've been doing, I'd like to just jump right into it. I'd like to just take this opportunity to uh, address the council on the concerns they have on the EFP. Uh, I didn't just come up with the, the 30 buoy number out of the ether. No, that was uh, directly from uh, some colleagues of mine that are in the already federally permitted uh, sort fishery on, in Florida on the East Coast. And uh, as far as footprint, the larger footprint, fishing at night, all that with this uh, GPS tech that, that uh, they employ over there, that we've been using. We have not lost one single piece of gear. I uh, have been able to actively tend buoys and by using that system, you can actually tell when there is a, uh, a fish on your gear, just by the way it's going against the current or going out of line and uh, just head for that directly. So that uh, really cuts down on, you know, just tying the gears in the water with anything on it, being able to mitigate any kind of protected species, what have you get the fish uh, directly on the vessel. And uh, I'd, I'd just like to you know, address any questions that the council may have regarding the EFP. Okay, thank you, Chris. Questions for Chris on his testimony? All right, next up is Nathan Perez, followed by Stephen Mintz. Nathan? <clears throat> Is he there? Well, we'll come back to Nathan just to, when we get done here. Um, Stephen Mintz, are you there? Okay. Um, then we'll go to Bill Sutton. Bill? Uh, 
Okay, I'm not seeing any of those three individuals online here. Oh, the bill's supposed to be, oh, there it is. Morning, Council. Thank you for listening to me today. My name is Bill Sutton. I've been fishing uh, deep, deep set drop gear for since 19, uh, 2015. So that, whatever. Um, the problem I have with uh, what's going on right now is an equity problem. If you give more buoys to uh, the, uh, the, uh, these the EFPs that are coming out, then the guys that didn't put an EFP but have been fishing a long time. We're, we're sitting next to those guys laying out. So we should have a choice of uh, getting up to those to the numbers you pick and let the boat it, on size. Now I've fished in uh, the drift gill net fishery for 30 years. We had one mile in net, no matter how big your boat was. So that was an equity thing. Everybody was equal. Um, I fished Bristol Bay for seven, seven years. We had 100, every boat up in 2,000 boats up there all had 150 fathoms of gear. And so all I'm asking for is to be equitable. And uh, just because we didn't submit an EFP, there's a lot of guys, you know, that would like to have, at least have that opportunity to be equitable. Thank you for your time. Okay, Bill, thank you. Questions for Bill? Okay, thank you. thanks Bill. I see we have a, an attendee of the hand up, looks like we have a phone ID. So uh, is that uh, Nathan or is that Steven? You're muted. If you just unmute yourself. Still muted. Uh, we can't hear you. Okay, well, if we can't admit himself and we can't hear him, we can't hear his testimony, so. Okay. Chair Gromick? Yeah, I think that when you are connecting your ring central on a phone, there's a key pad sequence to unmute your phone, but I don't know what it is off the top of my head. Maybe we can get some advice on that. Yeah, Chris. How about now? Oh, there we go. How about now? Perfect. Thank you for that unmuting the phone. This is Steve Metz. Should I wait? Uh, no, please proceed. Okay, I just wanted to talk about my EFP. Good morning. Thank you very much, Council and Chairman. My name is Steve Metz. I've been fishing with my EFP here on this deep set buoy gear and link gear for, I think this would be my fourth season coming up here. And I asked for the CFP because I felt that we were missing out on a lot of good bite time, that little bit of time before daylight. And uh, I know that there's probably risk of a bycatch of blue sharks. So, you know, I'm willing to have the observers take a look at that, see what we do, but I'd sure like to try it. Um, and I think cause you're deep with it still, you're, you're probably not going to get the blue sharks. I mean, if we were up, maybe up on top, may, possibly, but we don't even know that. So that's, I just wanted to try that. The 15 buoys, I just threw that in because I felt we don't have enough gear. 10 buoys is kind of, well, we're not really making it with that. You know, if there was really a lot of fish, of course, that would be a different situation, but it's not always like that. Also, I just have a comment I wanted to add before I'll ask if there's any questions, and that was that line that they're drawing. Dave Rudy showed it in a, in a, uh, on that uh, map, and nobody is thinking about <laughs> the weather coming down from Point Conception and outside those Channel Islands. That's, uh, there's not going to be a lot of time fishing there because it blows a lot up there and on down to San Clemente Island, so... There wouldn't be a lot of effort there unless somebody's really tough. Anyway, I'll just leave it at that and ask if there are any questions. Very good. Thank you, Stephen. Questions for Steve? All right, I'm not seeing any. Thank you. Um, 
I'll go back on here and see if Nathan Perez is still, if he's available or not. If you are Steve or Nathan, uh, raise your hand. And there you go. You guys got me? We do. Yeah, I lost phone service. Sorry, you guys. Um, thank you guys for listening. Um, and considering my application for night step buoy gear and daytime buoy gear, um, I think raising the number of buoys is going to help out tremendous, tremendously right now. The price of fuel going up, I doubt the price of fish is going to go up. Um, we're currently catching, I believe, like 1.8 fish a day, and we need to increase that. I try to do that effectively with night gear. It's been hard to uh, fish both gears day and night all the time. I, I plan on fishing a lot more the next two years, being getting married, having a kid, buying a house the past two years definitely slowed my uh, my fishing effort down. But um, fishing 20 buoys, I, I don't see any conflict. The only conflict would be inside the fish uh, shipping channels. And with AIS and the technology we have now, we can radio ahead to these ships and let them know where our gear is if we decide to fish inside the shipping lanes. And I haven't had any issue. I haven't lost any gear. I haven't had any gear ripped out by a sport boat or anybody uh, coming across it. I know uh, enforcement is worried about someone sending night gear and it being thought as day gear being lost or, you know, to mark the gear so you know if it's day or night, we could adjust that because you do use the same gear for day and night, just a little bit different than depths, and we could add an extra buoy or tag to mark it so enforcement does find it. They know that it was a night set gear set by whichever vessel set it. I do encourage uh, having other boats fish night gear. I think that's going to help with the data. Um, as far as data we have, there's no bycatch whatsoever. Um, I think if we were eventually to raise the depth a little bit higher, we could find where the bycatch starts and where it ends and be able to make the gear even more effective for swordfish. Um, I guess I'm calling in to see if you guys have any questions or concerns about the 20 pieces of gear or the night gear. Uh, effectively fishing inside the bite because if you go outside the channel islands like steven said weather effort everything drops out there the fish don't collect as as tight as they do inside i've uh, set a lot of pieces of gear outside cortez bank and it's not very uh, effective out there it's just uh just weather you got to deal with and just the temperature breaks if you look at the water charts everything seems to push inside the islands but uh, any questions anybody has any Okay. Uh, thank you, Nathan. Questions for Nathan on his testimony? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you. Um, and I think that concludes our public comments. So it um, takes us to council action. So we'll open the floor up for discussion. Corey Writings. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. This is actually a, a question for NIMP, so I thought I'd start us off here. Um, while the AS noted the pending authorization of buoy gear may be completed by this year, um, we heard a, a similar confusion in the California delegation this morning, um, as well as during public comment. Um, NIMP said last year it was targeting issuance of the first LE permits for the summer of 2023. Um, can you give us a, a quick status update? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Corey. Yeah, we have heard some comments today about deep set buoy gear authorization being delayed beyond 2022, and I'd like to clarify that's not our expectation. Um, we've been working with California on getting the data streams ready so we can, you know, issue permits according to the qualification tiers, and we do expect a final rule to be issued this calendar year in 2022, and it will take some time for the limited entry permit process to play out and we still expect limited entry permits to be issued in 2023. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Thank you, Lyle. Um, John Uberts. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, and I think Corey's set us off on the right foot as far as I'm concerned. I've got comments sort of on two sides, one about the original deep set buoy configurations and then one about the other EFP requests that do something new. And um, with regard to the ones looking to fish the original deep set buoy gear configuration, I, I do think there's rationale to move forward with approval. Um, 
we we have collected significant data on catch and bycatch in deep set buoy gear, and that prompted us to move forward with recommending a fishery. But there's still questions, and we heard them today even, regarding crowding and gear conflicts and other information that additional deep set buoy gear EFPs could help answer. Um, and while those additional EFPs may only have a brief period to fish prior to fishery authorization, um, once, once a fishery is authorized, there is still the opportunity for anyone to fish deep set blue gear north of Point Conception in the open access fishery once authorized. And so providing an opportunity for EFP fishing prior to that gives individuals a chance to gain necessary experience and prepare to fish once the fishery is authorized. And then also it, um, you know, gives some difference in the tier for where they would qualify for a limited entry permit south of Conception. So for all those reasons, talking specifically to the original deep set buoy gear configuration, I think there's, there's reason enough to move forward at this point. Okay. Thank you, John. For the discussion. Uh, John? Yeah, I just was waiting to see if there was more discussion about the original configuration, but if not, um, I do have additional comments on the other types of EFP requests. Um, okay. Please. I think that the, the management team and it, enforcement consultants and advisory sub panel have all raised important points about these various requests. I think the management teams laid out a path forward that's consistent with past practice um, and, you know, needing careful review of these modified requests in a two meeting process. Um, I think the, I, I agree with the environmental consultant comments regarding gear marking at night and notification of lost gear and the use of GPS locators for additional pieces beyond 10. I think those are all things that we can discuss and flesh out between now and September and make final recommendations in September. I also think there's, there's definite merit in the advisory sub panel recommendation um, for some EFPs to be limited outside the Southern California bite and outside the islands. I'm not certain if that should be applied across the board. Uh-oh, I just got a weird noise. Can you still hear me? We can. Okay, thanks. Um, I don't know if, if that limitation would apply to all EFP requests or just some of them, and I think it's something that we can discuss and analyze for September. Um, I am interested in collecting more data on different configurations that might provide a greater economic return. Um, and I do still have concerns. And so I think proceeding cautiously is important. Um, I don't want to move too far beyond the current configuration, even before it's authorized, uh, try new things. So I think the management team's suggestion of limiting testing to 15 pieces makes sense. Um, appears to have some support from the public comment we've heard. Um, I don't think we should move beyond the, the footprint for non-linked buoy gear at this time. I, I want to see how well people contend 15 pieces inside the existing footprint before taking that next step. Um, and then importantly, I think that for any of these new configurations, I think we should really make it clear that we have an intent for 100% observer coverage for a large number of sets. Um, with at least the first 10 trips observed, similar to the way we treated buoy gear when it was first being examined. Um, so I think that that really could get us to where we need to be for September if we consider all those things. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, John. Uh, Karen Brady. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I uh, just wanted to support, I, I tried to get in there on standard buoy gear. I support moving forward with with uh, approval of those generally, and um, I think that we haven't flagged before this time that we would be not considering um, such EFPs, and so I feel like we want 
to honor those requests as well as the rationale that's been raised by other council members on the information that we'll get from those um, standard buoy gear configurations make a lot of sense as we're transitioning to authorization. So um, I, I feel comfortable with, with that uh, pool of applications moving forward as well as the uh, additional considerations and uh, analysis that we might uh, ask for and, and expect in September for the non-standard um, applications. So I, I think we have, uh, uh, we're in a, a good spot on these EFPs generally to, to move forward in those, with those two pools. So that's all, thanks. Thanks, Gord. Further discussion? Chris Smithson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I'm in general agreement with Dr. Brady. I think it's prudent to move forward with two separate pools, but I do think um, looking at the EFPs um, and the participants who have asked to engage in those uh, with the standard that may have a short time frame, um, it, it's important to be inclusive. We've got a number of very young applicants and I look to that as the future and, and want to encourage uh, them to continue participating in our fisheries. So uh, again, supportive of, of that path and approach. Thank you, Krista. All right, further discussion? Motion? John Ugerts. Yeah, thanks. I do have a motion if you're ready for it. Uh, we are. If it could be put up on the screen. Thanks. I move that the council approve the proposed EFPs and attachments G31 through G34, G37, G39, G313, and G314, and request that NIMS issue those EFPs as possible under existing ESA consultation. I also move that the following EFP requests move forward with modifications recommended below for final council consideration at the September 2022 meeting and request that NIMPS provide the information necessary for the HMS MT to evaluate whether existing EFP holders requesting new EFPs have been in compliance with logbook and annual report requirements as specified in their EFP terms and conditions and report back at the September 2022 meeting. Attachment five, that should read attachment five, no S, remove requested fishing within state waters. Attachment six, limit total pieces of gear to 15 and footprint to that approved under other four other DSBG fishing, five nautical mile footprint. Attachment eight, as requested without modification, Attachment 10, remove the proposal to add time before and after sunrise and sunset. Attachment 11, limit total pieces of gear to 15. And attachment 12, as requested without modification. Okay. Thank you, John. Is the language on the screen accurate? Yes, it is. Looking for a second. Seconded by Karen Brady. Uh, please speak to your motion. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, in addition to the things that I said in my comments, um, you'll note that my motion includes a recommendation to look into compliance for existing EFP holders. I think it's very important to note that EFPs are issued in order to gain information and data. And while we've heard potentially of some EFP participants not submitting logbooks or annual reports in a timely manner, we don't actually have in front of us data to know whether these particular EFP requesters have complied. And I would not be inclined to issue a new EFP for additional types of phishing to someone who hadn't been providing the data they were supposed to provide in their original EFP. Um, I think my modifications are consistent with what we've heard from the various advisory bodies. Uh, I'll note that for attachment 10, I'm suggesting removing the proposal to add time before and after sunrise and sunset. I think that is also consistent with the management team's report. Uh, but importantly, the council 
considered the time frame of fishing for deep set buoy gear very carefully in our discussions about EFPs in the past. And I think, um, you know, between enforcement concerns and biological concerns, we're just not ready to, to make this a day and night fishery, but we are testing whether it could be separately day and night, sort of two, two separate types of gear. Um, so I don't want to conflate those issues at this point. Okay. Thank you, John. Uh, discussion on the motion? Uh, Chair Gromick. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Patton. Chair, we've got a question for the maker of the motion, um, and perhaps I'm, I'm just missing something. The AS had recommended a geographic limitation for the um, expanded deep set buoy gear. I think that's six and 12. Um, is that incorporated into your motion or, and if not, um, why? John? Yeah, thanks through, through the vice chair. Um, thanks for the question. Uh, it's not specifically included in my motion. It's also not specifically excluded, I think, from our deliberations and consideration in September. Um, I think, as I noted in my floor comments, uh, there may be merit for some of these proposals to limit where they fish. And I'm definitely willing to hear more about that and, and any analysis that um, the team can provide. Um, I don't know that it needs to be specifically in the motion in order for us to then consider that in September. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Karen Braby. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and thanks, John, for the motion. Um, I do want to come back to the council discussion on any guidance to um, NIMFs on EFP issuance and allowance of of, um, of use of those EFPs into the next year, and, and just wanted to acknowledge that, that this motion and my support of it is with the idea that there is utility in having a short-term EFP, even if it's not for the full two-year duration. Um, and uh, again, support NIMS providing the um, maximum amount of time that's consistent with EFP and issuance of the permits of the limited entry uh, fishery um, to maximize that time and minimize disruption to EFP holders. So. Um, I'll state it again here in council discussion on this motion because that's in my mind as I'm thinking about voting on this. Thank you, Gordon. Oh, I see Kit here. Uh, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I was just wondering. So there's the perhaps slightly separate question of a recommendation on uh, reissuance of EFPs to. Uh, those individuals that um, have um, EFPs in 2022, in addition to any new EFPs uh, that would be get issued under the application submitted. And I just wanted to clarify whether Dr. Braby's comments encompass, <clears throat> excuse me, encompass those, those um, existing EFP holders and reissuance of their EFPs next for next year. Through the vice chair, my intent would be for all the EFP holders, not just the new ones that we're considering here today. That is my uh, view on this. Hello. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, Karen, you did mention, you know, short-term EFP issuance, and normally uh, these EFPs are recommended for up to two years. NIMS issues them for one year and then renews them for a, a second year. So I would think for these new ones, rather than just issuing for one year. Um, our timeline for the final rule is the end of this year, and it could take up to a year to get those limited entry permits out. And just to avoid, I mean, just in case of a slight delay beyond the end of 2023, I think these could be approved, recommended for two years, just so we have that flexibility in case there's a delay. Thank you. Thank you, Lyle. That clarification, um, Bob Dewey. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, I see there's a difference in some of these EFPs that are testing 
new uh, approaches that my understanding is they, that a new approach would not be included in the gear uh, authorization of deep set buoy gear. And it seems like there's utility in gathering data with these new approaches if they're, so I guess my question is, would all of the EFPs um, stop when the gear is authorized or would we continue on with these, these new approaches to get that data throughout the full term of an EFP? And I, I don't know if that's even been considered, but it just occurred to me that, uh, you know, the, I would assume going forward that we're gonna have changes or improvements to, uh, or, or different approaches to how this gear is operated and used that may not fit within the, the, the core definition. And if that's the case, we probably would need EFPs to, to ground truth that. So since we have some that are different and potentially being approved here, should we consider them being on a different track? Thank you. Is that a question for anyone in particular? Uh, for whoever thinks I can answer it, I guess. It could be the maker of the motion, or it could be... Uh, John, I'm see your hand. Sorry. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. And um, speaking to Mr. Enriquez and, and Karin's comments, I, I agree that past council decisions with regard to reissuing existing EFPs should, should be followed, um, and that these new EFPs for what I'll call the, the traditional deep set buoy gear configuration would be, you know, an, until such a time that there is a, a fishery authorized. With regard to Mr. Dooley's comment and question, um, my understanding is that EFPs exempt the user from something that is currently not authorized. And so for all of these ones that would not be authorized in the new fishery, they would continue as EFPs uh, because they are for activities that are not authorized. So to separate it simply, the first paragraph is things that would go away once there is an authorized fishery and the second paragraph and bullet is things that would continue as EFPs for their duration um, and be considered for, for renewal after their first time frame. Okay. Thank you, John. Okay. Further discussion? And if not, I'll call, call for the uh, motion. Okay. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. <laughs> aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Um, abstentions? Did someone say no online? That was me saying something like, <laughs> I vote aye. All right. Very good, Virgil. Okay. So a motion passed unanimously, and uh, thank you. Um, Kit, we'll turn to you. Too. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, I think you've completed your work here. The motion that was just adopted uh, provides pretty clear guidance on um, the path forward. So as indicated there, um, the applications for the, um, for the use of the existing configurations for deep set buoy gear, the council has recommended uh, issuance at this meeting, no further action need be taken on that. However, for the uh, seven applications or however many it is that uh, entail variations on deep set buoy gear outside of the currently used configuration, the council will um, come back in September for a final consideration on issuance of those. There's some requests for more information from the applicants and from the management team to facilitate decision making in, in September. So we'll look forward to gathering that information and coming back in September. Very good, Kit, thank you. Um, great work, everyone. Uh, we are uh, 
pretty much in line with our uh, time frame for the, for the day. So we're going to take a break right now and uh, be back to start up at uh, 11 o'clock. So. <laughs>
All right, everybody, we're back um, on G4, and I'll turn to Kit to uh, get us going. Kit. Okay, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I will just read from the summary here for this agenda item, Drift Gillnet Fishery Hardcaps. Uh, at its June and November 2021 meetings, the council adopted a revised purpose and needs statement and a range of alternatives for a hard cap closure regime for the California large mesh drift gill net fishery. The council originally took action on these protected species hard caps in September 2015, but that proposal was, was ultimately not implemented. The council is now re revisiting that proposal to address the deficiencies uh, National Marine Fisheries Service identified in the original proposal and described in a letter from 2017, was in your briefing book from that era, and there's a link in the summary. You wanna reread it? Attachment one is an information paper pre prepared by council staff containing a description of the proposed action the adopted purpose and need and range of alternatives and description of the fishery characteristics, including catch and bycatch of fin fish and protected species. Dr. Stephen Stowes of the NIMS Southwest Fishery Science Center led development of a modeling methodology to evaluate impacts of the original 2015 range of alternatives and has been working with the HMSMT to extend the, mo uh, the model to evaluate the impacts of the current range of alternatives. A description of the methodology underlying the 2015 analysis may be found in sections three through five of a supplemental NIMS report that was presented uh, back in September 2015. Again, there's a link to that in the summary. The model uses a bootstrap simulation technique to, to present distributions of potential changes in the number of sets fished in a season resulting total revenue, total profits, average profits, total landings, and mortality injury of nine protected species subject to hard caps. The attached HMSMT report describes modifications to the model to evaluate the current range of alternatives. This report also presents preliminary results for alternative one, which is no action, and alternative two, which is uh, the council's 2015 final preferred alternative across three scenarios reflecting different levels of fishery participation. Um, and uh, so the, the team has been working to uh, on further developing that model to evaluate alternative three, which involves in season individual vessel and fleet wide closures. Um, and they'll discuss their progress in that regard. Uh, in their supplemental report that has uh, been submitted uh, and um, will be presented by Dr. Stowes. He has some slides uh, associated with that presentation. Based on the information provided, the council may wish to further modify the range of alternatives adopted in no November 2022. The council determines that there is sufficient information to make an informed decision. It may identify a preliminary preferred alternative um, so in addition to the previously referenced materials, uh, that, that is the, that attachment and the HMSMT report that was in the advanced briefing book, as I already mentioned, there is a supplemental team report. Dr. Stowes will present the information in there and he has some slides that are also available uh, in your briefing materials to do that, provide that overview. The advisory subpanel has a uh, also has a supplemental report as well as your uh, EC, and um, there is a written public comment that was submitted under this agenda item as well. So, um, with all that, uh, the council action uh, adopt a range of alternatives and preliminary preferred alternatives as appropriate. Uh, maybe be a little bit more accurate since you did adopt a range of alternatives. 
if you want to make any mo modifications to the range of alternatives, maybe that's a better way to characterize the action here. Uh, so with all of that, um, I'll finish my overview. Okay, thank you, Kit. Uh, questions for Kit on this overview? Okay, seeing none. Um, we'll go to the reports and um, HMST management team. Uh, Steve Stowes, Dr. Stowes. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, uh, members of the council. Um, I see my PowerPoint slides are queued up here. Um, I'll just mention I'm with the Southwest Fisheries Science Center, and um, I'm also the HMS Management Team Chair. And I'm going to give the uh, report on drift gill net fishery hard caps for the team. And those uh, images are not actually the kind of hard cap or bootstrap that this is about. So. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the team, um, in trying to figure out how to analyze the range of alternatives for hard caps, um, we looked back to the previous council action on hard caps and considered the analysis that we used at that time and realized that the alternatives one and two under the current range of alternatives um, were essentially the same as two of the alternatives in the old um, hard caps action. And so we thought that there might be a way to, to use the existing bootstrap analysis that we used last time and extend it to um, include the provisions of alternative three, which um, goes beyond the original version in terms of having individual uh, caps and varying length closure periods. And so um, what I've got up here right now is just an overview of how the 2015 hard caps uh, bootstrap simulation method worked. And so basically we used um, data on landings, observer records and costs of fishing to uh, construct what's called the empirical distribution function of observed drift gill net fishing ex experience. Uh, we resampled the logbook data to simulate a fishing season's worth of effort for each vessel we expected to fish. And back then we uh, were assuming 20 vessels would be fishing. Uh, we resampled observer landings and cost data to simulate catch by catch landings and revenues for each simulated season. And then for a given hard caps alternative, we figured out when the closure would apply within a simulated season and summarized the economic and bycatch outcomes at the point when the season ended. Uh, over many simulated seasons, the number we, we've chosen to simulate is 10,000. Uh, this approach gives you a, a simulated distribution of the cap species interactions and also the economic performance of the fishery. Next slide, please. And so the proposed updated approach uh, is to use the um, alternative one, no action and alternative two council um, 2015 FPA uh, to, to, um, stim to, to analyze alternative one and two in the current range of alternatives and then extend the methodology to include alternative three, which includes the, the season, uh, in-season individual vessel and fleet-wide closures. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, so the team thought about the requirements to analyze alternative three. So last time, all the closures in the ROA were fleet-wide closures. There were no special rules applied to unobservable vessels. And the closure lengths did not depend on when a cap was reached. Uh, so this time is different in the sense that we have um, uh, the need to model individual vessels in the fleet to capture the uh, partial fleet closures. And we also uh, use the day in the season when a closure occurs to model whether the closure uh, happened before or after November 1, and that affects how long the closure applies. And then we also assume the number of unobservable vessels uh, subject to individual closures um, in, in order to capture the different treatment under the new alternatives of unobservable and observable vessels. So there's a lot more nuance of um, 
detail required in the analysis of the new alternative three options and sub options. Um, next slide. Now, uh, so there was some discussion about what exactly observed, unobserved, and observable and unobservable mean. So this slide is an attempt to clarify that. Um, so there are some vessels in the fleet that are deemed unobservable, and that means that they're never observed. There are other vessels that are observable, and in a given season among those, uh, some subset of those observable vessels might be observed in a season. There could be other ones which are potentially observable but not observed. So there's really three categories of vessels as far as I understand it. Um, next. Uh, so updating the previous analysis to uh, extend it to alternative three reminded me a little bit of a movie I like. Uh, there were lots of baby steps involved. <laughs> uh, next slide. And this is sort of a list of what we've done uh, to update the analysis to alternative three and what remains to be finished. And in short, in the uh, advanced briefing book report, you'll see we give preliminary uh, results for analyzing alternatives one and two under the old methodology. And we've made significant headway um, towards analyzing alternative three, but we don't have the full version available at this meeting yet. Um, but the part, the uh, step five up there, building elements needed to support analysis of alternative three options A through C, um, that, that is, those steps are done. So include the vessel number in the simulated seasons data, um, uh, have an observable vessel indicator. So we have to keep track again of which vessels in the analysis are observable or not. Um, uh, Sorry, I'm having tr trouble reading this far away. Uh, uh, so there's both a question of which ves vessels are observable as well as which are observed. We keep track of both of those in the simulation. Uh, there is a need to translate days in, the, um, in our data into whether it's before or after November 1. We dealt with that. And we also have to deal with coverage level. It's a little bit tricky. We're, we're assuming in our scenarios 25% observer coverage level. But when you have unobservable vessels, you actually have to uh, simulate observing the observed vessels at a higher than 25% coverage rate. So we built that into the analysis. Uh, where we're um, still kind of struggling to complete the analysis is to uh, finish fleshing out all five options and sub options um, under alternative three in the simulation code and getting the results. Uh, when we do get that far, we're going to uh, use the same type of approach to present the results on a fleet wide basis that we've used previously. And then the team, uh, lastly, on this, the team also discussed some possible future work that might be of interest. Uh, there was some discussion about whether. Um, the, 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 the difference in outcomes uh, was greater or less if the, if the closure occurred after November 1. Uh, there, there might also be an interest to see whether um, vessels that reach a cap um, have a, a, a larger or smaller uh, differential effect from those that don't under the different alternatives. One of the concerns of this or one of the goals of this approach is to give incentives for vessels um, to avoid hitting a cap. So presumably if you have a, a larger negative economic impact for vessels that, that hit a cap than those that don't, that could be construed as creating a greater incentive. So there might be a way to tease that out of the analysis results. And then um, there might also be an interest to see whether unobservable vessels have uh, differential economic impacts from those that are observable. So anyway, we, we haven't uh, finalized the approach to do those uh, additional analyses, but if the council were interested, we could look into um, including those. Next slide. And so now I'm gonna transition from giving you sort of the overview of how the bootstrap methodology works and how it will apply to um, the, the analysis of alternative three to talking about the contents of our reports. Um, so uh, the team went through our advanced briefing book report and um, uh, just 
to give you an overview of what's in there, we present the preliminary bootstrap analysis of alternatives one and two. Um, we give the results for three different effort scenarios that I'll describe momentarily. And then we also include background um, technical details of the analysis and a summary of, wait a minute, I'm referring to the wrong report, I see. <laughs> uh, okay, so includes background technical details of an analysis and a summary of next steps needed to complete an analysis of the five sub options of alternative three. So I think I may have just um, described both of our reports by accident. Uh, next slide. Uh, this, is, this slide is to orient you to the um, violin plots in, in our uh, results. And so these are given in the main uh, briefing book team report uh, in several different uh, versions. And I'm going to open it up because I can't actually read the fine print up there on the screen. So if you look, what you're looking at there is... Um, figure three on page 10 of our advanced briefing book report. So this is, this is a violin plot showing the distribution of X vessel revenue across bootstrap replicates for alternatives one and two under scenario two. And so the main features to, to note on here, uh, the vertical scale, it shows dollars in thousands, but then if you read the fine print, those are actually thousands of dollars. So you can actually interpret the 2000 up there as $2 million. So the, we see that the, the results for the 11 uh, vessel uh, fleet size scenario uh, in a few cases will generate over $2 million of revenue for the 11 vessels fishing. Um, that's uh, that skinny little peak at the top. The width of that, of the quote unquote violin. Now, by the way, I play the violin and that doesn't actually look like one. But <laughs> uh, if you imagine that being a violin, the little skinny peak at the top, it means that it very, you very rarely will get that much revenue. It's over $2 million. Uh, as you go down, and the, the, the width is proportional to how frequently, frequently those different outcomes will occur. So down at the bottom, the base of the violins show that oftentimes you're not going to get uh, anywhere near a million dollars of revenue. Um, but, but then sort of in the halfway up, you, you see that you're getting up and around the, um, oh, I'm reading it wrong. Uh, so about halfway up, you get to the $1 million revenue level, which isn't clearly indicated. But if you imagine a vertical line between zero and 2000 there, that would be the $1 million revenue level. And that's about where the, the, the middle fat bar in our fat, uh, part between the curves is occurring. So a lot of seasons you'll get around a million dollars according to the simulation results. The other thing to note is that these two figures are not that different. Um, so so uh, between the no action and the alternative two case where you have the fleet wide caps, you're not seeing a lot of difference in economic outcomes. Next slide, please. Now, this next slide uh, is showing figure four distributions of hard cap species mortality or injury under alternatives one and two for scenario one, uh, for, sorry, for scenario two. Um, and the top uh, is the alternative one, um, uh, no action alternative. And the bottom one is the alternative two, which was our previous uh, hard caps final preferred alternative. And so, uh, each of these bar plots represents the uh, outcomes over um, uh, the, the, the vertical scale there should say percentage of seasons rather than percentage of sets. So what percentage of seasons, for example, do you have zero bottlenose dolphin takes, one or two? Those are the three cases represented in the leftmost uh, pair of bars with the top one representing the no action outcome and the bottom one representing um, uh, alternative two. And I think the striking thing about these is that uh, visually there's very little difference between the, the top and the bottom. So it, it suggests that by imposing the caps, you don't get a lot of difference in terms of the um, distribution of hard cap species mortality or injury. Um, between the no action and the, the fleet wide caps. Um, the other thing that people might be curious about in this figure is that it appears that in some cases, the um, outcomes include uh, numbers of takes exceeding the cap levels in the range of alternatives. 
Um, and that can happen because the caps only apply to observed vessels. So you have unobservable vessels that are also taken into account in the analysis and they can contribute to the, the, the count of uh, interactions or mortalities and injuries. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> So uh, this, this slide maybe could have been presented earlier, but um, uh, this is kind of giving the overview of the model parameters that the team chose for the updated analysis. So the data periods that we're using are the same ones that were used in the previous uh, uh, use of the bootstrap, except that we're going to extend it to the uh, two, 2020 through 21 season when we update the data. The current version of the data is uh, I believe just through 2013, because uh, in the interest of time, the team wasn't able to both update the data and move the analysis as far forward as we have. Um, the vessel effort scenarios are three. Uh, there's one that has two uh, total vessels fishing, one observed and, well, yeah, observable and one ob unobservable. Scenario two has 11 vessels fishing, seven observable, four unobservable, and then scenario three, 30 vessels, uh, 24 observable, six unobservable. Uh, the team kind of wrestled with a good approach to represent a range of possible uh, fleet sizes. And what we came up with was to um, consider the buyback program that California has in play. And kind of, so scenario one is sort of like the maximum number of vessels getting bought out scenario. Uh, scenario three is the minimal number of vessels getting bought out, plus all vessels that could fish coming into the fishery. And then scenario two is kind of like the baseline assumption, the most likely, what the, what the team thought was the most likely numbers of observable and un unobservable fish uh, vessels fishing if no additional vessels take the buyback. Um, we assume 25% fleet-wide observer coverage based on a recommendation from um, uh, 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 NIMS Observer Program Manager Charles Villafana, who's in our Long Beach office. Um, and we uh, the team considered uh, a request or suggestion to model behavioral changes in the fishery, uh, but we consider that not to be practicable because we don't have any data representative of the fishery operation if these new uh, individual alternative individual cap alternatives were put into place all data that we have uh, is actually representative of the fishery operating without hard caps so uh, the approach that we took on the behavioral changes was to just make a baseline assumption that the fishery is operating with no behavioral change in, in terms of bycatch rates uh, in response to the to the uh, different CAPS alternatives. Next slide. Uh, then um, because as you may have noticed, those, uh, those contrasting figures to show outcomes under alternative one and two looked so similar, uh, Dr. Dahl came up with this approach to um, illustrate differences in uh, the results between alternatives one and two. And so, for example, if you look at um, scenario one, that's the small vessel scenario, uh, those numbers represent the, the difference between the, um, the different outcomes that, would, uh, that our simulation results showed on average would occur under alternative two minus the results that would occur on average under alternative one. And by average, I mean over 10,000 simulated seasons, we average the results for sets, total revenue, total profits, average profits, landings, and then all the different uh, cap species takes. And so, for example, if you look under scenario one, total revenue, negative, um, well, it says 1,149, and I'm going to take it that that's the unit rather than units of thousands of thousands. <laughs> anyway, uh, so, so that's showing that you have a loss of revenue under scenario one of um, 1,149 on average when you go from the no caps to the caps. Under scenario two, you have uh, negative 15,000 as your loss of revenue and scenario three, negative 122,000. And then if you go down to the leatherback uh, mortality and injury, uh, that goes down by um, 
0.0003 under uh, the alternative one, presumably because you occasionally uh, reach a cap and reduce the future, the subsequent mortalities and injuries. Negative uh, 0.0048 under scenario two and negative 0.0364 under scenario three. So what you see here as we go across the scenarios from the uh, smallest to the largest vessel scenario is um, increasing levels of uh, uh, reduction in, in protected species, uh, well, hard cap species uh, mortality and injury, coupled with uh, increasing loss of ec economic uh, revenue and profits production poten potential. And there's two things going on here. Uh, one is that we have more vessels uh, fishing so there's more potential loss of revenue and profits and so on. And the other thing is that as you get more vessels in the fleet, you have a greater chance of reaching a cap because uh, basically uh, uh, more vessels in the fleet means more vessels observed. And uh, if they're, if they're uh, having interactions at the same rate, you're gonna reach a cap more often with more vessels observed. Um, down at the bottom, it's kind of hard to see, uh, but um, Kit went one step farther to um, sum up the total uh, mean reductions in mortalities and injuries, and then also take a ratio of um, the change in profits to the mean uh, reduction, I think total mean reduction. And so I can't really see those numbers, but I think it's roughly 250,000 for the, the uh, scenario one, 268 or nine for scenario two and 281 for scenario three. Those bottom numbers you can think of as the um, cost of uh, lost um, expected profits per uh, animal that uh, per, per reduction in uh, um, interactions with cap species, all of them. And then you can see with the mean, some of the mean reductions in the cap species that you roughly increase an order of magnitude in those uh, reductions for each uh, increase in the fleet size. So when we're at uh, only two vessels fishing in the simulations, we're getting about, uh, uh, I'm gonna have to turn my math brain on now, oh no. Uh, maybe, um, I think it's about uh, one in 500 or one in 500 years or something like that, or one, one, one take in 500 seasons maybe would be the right way to put it. And then I think we go down to um, one take in 50 seasons reduction in, in um, scenario two and one take in five seasons reduction in scenario three. And that's doing decimal division in my head. So I'm not 100% sure that was right. Next. And so this is um, a replication of a table which is in um, one of the advanced briefing book materials. This is agenda item G4, attachment one, information paper, paper on council action setting hard caps for protected species in the California, Oregon, large mesh drift gill net fishery. This is on page seven. And uh, this is a very nice, succinct summary of the um, options and sub options un under alternative three. So I'm not going to necessarily go through this blow by blow, but um, I, I'm including this for reference. And uh, if you look at it in your briefing book materials, that might be helpful to understanding exactly what all these different um, uh, options and sub options do. I'll just make a couple of uh, general remarks about what they kind of what I think is the intent here. Um, so you can see that in some cases, the, the caps are triggered by what we call reaching a cap. In other cases, they're triggered by exceeding a cap. So exceeding a cap means that you've got one more take than whatever, whatever the cap number is. So the alternatives that are based on exceedance are uh, going to cause less economic, uh, lost economic opportunity for the fishery because you have to get one more take in order to reach the exceedance level. Um, the other thing to note in this table is that some of the caps uh, have different closures at the vessel. Uh, if the um, 
closure occurs uh, before uh, November 1, the, the, the closure will be 30 days. Uh, if it occurs after November 1, then it's going to be only 14 days, with the goal here of um, causing less loss of economic opportunity for closures that occur at the end of the season when the fishery is known to um, uh, concentrate most of its effort and, and generate most of its economic production. Okay, so next. So now this is uh, an update on the state of the analysis and the next steps. So uh, team report two, the supplemental report identifies key issues with analysis and implementation of alternative three sub options. Uh, the individual caps uh, present unique modeling, implementation, and enforcement challenges. Uh, we have quite a detailed discussion in our um, supplemental uh, briefing book report on, on some of these uh, challenges of implementation. And this is in uh, on page two of the report. And then there's additional implementation challenges and nuances um, with the various sub options, uh, kind of what I was just showing you in that table a moment ago. Um, after uh, kind of looking over the different sub options, we, we uh, believe that uh, sub options B and C2 are likely to be the least adverse economically. Um, these are the, the options and sub options that are based on exceedance. Um, and that also include the, the variable length closures, which reduce the um, negative economic impacts of closing after November 1. Um, so then uh, preliminary results from uh, uh, the analysis we've done so far and our discussion suggest that um, there will be minimal differences in conservation impacts under the different um, uh, options and sub options. And then given workload concerns with analyzing the impacts and feasibility of all alternative three options, the team would prioritize analyzing sub options C2. Next. And then some timeline considerations. So the team aims to complete uh, an ROA analysis in time for SSC review at the September council meeting. Uh, this would allow time to address feedback from the SSC and any additional considerations necessary to support final action by the Council at the November 2022 Council meeting. And I think that's the last slide. And if so, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Very good. Um, questions for Dr. Stokes on the uh, HMS management team report? Corey Writing. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, thanks, Steve. Nice to see you. Um, that was an extremely thorough report and there was a lot in there. So um, just filtering through it. Uh, would also like to note that doesn't look very much like a violin. Looks more like a sitar plot. <laughs> Some even look less like a violin than the one I showed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in figure two of the HMSMT report and in the um, briefing that you just gave us, it says um, in a couple of times throughout the report and in various different ways that there is little difference in conservation impacts between alternative one and two. Um, and then you, you showed us here on one of your slides in regards to the model parameters that it's um, not practicable to model behavioral changes. Um, and there's no data representative of fishery operation if hard caps were put into place. Um, so, trying to reconcile those things, especially in light of the purpose and needs statement of this action, which is to incentivize fishing practices and tools, um, which speaks pretty directly to the intention of motivating behavior change. Um, yeah, uh, so we've uh, we've gone over this a few times in our meeting discussions, both uh, at the March Council meeting as well as um, our interim meetings. And uh, Teresa Labriola actually kind of queued up there, uh, teed up this discussion in March. And I told her at that time what I told you all now, which is one of the problems with doing that is we don't really have any empirical basis on which to base an analysis. This is an empirical analysis. We're using data that we have from the past operation of the fishery to try to characterize how the fishery would, would operate under these alternatives. So to try to guess about how much, um, say, bycatch rates of these cap species would change is, is kind of difficult given that we have no evidence from the fishery operating under caps on which to base that. However, there is, um, I did, 
actually respond to Teresa with what I think might be a way to characterize the range of outcomes in, in terms of, you know, how much could the behavioral incentives improve the operation of the fishery? I would claim that if you look at the uh, no action alternative, which is no caps, so there we're using the past behavior of the fishery, which presumably was mainly about trying to optimize the outcome for the fishermen because they weren't they didn't have to fish under caps back in the day. So if you take the outcome for the no action alternative analysis, and then you put in zero bycatch for any of the cap species, in a way that's the best possible outcome. You have no bycatch and you sort of have the operation of the fishery without the constraint of caps. Because if they never had any, if they never had any bycatch, you know, if, that, if the incentives were 100% effective and they never had any more bycatch of any of these species, presumably they'd operate the way they used to without caps, but there'd be no bycatch. So that's kind of one, that's sort of like the Goldilocks scenario. And then the other end of that possible range of outcomes is I would claim represented by the analysis that we're doing. The analysis we're doing assumes no reduction in bycatch at all due to the behavioral incentives in the caps. So if there's no reduction at all, then the best way to model that would be to just take the past operation of the fishery and run it through these different uh, uh, options and sub options. And so I would claim that those two uh, possibilities bracket the range of pos uh, possible outcomes. But I will go one step farther, which is I think the analysis we're doing based on just, you know, not making any behavioral assumptions, nonetheless can potentially reveal the incentives created by these different alternatives. If you, if you set up, if, if you summarize the results uh, in a certain way, there might be a way to show that some of the alternatives create a greater behavioral incentive by, by having a, a worse outcome for people who hit the caps under the individual, maybe, maybe some of the individual caps alternatives result in a larger gap between those who don't hit a cap and those who do hit a cap. That's not in our current analysis, but I believe we could build in a, a, a summary of the bootstrap results to look at how the, diff, how the outcomes differ between those who hit a cap and those who don't. And then we could claim that some of the uh, alternatives offer a stronger behavioral incentive because those who hit the cap have a, a worse economic outcome than those who don't. And for example, if everybody is subject to the fleet wide cap, then everybody's treated the same and shut down. But if on, in other alternatives, only the individual who hits a cap is shut down, that's gonna create a larger differential effect between those who don't hit a cap and those who do. So if there were interests uh, uh, on the council's behalf, we could look at the incentives through that lens without having to make arbitrary behavioral assumptions. Thanks, Steve, for that. Um, I will admit I am not smart enough to figure out what you just said, and it's That's all right. completeness. It's in the record. <laughs> <laughs> so I will just note um, that it would be great to see that analysis in any future um, documentation that in your capacity at NIMS or on the management team can put forward. Um, and if I may, one more quick question, Mr. Vase. Yeah. Um, you noted that um, there's just sort of a lack of information and data to be able to think about this possible behavior change um, and that that wasn't available for you to analyze. Do you have any um, thoughts or ideas or things that could be done to try to incorporate that in the next round? I think it would make sense to formally write up the uh, point I just made about the range of possible outcomes with the Goldilocks scenario being the fishery operates as it always did, but there's no bycatch. That's sort of the best case scenario. And then the other end of that range is, well, um, the fishery operates under these alternative, you know, these management alternatives, these options and sub options with absolutely no behavioral response. So if we just treat all the fishermen as though they're operating as they always did, and, and then compare the outcomes under these different um, options and sub options, that would be the no behavioral response scenario. 
And I would claim that if you tried to pr uh, guess what the behavioral response was, it would end up bracketed by those two extremes. So we could write a formal description of what I just said to try to motivate that point. Thanks, Steve. You're welcome. Thank you, Corey. Oh, yeah. I'll go to Ryan Wolf and then uh, to John Ugertz. So. Thanks. Uh, and thanks, Dr. Sodes, uh, for your presentation. I always appreciate your presentations and I uh, appreciated the movie reference. And <laughs> every time I see the word bootstrap, it makes me think of another uh, movie. And I, <laughs> I, I only mention that as a kind of personal challenge to Craig Hess for one of our maybe future musical interludes if he gets the reference. Um, I would like to go to slide 12. I had a question on it. I just want to make sure I'm understanding this. It's the one that had the three columns of the, yes, that one. So I just, this is a clarifying question just to make sure I am reading this correctly. So looking at scenario one, um, which is I think two vessels, right? Um, the just a thousand dollars in total revenue loss is not saying that that's the economic impact if they hit a cap, that is just a low number because it is an average of how many times they would hit the cap over 10,000 scenarios, and then that's averaged out to the economic cost. Do you understand? Think, think of 10,000 simulated seasons that incorporate the range of variation that, that is embodied in the past experience. Over those 10,000 simulated seasons, we average the uh, total revenue production under alternative one and under alternative two. If you subtract those two average outcomes, that's what that number means. Thank you. And then just a comment, I did want to note um, all of the work that's gone into this, and I appreciate that as well as uh, it's noted in a number of your, in your presentation, but also in the, all of the reports. Uh, and also echoed in the AS report, which we'll hear in a little bit, is the significant amount of work that's been put into this, as well as what is still needed uh, to complete uh, analysis for council action. I, and I just wanted to really thank you, Dr. Stoes, for all of your work on that, uh, but Carter Harmon as well from my staff and, and, and the other NIMS folks and, and MT members that have been involved. So thank you for that. You're welcome. All right, thank you, Ryan. Um, John Ugert? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair, and thanks, Dr. Stowes, for the report. Um, uh, just a clarifying question regarding what your data source is for income in the fishery. I'm seeing your violin plot with a potential for $2 million, and that's just not jibing with what this fishery has ever generated in next vessel value. Um, can you, let me see, got to get back to my violin plot page in the report. Uh, this is figure three, correct? Hopefully. Uh, the, yeah, I don't have the slide numbers on my screen, so I can't yeah, point you to which I, slide. I think this slide shows, can you possibly go back? Oh, there we go. Yeah, this is figure three. And so the $2 million plus outcome is kind of up there at that skinny little point at the top. And so what that is telling us is that this is a simulation outcome that is quite unlikely to occur. The skinny part of the violin is the range that is predicted to be unlikely to occur. Now, I can't tell you exactly what the um, overall percentage of the area in the violin is encompassed by that part above 2 million, but I'm guessing that it's something like below 5%, maybe below 3%. So this is like the, the best season ever that the drift gillnet fishery may never have had over its 40 years of existence. It doesn't occur that often in the real world. It's saying that if everything went as well as possible for all the fishermen, based on past experience, this is the best possible season ever that we could have for an 11 fleet um, uh, fishery. I'm sorry, 11 vessel fleet. But it may never have occurred in the past because it's an unlikely outcome. Uh, the more likely outcomes are the part of the violin that are thicker down below. Thanks, and through the vice chair, a follow-up. 
Um, I, I understand what the plot is showing. What I'm asking is what the data input into the model was that you used to determine potential value in the fishery. Uh, pack fin data to represent revenues production, observer data to represent um, uh, numbers of sets, fish, and take experience, also logbook data to, to represent how many um, days uh, or trips the, the fishermen fish in different seasons. So there's a fairly intricate um, simulation technique to, to randomly draw a potential season which is representative of the distribution of past fishing effort at the individual vessel level. And then we construct the, uh, the simulated seasons for the individual vessels based on how many there are under a given scenario. So we would uh, construct 11 simulated seasons in order to uh, uh, create a bootstrap replicate for the 11 um, vessel fleets and, uh, scenario. Thanks again. So for the PACFIN data, what years? Uh, the current version, I, I may have uh, mentioned that we have yet to update the data through 2021. So this is the data that we used the last time we did this, which was representative of the years 2001 through 20. 13, 20, 14 season. These are the years that the fishery fished since the establishment of the uh, Pacific Leatherback Conservation Area to try to reduce the impacts on uh, leatherback turtles north of Point Conception between August 15th and November 15th. So uh, when we did this analysis previously and I presented it to the SSC, they said that they, uh, they agreed with the approach of using this as one um, uh, scenario to, to represent the fishery as it operated after the uh, Endangered Species Act legislation went into effect. And the other uh, scenario was to use data back all the way to 1990, which is the beginning of the NIMS Observer Program. Uh, we haven't got that far to analyze that data yet, but the, the goal would be to um, ultimately analyze both of those data ranges, 1990 to most recent and 2001 to most recent. John? Yeah, thanks. Um, moving to a separate question, you and the team have mentioned that the analyses are complex. We see that in this report, I appreciate that. Um, is there a benefit to the team in terms of being able to complete the analyses by reducing the number of sub options in alternative three? Uh, boy, that's that's been a fraught discussion because I'm the guy who's writing the R code, so I have a different perspective on this than others on the team. <laughs> so I'll try to give my perspective and then try to give what I understand some of my uh, teammates' concerns to be. Um, my perspective is that trying to extend the previous analysis, which only dealt with fleet-wide caps to the end of the season, to the, the nuanced variation of all these options and sub-options has been quite an analytical lift. And in particular, just going before we were analyzing the fleet as a whole in each year, not trying to get into the nuance of individual vessels, paying attention to which vessels in the simulation are observed observable or unobservable, uh, paying attention to when a closure went into effect. So all of these little bells and whistles take uh, extra analytical effort in the way that you model, uh, the way you write your code. I assume there might be some lessons. Um, some, some of the difficulties in coding may translate into difficulties uh, or pra practicality of implementation of some of these um, uh, options and sub options. That said, I think that the heavy lifting to develop the methodology is almost done. The one step that I'm still struggling with is, for example, in the um, 11 vessel scenario, you've got seven observed vessels and you have nine cap species. So that's seven times nine, 63 different accumulation process processes that you have to track in the way that you uh, write your simulations. And then there's another um, nine uh, fleet-wide 
accumulation processes going on that apply to the fleet-wide caps. So you have a total of 72 different processes that you have to track through your simulated season. Once you reach a point in a simulated season when a cap is reached, you have to revise your future takes to take into account that some of the vessels are no longer fishing. So you have to zero out the potential takes in the period for which uh, some of the vessels are off the water and then move forward from there to de determine the, the point when another cap is reached. So so this this step has proven the most challenging uh, I think I see how to do it, but it, it'll take a little bit longer to get to that point. So at this point, I have the one vessel, or sorry, the two vessel, one observed vessel scenario going for, for one. Uh, I have that modeled and running for one of the cases. If I can extend that to the 11 vessel um, uh, fleet size, then I think that's really the big sort of, you know, once that that next step is is reached, then I think it will be fairly straightforward to to build in the different uh, options and sub options into the simulation. So that's my opinion as a, a, a modeler and an R coder. Uh, those uh, team members who don't code in R and are kind of just, you know, part, you know, trying to support my efforts are a little bit less sure about how hard it'll be. And so part of the discussion is, does it help to have fewer alternatives and or options and sub options? And my sense is that once this um, methodology is working for one of them, it won't be that hard to do it for the other four. But I haven't done it yet, so that's I think what what makes everybody worry. So <laughs> it's just my intuition tells me that. But uh, until I've done it, I can't tell you exactly how long it'll take. And if we have a hard deadline to present it to the SSC in um, September, that would be a, a good individual incentive for me to get it done. But there's still, you know, the time is sort of an uncertain factor. How long will it take? The point I'm making is the additional time to get all of the sub options versus a subset is not the big piece of the lift. Okay. John, you good? Thanks, I'll spare us anything else. Corey Niles. Uh, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Steve. Um, first, I'm, I'm gonna go back to your exchange with Corey because I did understand what you say, and it's crucial. Um, I, Steve taught me how to do the bootstrap, so <laughs> I understand exactly. And, and it gets to the heart of the matter. But first, just on number slide number 12, um, I heard your explanation of that, but I'm still not understanding how to read this table. Um, but first, I, are those are the labels on the last two rows, are those flipped by chance? Like one's a ratio, one's a dollar amount. Or can you explain what those last two rows mean? Uh, I don't think they're flipped. Um, Kit, you, you can back me up on this maybe. I, I have to uh, give Kit credit for creating this little summary. But um, if I understand it, the, the top of those two rows is obtained by just summing down all the nine cap species um, average outcomes or average differences. And so that the point negative point zero zero two zero is going to be obtained by going leatherback, loggerhead, olive ridley, and so on down the leftmost column and summing up all those negative numbers. Then, if we take uh, the um, uh, total, the average for um, change in in total profits, I guess, the the negative 508 and divide that by the negative 0 0.0020, then that gives us the number at the bottom. Is that correct? Yes. And so uh, we're interpreting that as the uh, ratio of the expected loss in total profits to the expected number of um, re expected reduction in cap species take for all nine cap species. So you can think of it as kind of like a, um, a shadow price of, uh, of imposing that alternative. Okay, maybe what's mixing me up, Steve, is that why the how can you have a dollar amount be a ratio? But um, I think I see what you're saying. The last so, yeah, so it's a, it is not just a dollar amount. It's a little more subtle. It's the ratio of dollars per um, uh, reduction in, in expected takes. 
Uh, thanks, but okay, backing up to what that exchange between you and, and the better Corey over there. Um, ah. <laughs> I've, so I've seen the team, we were talking the difference between modeling behavior and then and using logic and common sense to speculate, which the, the team does very well um, in, in many contexts. So what I heard you, I'm gonna first I'm gonna pick on your word, uh, Goldilocks, um, <laughs> I'm going to use it differently, but so what, what you're saying, the team's been telling us is, as Corey was saying, our purpose and need here is to create an incentive. The purpose of, it, of doing that is to change behavior. You're saying we can't really, we, we don't know exactly what that change would be in terms of quantifying it, but, but ways of bracking that would be to assume that bycatch is fully within their control is one and then and the opposite side it's not in their control at all correct so to me i'm picking on your goldilocks goldilocks would be the right amount of incentive in between those two like the council will uh, faces a policy choice here a risk call about the balance of economics and the effect of that incentive it, it's it's a policy call um so the Goldilocks incentive is what we're after. And really, I think that's what you're saying you could set up using using those bracketing models. You're saying the incentive you would expect would, would be proportional, the stronger the dollar amounts, the cost is, is what you're saying. We could assume a stronger incentive exists if the penalty is, is stronger or it's individualized versus spread over the fleet. So. I'm not not summing up as well as it was in my head, but I think that's that approach you were saying makes perfect sense to me and just wanting to say if um see if I'm getting that right. So you're like we we can only assume that it's completely out of their control, fully in their control, and then in the end it's gonna be um a question of whether it, how much in their control is it and where we'd expect the effect of the incentive to be. Yeah, that, that was one of the things I said. I think that's how we can bracket the possible range of outcomes without making assumptions about how, uh, how much the bycatch reduction is gonna be. We can say, this is what happens if bycatch is reduced 100%. This is uh, our simulation scenario for that. And this is if bycatch is reduced not at all. And that's the range of possible outcomes. And then if there is a behavioral response, it's going to be somewhere in between. But the other thing, the other thing I said in response to the other Corey is that I believe we can capture the differential behavioral um, incentives created under the different alternatives by comparing simulation outcomes for vessels that don't hit caps to those that do. And so we can get at the question without needing to make arbitrary assumptions about how much of an incentive is going to be created and how much will bycatch go down. Great. Thanks, Corey. Further questions uh, for Dr. Sills? Okay. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, oh, I'm sorry. Steve? What's the late hand? Steve? Sorry, I, I jumped that gun, Carl <laughs> Brady. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Sorry. I, worst case scenario, um, you're, you're talking about your model work and getting to a deadline for the SSC in September. What's what's the the what happens if we don't meet that? Does that mean November? And is, should that be part of our consideration in uh, looking at workload for this item? Uh, I'm going to say it should be just because the team discussed that and the, I'm probably not the best team member to get into the nuances of, of what that it will look like, but we can address that in our future um, workload planning report, which we haven't written yet or is being drafted. Yes, thank you. Okay, no one else? Thank you. Now you can go. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Um, well, we're at noon, and so we're going to go to a lunch break, and uh, we're going to do an hour and 15 minutes. Give us a little more time because we're still maybe, a, well, hopefully we're on track here, so let's, let's go with that.
Okay. Um, well, before lunch, we ended, uh, ended up finishing the management team report, and now we'll go to the HMS um, advisor subpanel report. And uh, I believe Dave Rudy. Dave. Good afternoon, uh, Vice Chair Pettinger and Council Members. Um, again, I'm just going to um, hit a few highlights on our, on the on our report not going to not read it for you. So uh, the advisory sub panel, again, as you know, has very various uh, opinions and, and ideas. And so we went round and round on this one also. But in the end, we did want to state that we we have supported the hard caps when they're based on science. Uh, second of all, the uh, California SB 1017 Due to, the, due to the buyback program, there's currently less than 10 active fishermen in the DGN fishery. And based on the legislation, the California permits will sunset January of 2024. Uh, also, the DGN fishery was, uh, was showed improvement and was changed category from a category one fishery to a category two fishery in 2018 by National Marine Fisheries Service. Um, we also await the further analysis by the management team. And once the management team does their further analysis, hopefully we can give you some better advice at the following meeting where this agenda item comes up again, I guess likely in November. Okay, thank you, Dave. Questions for Dave on the advisory panel report? Do you have any? Okay, thanks Dave. Next up is the uh, EC report and Greg Bush. Good afternoon, I'm Greg Bush with NOAA Fisheries Office of Law Enforcement, Chair of the Enforcement Consultants. I'll be reading agenda item G4A, Supplemental EC Report 1, Enforcement Consultants Report on Drift Gillnet Fishery Hard Caps. The enforcement consultants have reviewed the documents associated with agenda item G4, Drift Gillnet Fishery Hard Caps, and provide the following comments related to alternative three, in-season individual vessel and fleet-wide closures. The EC is concerned with the potential complexity associated with the notification and tracking of closures associated with individual vessel caps. While fleet closures are typically announced in the Federal Register with a set of effective dates that are enforceable, individual vessel closures may require documentation of the actual vessel owner notification date. This unique notification date may require tracking the 14-day, 30-day, or season closure by vessel, which includes not only the vessel involved in the take, but also the vessels that are determined to be unobservable. Multiple species caps being reached during the same season further complicates tracking individual vessel closures. Should notification occur while the vessels are at sea, the EC notes the closures will also require an offload within four days of the effective date of the closure. The EC also recommends using the term closure rather than cease fishing to align with West Coast highly migratory species fishery regulations. This concludes our statement. Thank you, Greg. Questions for Greg on the uh, EC report? Okay. Thanks, Greg. Okay, then, uh, that takes care of the advisory bodies. Um, so now we go to public comment. And uh, I think we have at least three or four, I believe. Is that? Okay. There we go. Thank you, Chris. All right, we'll start off with um, Jeff Shester, uh, followed by Teresa Labriola. Jeff? 
Hi, good afternoon, um, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the council. This is Jeff Shuster representing Oceana. Um, I wanted to start uh, by uh, referencing our comment letter and uh, also the supplemental analysis that we provided in the briefing book that we submitted as part of this oral comment uh, that did do an initial analysis of the observer data. Uh, and the observer data uh, we're, we are concerned does uh, further concern confirm the longstanding uh, conservation problems with the drift gillnet fishery. Uh, there were, the key points from that were you know, seven vessels uh, fished, 80% of the sets were unobserved, 26% were unobservable. And based on that data, uh, the fishery caught one marine mammal for every three swordfish landed, uh, discarded more than eight fish for every swordfish landed. Uh, killed at one common dolphin for every four swordfish, and overall caught 92 marine mammals, 87 of which were released dead. And we note that there were two humpback whales caught in calendar year 2021. Oceana strongly opposed NIMF's recent issuance of a negative impact determination and MMPA incidental take permit for the swordfish drift gillnet fishery. NIMS failed to address the concerns raised in our comment letter regarding excessive impacts to humpback whales, inadequate analysis, ignoring the 2021 bycatch events, underreporting of marine mammal bycatch by fishermen, and the lack of hard caps. Uh, conversely, uh, California's transition program is now fully funded, uh, with Oceana having contributed a million dollars, uh, Ocean Protection Council committed a, mil a million, and the California legislator, legislature contributed 1.3 million last year. This means that all 44 California drift gillnet permit holders who signed up for the transition program, including 28 of the 32 active permit holders, have funding available. And the program is scheduled to be uh, complete by this October and that all the, all the nets must be turned in and permits by that time. In addition, you're aware that federal legislation is advancing in Congress to fully phase out drift gillnets. Um, hard caps are critical in the interim as part of an approach to, to phasing out this fishery. They create incentives to avoid hard cap species and provide incentives to switch to cleaner gear. We ask that uh, the council finalize the range of alternatives at this meeting, select alternative two, from the, the, which includes the original suite of fleet-wide hard caps as the PPA, and ensure the analysis is ready for SSC review in September and final action can be taken in November. And we believe it's critical that this uh, process be kept on schedule. We also ask that the council reaffirm its recommendation for 100% observer coverage in the drift gillnet fishery and remove the unobservable exemption whereby some vessels never carry in an, an observer. Just as the council recommended in 2015, it should be simple. If a vessel is unable to carry an observer, they should not be able to fish with drift gillnets. Uh, we further ask that the council schedule a fishery management plan amendment to the HMS FMP to sunset the federal permits consistent with the California state phase out by January 31st, 2024. As we stated, um, hard caps are a critical policy tool during the phase out period, even if a small number of vessels remain. Uh, hard caps uh, would be done under Magnuson Stevens Act authority, taking into account the social value of whales and sea turtles above and beyond the minimum standards of the MMPA and, and the Endangered Species Act. Consistent with hard caps and other fisheries, hard caps prevent increases in, bar in, in bycatch and incentivize changes in behavior. We continue to be disappointed by the continued shortcomings of the management team and NIMS analysis uh, of hard caps, which incorrectly concludes that hard caps will have economic impact but insignificant conservation benefits. This conclusion was repeatedly disputed uh, multiple times by Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and California Department of Fish and Wildlife when NIMS originally withdrew the hard caps rule. The conclusion uh, in the analysis is premised on the incorrect assumption that fishing behavior does not change with hard caps in place. And we note the management team's response that it is, quote, not practical to model behavioral changes. However, you know, the, the literature on economic and policy analysis is rich uh, with the impacts of penalties and other incentives in changing behavior in, in policy. Um, cer certainly, the management team could have looked at how hard caps have changed bycatch rates in other fisheries because we believe ignoring this is a fatal flaw. Uh, penalties certainly disincentivize behaviors, and that's often the point. The stronger the penalty, the stronger the disincentive. The management team's argument is akin to saying that speeding tickets don't work because people drive the same speed regardless of whether there is a penalty. And clearly, that's not the case as the penalty uh, uh, creates a, a disincentive to speed. 
uh, based on the management team approach, the policymakers would be eliminating all penalties as they would have economic impacts without changing behavior. And this disputes the primary purpose of penalties, which is to discourage behavior. In the fishing context, hard caps have been repeatedly shown to change fishing behavior. The council is well aware of this in ground fish, where 100% observer coverage and hard caps on bycatch have created incentives that result in, in certain fishing areas being avoided, improvements to fishing gear, and changes in participation. Uh, hard caps on sea turtle bycatch and pelagic longlines in, in Hawaii have also been shown to change behavior. And certainly hard caps incentivize more careful fishing uh, including choices of when and where to set gear and whether to switch to alternative gears. Uh, the use of tools like EcoCast, for example, could be used to further reduce risk and, and hard caps would provide incentives to use such tools. Um, the presence of an alternative successful gear is another key omission from the management team analysis. In 2021, fishermen using deep set buoy gear landed roughly four times more swordfish into California ports than fishermen using drift gill nets. And the same uh, ratio was was roughly uh, uh, there in 2020 as well. So last year, nearly 42 metric tons were caught with deep set buoy gear versus less than 10 tons with drift gill net. And deep set buoy gear consistently earns a higher price per pound. So any economic analysis should recognize the ability to switch to alternative gear in the event of a closure and the small uh, economic impact given the low levels of current participation in the fishery. Further, the management team analysis does not consider the humpback whale take in the most recent 2021-22 season. Uh, continued statements by the management team and NIMPS about the minimal conservation benefit of hard caps is simply inconsistent with the best available science and is an intentionally misleading circular policy analysis where the conclusion of no behavioral change or no conservation benefit is created by the assumption of no behavioral change it, it's, it itself, which is in conflict with the council's policy objectives to clean up a high bycatch fishery. So given the extensive literature on behavioral changes caused by policy incentives, there's simply no excuse for the management team to continue to ignore this. And if this, if this does go to the SSC, that, that assumption of no behavioral change should be a focus. Uh, despite the analysis shortcomings, however, we do note that with a small fleet size that accounts for the projected participation after the transition, the California transition program, scenario one, the management team found less than 1% difference in economic outcomes between alternatives one and two. This is in, on pages five and six of the management team report. If the concern is effects on individual fishermen in the years hard caps are hit, there really needs to be a case-by-case -case analysis of the alternative opportunities available to each of those fishermen, particularly since those, those fishermen were offered opportunities to participate in deep set buoy gear. So there's really no basis for concluding alternative two should not be adopted due to economics. Alternative three and the various sub options makes, makes attempts to make things much more complicated with the goal of reducing economic impacts by increasing the original hard cap levels and lessening the penalties and creating individual caps while uh, also allowing some of vessels to go without any caps that are unobserved. This is clearly creating analysis challenges and we don't see a value in further spending a whole lot of analytical time on these as the analysis already shows alternative two as minimal economic impacts. So in conclusion, we, hard caps are a critical tool in ensuring that any continued drift gill net fishing does not increase bycatch and has strong incentives to avoid whales and sea turtles. And we hope that the council honors its previous policy choices. We ask the council to ensure final action can be taken at the November meeting select alternative two, the original fleet-wide hard caps, recommend 100% monitoring, and initiate a full phase out of dr drift gill net gear in the HMS FMP. Thank you, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jeff. Questions for Jeff on his testimony? Okay, seeing no hands. Thanks, Jeff. Um, next up is Teresa Labriola, followed by Gary Burke. Teresa. Oh, good afternoon, Vice Chair Pettinger and members of the council. I'm Teresa Labriola, uh, representing Wild Oceans. I also submitted a supplemental written comment on behalf of Wild Oceans and the International Game Fish Association, American Sport Fishing Association, and Coastal Conservation Association of California. We are all invested in the sustainable management of our Pacific highly migratory species and the removal of indiscriminate fishing gear from our oceans. And we do support the transition of the California swordfish fishery 
from drift gill nets to sustainable gear with minimal bycatch or negative impacts on the open ocean ecosystem. And in the meantime, we stand behind the council's effort to develop hard caps on the drift gill net fishery. Um, I do want to thank the management team for their continued work to try to analyze hard caps in a changing landscape as the fleet size changes and alternative gears become available. Um, the council asked some very good questions today that, that shows the difficulty of, of this. And um, I, I'm grateful for them to take on the challenge and look forward to seeing additional results and analysis in September. Um, with this in mind, we encourage the council and NIMPS to finalize this action as soon as possible and ask the council to continue with final action in November and to consider the full range of alternatives at that time that have been um, presented um, in just saying that um, there was some discussion about uh, preparing just one alternative for the SSC to review. Um, and I would not want to see uh, only one of these uh, alternative three options put forward uh, at the end um, due to lack of, of time to analyze a different range of individual and fleet-wide hard caps. If you're going to go down the road of analyzing a, a series of alternatives or an alternative with individual and fleet-wide hard caps, I would like to see the range that you have, have selected um, in the past. Um, Wild Oceans and IGFA, CCA California, and American Sport Fishing Association represent conservation mind and recreational anglers and businesses. And cumulative, cumulatively, recreational fishing and businesses contribute more than $2.5 billion to the coastal economy of California every year. And as the, um, the recreational community has um, taken on conservation measures intended to sustain and rebuild fish populations in, in HMS fisheries. You can look at bluefin tuna as one example of um, activities taken by that community to reduce impact. And we're troubled when we see fishing practices that fail to safeguard precious and valuable ocean resources and marine life. Um, in particular, the large mesh drift gill net fishery in California has stood out as historically taking a significant toll on non-target species. Um, in the past two years, the gillnet fishery has changed its focus. Um, the, the report provided by National Marine Fisheries Service shows that it has uh, predominantly caught bluefin tuna, um, another economically and very culturally valuable recreational species. Uh, this shift also coincided with the observed take of two humpback whales. And, Hard, this is where I see hard caps as um, providing an effective conservation backstop to limit harm to protected and endangered species when the fishery changes behavior, such as targeting bluefin tuna, or when species shift in response to changing ocean conditions. Um, as we see, saw this year, even a very small fleet can have a large impact on protected species, uh, such as humpback whales. Um, We've actively participated in the federal and state development of best fishing practices for the swordfish fishery. And in 2015, we supported the council's careful consideration of the benefits and risks associated with drift gill nets and the decision to adopt hard caps. And we continue to support hard caps as a way of limiting the bycatch of endangered and threatened mammals and sea turtles um, until the, the gear is phased out or until it's replaced with selective and sustainable alternatives. It's difficult to imagine that hard caps will not incentivize uh, fishermen, gillnet fishermen, to take extra caution before setting for swordfish or tuna or other species and provide accountability me measures on the fleet. Um, there's a national and global movement to eliminate ecological damage caused by drift gillnets by moving to gear and adopting greener alternatives. And we look forward to continuing to work with the council to change the tide from indiscriminate gear towards fisheries that are more sustainable and have um, high yield and support the future of fishing. And thank you so much. Very good, uh, very good. Thank you, Teresa. Questions for Teresa? Okay, I'm seeing hands. Thank you, Teresa. Um, Next is Gary Burke, followed by uh, Tim Bouquet.
see, oh, there it is. Now you can hear me. Uh, council members, <clears throat> most of you guys have been around long enough to know me, Gary Burke, been uh, a drift net sword fisherman since the inception of the uh, fishery. I got a couple quick observations that just surprises me. Here we are again after the years of listening to the protective species talk about what a great uh, managed fishery this is, almost a gold standard of how we've improved and done everything. The Marine Mammal Commission coming up to you guys and saying hard caps is no benefit because such rare interactions. And yet here we are. My second observation is that I should have continued with calculus so I could have understood Dr. Stoll's uh, analysis is a little better. So I'll get to my points that uh, kind of concern me is one, this whole thing starts again with a new purpose and need to incentivize our behavior. You know, we've said it over and over again, your net is kind of like your bank account. You lose it, you're broke. Uh, a whale interactions like the IRS showing up on your ocean. It's never good. If you have a, a whale just go through your net, you got to go home to the dock, to pull it off, takes a day or two, uh, a lot of money to repair it, get a couple guys, and then you got to put it back in. You've lost three or four days. Uh, if a whale completely takes it out, you're out of business. So, I mean, for us, I don't see how you think hard caps is going to incentivize something that I don't even see. I look around, if you see whales, every one of us move. But if you're looking like a sperm whale goes 20 miles an hour, I could set at dusk. By midnight, that whale could have been 100 miles away and shows up. I mean, we don't like any interactions with marine mammals. All it does is uh, cost us time, money, and gives us bad light and publicity. So, you know, the fleet now is getting smaller and smaller. I think I heard there was only seven active boats left last year. And there wasn't a great swordfish season, but it was good for bluefin. And some of the bigger boats in uh, San Diego, they had good seasons because of the bycatch and the bluefin. Uh, probably upwards of $100,000. They had some $30,000 sets, which I have always said about this fishery. It isn't just about the swordfish. It's about the two best eating sharks we get here, uh, Mako and Thrasher. It's about luvar, which is an occasional, one of the best eating fish I've ever had in my life. Opa is becoming very valuable. The tunas we catch and the swordfish. So if the swordfish isn't there, we can still make it on other things. You look at the deep set buoy gear as Oceania and all goes, oh, now there's a transition. Why are they asking for more gear? Look at the reports they put in last year. Half, they all went broke. In the years before, only a few of the guys made some really good money. It's not a transition. It, it is, you can't replace this fishery. This fishery produces still, if only a handful of guys left, we produce a lot of fish at the time when we need it, October. The guys that are left down in San Diego, they don't have other permits. They fish albacore, basically. Almost every one of them, either albacore or drift net. Albacore has been pretty bad in the last couple of years. So the drift net fisheries, a heavy reliance on them making any money for the year. You look at these alternatives, 14 days, even if it comes uh, after, uh, let's say you had it in uh, October 30th and you got 14 days in November. Well, fishing around the moon, three days before and after is not very good because all the fish go deep, you don't catch much. So you could probably lose 21 days there in November. And those are important. That's when the price of swordfish is generally the highest and everything else. The economic impact on losing any of those things is gonna be tremendous on this fleet, no matter what you do. We've already gone through a situation like that. And uh, I think under Magnuson 7, that it would still apply maybe more now than ever. Uh, you know, with the fleet being so small, the interactions, I don't, you know, are going to be less. I don't, I don't see why all this time and effort at this point, why it's even here. I mean, I was scratching my head. One, one of the things I was thinking is, look at the coincidence that the guys who are in the California buyout have until 
this October to decide. So we put hard caps there and say, hey, this is coming. Maybe uh, you better take that buyout. Way to reduce. I don't know if it's California trying to reduce it down to nothing. They've never hardly ever been on our side. But I look at that and I go, uh, it's just we need this fishery. I mean, uh, the matter, like I said, we need this fishery. You look what's happening in all our California fisheries. And, and uh, it's still the best pl way to catch fish inside the EZ there is. Unless you're going to let long line in there. Totally. I don't know how we're going to get fresh fish. And now we're talking about EFPs for buoy gear, third, 10 miles. You know, back in the day, we'd get one mile a net. We used to have 235 guys. So in buoy gear, you're going to have 10 miles, 30 pieces of gear, 50 pieces of gear, 100 pe people doing it. It's going to be some entanglation, just like Dungeness crab fishery. I mean, you can't help it with that much stuff. Things are going to happen. This, this is a good fishery. You guys, I wish sometime would uh, stand up for it. I mean, that's like, uh, we, we can't lose it, in my opinion. So thanks. That's my comments. Thank you, Gary. Any questions? Questions for Gary? Thank you, guys. Okay. Still Anderson. I don't have a question, just Gary. Gary. That's all right. I, Gary, I didn't have a question. I just wanted to thank you for, for being here and, and your um, your constant uh, uh, voice um, defending your fishery. Um, I mean, we, we are listening to you, even though sometimes you may not think so, but um, your effort and 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 your being here makes a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Okay. Um, next up is uh, Tim Mulcahy. Tim, are you there? He's not there. Oh, nope. Okay. Well, Tim is not there. So that will take us to uh, council action. And so with that, I'll open the floor for discussion. Or not. Oh. I'm sorry, uh, John Ugaritz. Sorry, John, I had it on the attendee list here, so I didn't see your hand. Thanks, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I think we're we're at a phase here where we've got a partial analysis of a couple of the alternatives in our range of alternatives. I think um, that obviously we can't choose between that range of alternatives right now because we can't compare them equally. And I don't feel that we need to do that right now. Um, I do feel like the team has made great strides in their analyses, and I appreciate their hard work on this. Um, it is a complicated topic, and as we heard from Dr. Stowe's, a complicated analysis. I hope that the analyses moving forward can be pared down to those that are absolutely necessary for us to make a decision on a final preferred alternative and to not unnecessarily complicate things um, with analyses that don't provide distinction between the alternatives. Um, and hopefully that the team has gained some perspective based on this first round of analysis that can help them decide which pieces of it make the most sense uh, moving forward. Um, I do think we, we do need to continue on our path uh, to establish hard caps. It is a decision that the council has repeatedly reinforced from our first recommendation to NIMPS to the follow-up uh, after NIMPS was unable to implement the recommendation we had made. Um, and so I don't think we can take it much farther today, um, but I do feel like we've got it on our agenda. We will look forward to the complete analyses and we can take this up again in November. Okay. Thank you, John. Further discussion? Card Brady? 
Yeah, I, I feel like I don't have much to add. Um, I, I uh, also appreciate the work that's gone into this and the complexity complexity of it in our um, uh, varied understanding of where we are right now. I think it will be clearer um, with the summer of analysis and SSC review and um, will set us up for better decision making in November. Um, and uh, I, I also uh, understand uh, the need to, to move forward on this um, as, as hard as this topic is for this council and for California and the fishermen that are involved and everyone involved. This is a, this is a tough issue, but I, I feel like we need to move forward as well. Um, so I don't, I don't have anything more to offer. Uh, I don't think we can pull any analyses out, but trust the team to do the best to streamline this as best they can, um, give us best decision-making set of alternatives and options this fall. Thank you, Gordon. Anyone else? Corey Niles? Uh, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, yeah, and thanks, Karn and John. I, I think I'm largely the same mind. I'll just, I think I'm going to react to a couple of things Gary said. And, um, first, uh, first of the, this analysis, I th as I think came up in question and answer with Dr. Stowe's, there's a question of whether incentives would work or not. And, and, and I hear what Gary's saying, and I think that is the question for the, for the analysis. And yeah, and, I, and I've told Gary this in the hall and said this on the floor before, but in, in sticking up for this fishery, as he put it, I think if the hard caps had been left in place, that's exactly what we would be doing. Um, when they were disapproved, uh, society reacted and um, that wasn't us. So these hard caps are not in our mind a way to, to, to phase this fishery out. They were a way that this council could say that we've done our job in incentivizing to ensure that the fishery is doing everything practical to minimize bycatch, and that's that's what our duty is. But yeah, I think uh, I won't add any more to that. But that's just the view. And um, yeah, Phil Phil said it very nicely. Appreciate Gary's perspectives, but um, that I, I guess we still view what we are trying to we are trying to stick up for this fishery and do our duty as a council. Thank you, Corey. Anyone else? Uh, Ryan Wolf. Yeah, thanks, and I appreciate the discussion and testimony we heard as well. I, I agree with the comments that have been made. I, I did just want to have at least one clarification as it related to workload on the record, so folks were aware of it. Um, while well, I appreciated um, the optimism from Dr. Stowe's, uh, I would note that that really is kind of referencing some more of the coding of the model and, and the write-up and presentation of the methodology that could go to the SSC. And I'm glad there's been some endorsement of that. I think it would be helpful to have some review before we have any council discussion on analyses, but just didn't want to lose the perspective that that's, that's some of the technical work that needs to be done. We also need to then roll that up into an interpretation and to documentation. Um, and there were some legitimate points raised by the enforcement consultants and others that just from an implementation perspective that I think we'll, NIMS will be looking into in between now uh, and the next time that we come back uh, to discuss this as well. Um, again, I'm optimistic that that will still meet the current timeline, but just wanted folks to be aware that those were other components uh, to the workload between now and then. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Okay. With that, Kit. Have we, have we completed our mission here on the FCA? Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I, well, yes, you have. I think um, obviously uh, there's a recognition that there is this need for this uh, additional analysis um, be, before the council can really um, make a decision in terms of the way forward. Um, it's clear uh, that you want to, um, you know, continue with the range of alternatives that you adopted in November, and uh, the team will uh, proceed accordingly. Um, I did hear, um, you know, uh, a comment from uh, John Ugaritz about uh, really 
um, kind of focusing on what needs to be done to get an analysis before the council. I also heard, you know, there is this interest in, are there ways to understand um, what effect the individual vessels uh, closures might be in terms of incentives and uh, Steve Stowe's, Dr. Stowe's suggested some, uh, you know, ways to get at that. I guess I would just say in that regard that, um, at, uh, you know, at the council's pleasure to um, allow the management team to kind of make uh, some dis decisions around prioritizing analysis with the, you know, the overall objective of getting sufficient analysis before you in November for you to make a decision with those um, additional components, uh, um, you know, as a, you know, sort of would be nice to, to have before the council if it can be done, but, um, you know, have, have some scope as, um, you know, the, as the analysis is, is being worked on to, to prioritize so that, uh, you know, it's not an all or nothing situation when we come to November. So I, I guess that's my, my main thought and there um, based on your discussion today. Okay, so uh, with that, I think we're done here on uh, G4. And so with that, I'm gonna pass the gavel to uh, our chairman. And um, there you go, Chair Garlick. All right, thank you, uh, Vice Chair Pettinger. So we'll switch gears back to Groundfish from HMS. We've got some moving around to do, so we'll take a few minutes here to allow folks to settle in. Yeah, if you want to grab some coffee, we'll just take a few minutes here.
All right, why don't we uh, make our way back? Okay, when we were last on this agenda item, we had uh, had all reports and public comment and some queries of uh, council staff. So I'm gonna go to council staff now, Jim and Jesse, and see if they wanna you know, give us a, tell us where we're sitting right now. So then we'll get started with council discussion and some action. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, council members. Right, we, uh, yesterday you had your presentations on the background uh, over the last day or so, there's some, been some uh, good discussions and I think you're ready to move forward uh, into your action, uh, which includes both providing guidance on the range of alternatives as well as uh, any comments or guidance on our, the plans for the analysis that we presented to you. All right, thanks for that. Well, who wants to get us started? <coughs> Um, Brad and then Jessica. Ah. Thank you, Chair Um I thought I'd just clarify some comments that were made in public comment. Um, some maybe historical revision that was going on. Um, that the uh, that the trawl fishery basically has taken um, taken the fish away from the fixed gear sector. Um, and I just will put a little context because a fixed gear sector has daily trip limits, they've open access, they've got tier a tier. Um, when the salmon fishery collapsed in the early 80s, whatever, all those folks went into a fishery, which was uh, which was uh, uh, the work for them. That was the uh, fixed gear um, sable fish fishery. Uh, went from very few boats, at least where I'm at, very few boats fished black cod. And over a period of years, a number of people, a number of, uh, that fleet grew. And um, during limited entry, um, I think it was like almost I mean, a couple hundred permits or something like that was issued to folks where there might have been maybe 50 boats or less the entire coast. So the amount of fish that went to those vessels was diluted. Uh, when limited entry happened, um, about nine or 10% of the quota, I believe, went to, was going to go to um, the Mooney, but there were some. The, the Moonies had a fleet of black cod boats, black cod pot boats back in the day, but they never claimed or applied for their quota. And that fish, my understanding is that fish went into and created the open access uh, black cod fishery, which we have today. Um, so that did not go to the, which obviously didn't go into the tier fishery. Um, also, there was um, the, the tribal allocation was done, I think, in the early 90s, something like that, which came off the top, which took fish from everybody. So um, anyway, just wanted to just kind of clarify that it wasn't, the trawlers didn't necessarily take fish away from the gear, um, the fixed gear sector. Um, and also talk about, um, we don't need to do, to address the gear switching because uh, there's lots of fish, quotas, big gear classes, you know, there's plenty of fish to go around. Um, and from my perspective, um, there is a lot of fish around. And um, unfortunately, I think the stock assessment is basically chasing chasing the tail of what's actually happened in the, in the water. Um, my brother and I have two boats, and we get about we about 3%, I guess, with the AMP pounds in there, um, which comes out to about 200,000 pounds, which is pretty high for someone who has uh, fish, uh, you know, one half percent or 100,000 pounds boats quite a bit for an allocation in this fishery. Um, my boat is out of black cod already this year. Um, it's, I've never seen as much black cod um, in my entire history of fishing the roundfish fishery. And that's probably for 40 years now. Um, I mean, they've had 20,000 pound trips of black cod and that wasn't because they're, they're grinding on black cod. It's just because there's a lot of fish. So it is an issue that, uh, that uh, we're dealing with. Um, and if the um, if the we didn't have COVID, if the market was better with the black cod up and down the coast like it was, it would be it would be uh, 
black cod fishery or the, the trawl, um, bottom trawl fishery would be curtailed greatly. Um, anyway, I just thought I'd just throw that out there as far as that um, I think there's real, a real need here. We need to address it and uh, make it work as best we can and with parameters like we've, we've been talking about. So um, uh, I'll stop there. All right, thank you. Uh, Jessica. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thanks, Brad, for some of that history for me. I appreciate it. Um, my question where I want to kind of get some potential discussion um, is really focused um, towards the analysts. Uh, we heard in public testimony and in the GAP report the request for an analysis of the range of alternatives of zero or five to 29 percent. Um, limits for gear switching. And I just was wondering if I could hear from the analysts to remind us the different analyses that have been done exploring these ranges within the current range of alternatives at this point. Thank you. Mr. Chair, Ms. Watson. Yes, so in terms of previous analyses, when the council uh, was determining, looking at what level of gear switching that um, you know, wanted to consider in defining the alternatives. We looked at 0, 12, 20, and 29%, I believe, if I'm recalling correctly, or 30%, something like that. Um, so we have historically looked at that level of gear switching, including that 0% boundary um, last year um, and that extensive level analysis. In terms of the 5%, that is um, coming from one of the old, the same tech alternative three was based on owning a vessel that had fished the 30,000 pounds in at least three years and owned quota share as of and since the control date, which is currently a qualification of alternative two. And that's the amount of quota share that we, um, about the amount of quota share that we believe is owned by those qualifiers. So that 5% level is, um, part of the analysis and has been analyzed before in terms of what that may look like in the scope of that alternative. Thank you. Further discussion on this agenda item? I'm Krista Svensson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, just want to reflect for a moment on the fact that we have actually found some common ground um, which I wasn't too sure that we would find any. Uh, there are certainly a lot of people that are very entrenched, whether they are in favor of gear switching, uh, in favor of some gear switching, or not in favor of any gear switching. Um, I think that it is remarkable that we had a collective group of people uh, come together to work on putting forward a proposal through the public. Uh, that would be the Ocean Beat proposal. Uh, that was not only fixed gear people. I will admit I sat in a lot of meetings working through people with where they thought common ground was. Um, and that really led to the discussion, including the gap proposal um, that, that we have been talking about and buzzing about for the last 24 to 48 hours. Uh, so I do think that it is important to recognize them. I think um, that it is encouraging. I was very encouraged to hear the processors um, on the, the large scale cutting flats um, say, hey, this, this quota pound idea might be workable. Um, I, I think that it is worth pursuing. But I also think that um, people's willingness to engage as we move forward um, will need to include those people, uh, the people that have brought things forward, the people that are really struggling to continue to bring things forward to this council, and um, just wanting to extend my appreciation for people uh, willing to put themselves out there. That includes um, the Etter family. I appreciated your testimony. Um, and, and the need for sensitivity. And I um, also just want to acknowledge, I appreciate the Oregon delegation. I know Jeff Lackey brought up that quota pounds had come up probably two years ago on the trawl side. And, and I was really glad to hear that and was appreciative. So just wanting to express 
my appreciation for everybody in industry that is willing to kind of sit down at the table around that particular piece um, and and uh, we'll see how the rest of it goes, but hopefully we'll find a path forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Krista. Bill Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll have some additional comments when we get to the action part of our um, deliberations here this afternoon. A um, little bit of, of a, a repeat, I guess, of some of the things that Krista said, but um, I think we started this in 2017. It, it was originally brought out as an issue during the, I think it's called the Santa Rosa uh, workshops where was, we were really beginning to take a first look at how the catch air program was working and identify places where maybe it wasn't as working as well or wasn't working as in, as intended and that uh, set us down this path that we've been on um, and we've had a number of different groups uh, attempt to tackle uh, this issue and bring us something forward and and uh, to one degree or another, um, they've had a uh, measure, uh, a little bit of success and probably more failure than success. And I've been a part of some of those. Um, and um, so, you know, getting to this point, um, really appreciate the, the um, in, in particular, Dr. Seeger and, and Ms. Dorving House and, and the work that they have done and, and we, uh, I think sometimes we blame them for the complexity when it, we're, we're the ones that created the, com the com complex alternatives and then we turned it over to them and asked them to explain it to us. Um, and then we criticized them when we didn't understand how they were explaining what we had created. So, um, and I, it, so I, I just really appreciate the perseverance that they have had and their willingness to work work with us as as we've gone down this path. Um, and I thought it was really notable, uh, and I I think others have have uh, uh, referenced it that uh, there were this uh, list of questions that were produced uh, that needed uh, uh, needed to be answered. And the fact that the GAP got together and brought us a consensus on how to answer those questions was pretty, pretty remarkable and a real credit uh, to how that group uh, works together, even when uh, they have uh, markedly different perspectives on what the appropriate outcome is. So just wanted to acknowledge that work. Um, and I know there's a lot of others, as Krista said, that aren't necessarily a part of our appointed family uh, that have invested a lot of time and effort and brought us ideas along the way as well. So um, that's all I have for right now. I'll have a few other thoughts here in a little bit. Thank you, Phil. Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Phil, thanks for the comments. Krista, good comments as well. I, I like Phil, <laughs> been involved with this since inception, I think, Santa Rosa meetings, the first hints that something was awry, and then the community outreach meetings where it came to light even more, uh, just prior to the initiation of the five-year review, member of the community advisory board originally that kind of tackled with this to begin with and then split out to the SAMTAC. Remember that as both industry before I was on the council and then ended up in a, a council seat representing California. So, you know, and it's been a long road and it doesn't mean that people haven't tried. There are a lot of options. I think we started out with 23, I think, and narrowed it down to two, well, three was status quo and um, council encouraged people to come out of their corners and negotiate and it's taken a long time, but I think we're moving that direction. And the task at hand now is to maybe simplify and I really credit 
Jesse and, and Jim for leading us through the weeds here and trying to get it, get more clarity and more simplicity into this. So I think we heard some good suggestions from the gap and uh, along the way here. I'm, um, I think we're moving in the right direction. I think we're, we're looking toward a, an end. I'm, I, am, I see people working together to try to get there, which is a big change. It's, you know, from where we started took years for people to come out of their corners. And just so, um, once again, I see this is a main component of a five-year review that we identified way, way back when. It's been a long, learn, long journey to get this far. A lot of work left to do, a lot of hard decisions to make, but I see this as an important step in clearing the, getting clarity and getting to a place where we actually can, can see how to work this because as involved as I've been into it, I've been struggling to understand a lot of the complexity. So um, I'll stop there, but I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. I know that we'll have more discussion when it comes time for motions, but let's continue to have some discussion here. Krista? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, um, just in terms of thinking about voting and reflecting uh, the people of, that do the outreach to me um, that are, again, in favor of some level of gear switching, um, some of that is, hey, we want no action. Uh, a lot of it is, hey, we see a need uh, freezing the footprint, and this council has agreed on 29%. A lot of people can live with that. Um, some people would like to see less than that, but but in general, um, they have been willing to kind of come to the table and, and at least consider for the range of alternatives conversion dates. Um, I have kind of put that out as an email to a number of people. I really haven't heard any conversation around where people are today on, on that particular issue, but I think it would be uh, very informative to me um, to hear kind of where people's thoughts are about including that for analysis. I understand uh, people may not want to see a conversion date moving forward, um, but again, I think in terms of the the stakeholders that brought forward the idea at this meeting surrounding quota pounds that we have a lot of industry interest on, it will be very helpful and beneficial for me to hear uh, where people are sitting on that particular topic for analysis purposes only, not saying moving forward. Thank you. All right. Oh, Mr. Smith. I was looking to see if anyone was online. I have to go to my computer to look at that. That's all right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, not only thank the council staff and Jim and Jesse, and I always give Jesse a bad time about getting the crayons out so I can understand it. A lot of complications in this whole deal. And when I came on the council, that was the first thing I got to do was gear switching, but, um, you know, I want to um, throw a real big compliment out to the industries, the different sectors, because no matter who called or who emailed me or who, who you know, tried to convince me on what was good and what was bad and, and educate me, um, they were all very respectful, all all really passionate, but but really respectful and on, on what stance, whatever they're their position was, and and I, and that that's a, a great tribute to a, a great industry that's very important to this uh, our coastal communities up and down the, this west coast, and and uh, um, I, I think that's very admirable, and I and I, I want to thank them, whatever you know, whatever we decide or however we vote, but but I, I think it's worth giving a shout out to the to the industry leaders and the industry that reached out to at least me, and I'm sure they. Others was showed the great respect on on what their what their position and what their passion was. So, um, anyway, I just want to let the other council members know and, and and thank them. And this fishery is important to our our coastal communities. Thank you. All right, thank you, Butch. 
I didn't see any other hands, but I know we'll have discussion when there are motions. So if anyone wants to um, move the ball in that fashion, I'm ready to do that. Mr. Anderson. I would request a 15 minute break before we do that. That's more than appropriate. So we'll take a break here. And um, after the, when we come back, there's any conversation people want to have, and then we'll go to motions. So I have 2.16, we'll come back at 2.30.
All right, we're back. Uh, and uh, we're getting ready for some motions on F5, but let me look around. I don't want to cut off any, any discussion. Um, let's see if I see any hands. All right, I'm not seeing any hands for any further discussion. Let me just go to the computer. No hands there either. So let's um, let's see who wants to go first. Oh, Corey, you have, go ahead. Um, I have a, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a motion if the council is ready. All right. Uh, I move to instruct staff to discontinue work on this action. Let's uh, get that up on the screen so everyone can see that. Give Sandra a chance here. Is that language on the screen accurate and complete? Uh, yes, it is. Thank you. All right. I'll look for a second. Seconded by Krista Svensson. Please speak to your motion. Thank you. Um, before I, I, I get too into this, I want to acknowledge the incredible amount of work that has gone into this. Um, folks spoke earlier on this agenda item about the number of meetings, discussions, the collaboration that has gone into thinking through this. And um, that does not go unnoticed by myself, that there has been a lot of work and a lot of thinking, a lot of energy and resources put into this. Um, also by council staff in developing the <clears throat> various um, analysis that we've had a chance to look at so far. Um, I, in reviewing this action and reviewing the available history and documentation. Um, I have yet to see that any of the options we're looking at really fit the purpose and need here. Um, this council has spoken on a number of agenda items about the need for flexibility in our fisheries. Um, this is especially so given climate change, other environmental impacts, as well as things like COVID. Flexibility is very important for all of our fisheries to be able to adapt and move. That was an initial part of this program, and I think that that part of the program is working. I want to support the ability for new entrants into our fisheries. By limiting this, we are limiting the ability of allowing new entrants into the fishery. And I, as a priority for me, We've also heard under under agenda items about the importance for our fisheries or portfolio fishing. We heard that from our public testimony, the importance of being able to move between fisheries to be able to trade and keep that flexibility for an individual. Also thinking about the investments that were made at the onset of this program. People made different sorts of investments at that time, substantial amounts of money and planning for their business with the understanding that this was how it was going to be moving forward. Part of that decision that the council made then and that folks subsequently made was that the market was going to have to play out, that that was part of this. And that's what's happened. I want to thank Mr. Niles for bringing up National Standard 4 and also for WDFW providing an excellent report in advance of this meeting. I appreciate what he spoke to earlier about the benefits outweighing the costs, or it's a bit of a shorthand, but that's what I take from it. Uh, right now, I see no or very little evidence that the benefits of any of the existing options will provide benefits that outweigh the status quo. Finally, I'll mention the conservation benefits, being able to catch fish with different types of gear types can have conservation benefits. We also see different economic benefits coming from fixed gear sable fish. So I am going to stop there. Thanks very much.
All right, thank you for that, Corey. I'd like to ask uh, no general counsel just to ensure that this motion falls within the scope of this agenda item. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, I believe that because the um, action that was noticed was consideration of a range of alternatives and the council is not taking uh, either PPA or fi final action that this would be acceptable to instruct staff to discontinue work. Okay, um, questions for maker of the motion. Jessica Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. Ridings. Uh, can you please speak to why you're proposing to discontinue work on this action before the analysis is completed, which contains a no action alternative? Uh, thank you, Jessica. Um, I There's been a tremendous amount of energy put into this, and it was made clear when Jesse and Jim were talking yesterday about what would be needed to continue analysis on this, that it would take a tremendous amount of effort um, through the summer to be able to continue working on this. Um, we know that there are many things that need attention, and I think that that attention is worth spending in other places. Further questions for the maker of the motion uh, or discussion on the motion? Krista Svensson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm going to lend support for Corey on this particular motion, um, partially because the reasons that she outlined were all of the reasons that I have expressed or stakeholders have expressed in terms of concern. Um, and I believe the state of California has also outlined many of those concerns. But the other reason that I am going to support Corey on her motion is the fact that the council has changed since we implemented the SAMTAC. And we keep hearing or the gap or Santa Rosa, and we continue to hear those of us that were not eligible because we were not seated on the council about all of the history. And it seems often, I guess I will phrase it, that our voices are not being heard. And perhaps this is what it's going to take for people to become a bit more inclusive in terms of what their response is when any of us at the table that haven't been an appointee to SAMTAC or any other group who have expressed interest, who are extremely concerned about having a viable, vibrant and valuable trawl fishery, um, you know, that we have the ability to express what it is that, that we're concerned about. And uh, for those reasons, Corey, I, I appreciate you bringing forward this motion and, and I will be speak, excuse me, uh, supportive of it. Thank you. Corey Niles. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, and thanks, Corey. I, I certainly understand the perspective um, you're bringing forward and, and know others have shared the, this view um, from your state. Um, and, and respecting what, what Krista um, put forth there uh, and, and referenced the WDW report. And I, yes, some of us have been involved in this longer than others. Um, what I would, what, you know, that WDFW report was, you know, advance of the meeting was a long, it, it was the, the moments before the meeting, I put it out there, you know, maybe not articulating words as, as well as possible, but going back to what, to September, um, what this council was trying to do was take the hard work of the SAMTAC, which I'm, I'm, I didn't make every meeting, but I was paying attention to the analysis and I, I, every point of view that I've heard expressed at this meeting was thoughtfully considered by the folks on the SAMTAC. Um, and I'm gonna say that this meeting was pretty, um, I understand the value to the, to the uh, analysts in, in getting the, in making into us next steps at making analysis more streamlined. But it struck me, we spent 99% of the time not talking about the policy issues um, we, as we, in, as, as we had in, um, public comment, our policy issues line up, like, should we limit gear switching? 
if yes, should we use a quota based approach or a permit based approach? And then from down, taking the, you know, down the line from those, we have some questions to answer. We didn't talk about that at all at this meeting. We talked about some, some details that are going to help streamline that at the next steps. So if fully, um, Yes, respecting those are willing to stop now, but I think the in the question, those putting forward certain ideas who have been clear about no action, um, I, we, we understand where why people prefer no action, why people prefer action. I agree at this point, it's an uncertain proposition of whether the benefits are going to outweigh the costs. When Brad spoke at the beginning, going back to history, um, at, yeah, the we intend certain things and then other things happen. And that's part of the WHF report that I was getting at is, you know, I'm personally surprised at how much gear switching happened. But at this point, it's it's almost beside the point. In order to correct it, there has to be some showing that the benefits of doing that are gonna outweigh the costs. And going back to what I was trying to, that, and that's where we, in September, that's why we propose these two alternatives because it frames up that question and the analysis in a way that's gonna let us have the discussion in the in at the highest level this council does um i really uh, expressed the um i really appreciated the expression of it by um names are escaping me but but the attorney on, on public testimony yesterday how how he took on a different view of of the benefits and costs and i think as jessica's question um got to we're just we're we're just about to get some more information not just because it's only doing this for 15 years that I think November is just around the corner, but um, there, there's more that we haven't framed up the debate fully yet, and that's going to happen. And and I, I'm going to see a really, hopefully, um, constructive back and forth based on the best available information on whether the benefits of acting do outweigh the disadvantages where we're, we are causing people. So, yeah, I really appreciate um, the you the putting those thoughts out here, but it would be pr premature to, to support this at this time. Phil Anderson, oh wait, pardon me, Marcy went and then Phil Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Corey, for the motion. Um, I have many of the same thoughts that um, I've had on this topic <laughs> for a good long while, um, but I will say that um, I've done a lot of listening this meeting and we had some very good discussion in our delegation on the work that um, folks have been doing over the past few months to try to uh, reach agreement and come up with something that's streamlined and clear and understandable. Um, and those efforts are significant and much appreciated. Um, one big concern that I've had that really became clear with the list of questions posed by Jim and Jesse, um, it isn't even possible right now for everyone, all the potentially affected individuals to effectively evaluate uh, what the benefits or the consequences of this action might be to them. Um, because there were so many unanswered questions and what ifs and how do we treat this and, and, and that's not a comfortable place to be. And given where we are right now, after so many years, if we don't have a little more certainty and clarity than that, you just have to take a step back and question what are we doing and does it make sense? And are we going to get on a clear pathway forward from here? If the alternatives and the iterations of alternatives and the streamlinings and each of the change-ups that happens with the alternatives um, continues to just create a different suite of winners and losers, just each a little bit differently, um, I'm not sure that that really is logically tied to our purported goal here. Um, Bob Edder's testimony is weighing on me very heavily. Um, it just doesn't seem to make sense to me that we would propose a plan that would require his operation 
to purchase or lease quota pounds just to do what he can currently do with his own shares. When the program was implemented, the council, NIMFs, partners, everyone was quick to point out both the conservation benefits of the program that allowed conversion to non-trial gear, and also the financial benefits that may come from delivering sable fish taken with non-trial gear at a higher price. Um, Bob and um, others believed in the dream that we portrayed with this program, and they paid to acquire trawl permits and associated quota that would come with it. Bob and others uh, diversified the IQ sector when they entered into it. There was a willing buyer and a willing seller. We've seen folks um, follow their own unique business plans with the flexibility that the program affords them. Um, We've heard from many of them this week, uh, Paul Quayla, Kevin Dunn, Jeff Lackey, Travis Hunter, they all have their own unique business plan and they've all adapted and changed to fit their own unique set of circumstances. That's what we said we wanted, a fleet that could adapt and respond to local prevailing circumstances. I appreciate Lori Steele's remarks to review the presentation she provided the council in September. I did that. Um, she identified a number of important goals, a goal of year round processing, a goal of year round employment opportunities for processors. Um, that year round nature of processing um, would create uh, infrastructure stability, which would also lend itself to more opportunities in other fisheries. I am 100% behind those goals, but it is difficult, really difficult, to see any concrete proof or even any convincing information or evidence that limiting gear switching will help achieve those goals. And as time passes on this agenda item, been a lot of time, there appears to be less and less evidence that sable fish is limiting the trawler's ability to access Dover sole or other flatfish. And yet there seems to be more and more evidence that the costs are likely to mount if we continue. If the need was so strong to limit gear switching, why haven't we been considering the quickest, easiest, cheapest, and least harmful way to do that, which would be a simple closure of the use or, or uh, of the gear of trawl of non trawl gear once 29% of the northern sablefish quota is taken uh, with fixed gear in a year. Uh, I feel it's really time to deeply consider Jim Seeger's admonishment to us at the beginning of this agenda item that the challenge here is to achieve the bulk of this action before we commence the next trawl rationalization program review. Um, too many unanswered questions remain, including many identified on Jim and Jesse's list. Um, there doesn't appear to be a clear or clean pathway forward. And I continue to believe the right decision is no action. Just want to think back. I've, I've offered testimony on this um, a number of times. Um, but it just seems to me that um, we need to remember that you um, don't create, um, it's, it's hard to foresee building up your own business by disadvantaging other businesses that might be your competitors. Um, I want nothing more to see the fleet and our processing capacity succeed and grow. Um, cost. I think we've talked about cost a number of times and we've heard concerns with cost recovery. And if there's enough money in the cost recovery dollars to cover this program along with other programs and needs that we see uh, for this uh, 
limited entry sector. Um, litigation, I'm concerned that we haven't given adequate thought to the prospect of litigation. Um, I'm still concerned that um, circumstances will change with stock status. We're doing a petroleum assessment this next cycle. What if? What if Dover Sole or Petroli becomes overfished and we've assigned Sablefish shares to only being taken with trawl gear? Why wouldn't we want trawlers to be able to use or lease out potentially all of that Sablefish share for use with fixed gear in order to continue to harvest what is usually one of our most valuable West Coast stocks? Uh, I think I'll end there, but um, again, I uh, continue to support the no action alternative. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Phil? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wasn't expecting to debate whether we were going to continue our work on gear switching or, or not at this meeting. But uh, here we are. Um, this issue was, as I mentioned in my prior comments, brought to us by industry. It wasn't one that the managers came up with. wasn't the one wasn't one that National Marine Fisheries came up with. It industry brought this to our attention as a problem. And I will grant you that not everyone in the industry thought it was a problem. But, but the um, identification of the problem was brought forward by the trawl fishery. And let us remember that we are talking about the trawl fishery here. And we are talking about the allocation that we have made between fixed gear and the trawl fishery. We already did that. We, we, in fact, we've done it a couple times. So that's what we're talking about. Um, I'm just going to, to say this. What concerns me the most about this motion is that it completely, in my view, completely undermines our public process and the expectation that the public had of us at this meeting relative to this issue. No, we heard no, we virtually heard no one comment about whether or not to pursue the analysis um, because that wasn't the question before us. And while I respect you know, a general counsel's legal opinion that this is, this action, this motion is within the scope of the agenda item. I don't think it's within the scope of what the public thought or what I thought. So we have a couple of different, we have, we have had one specific opportunity to decide whether or not we were going to pursue this issue. And that was agendized, I believe, in June of 2020, when the SAMTAC brought their final report to this council. One of the questions that was we considered and that was on it was on the agenda was whether or not we were going to pursue this issue any further. And this council, with the members that were present at that day decided to pursue, to continue pursuing, looking at this issue, further analyzing options, further refining options. So we made that, in my view, we made that decision. And this motion backtracks on that commitment that this council made at that time. We, as I think Jessica, pointed out, our next opportunity will be in September when we have an opportunity to 
select a PPA. Among those alternatives, of course, is status quo. And I'm, I think it would be perfectly reasonable that if we picked status quo in September, that a follow-up motion would be to instruct staff to discontinue work on this action. But this is not the time to consider this, in my view. Um, and I think it would cast a big shadow on this council in a very negative way among all of the people who have contributed to our thinking about this issue. So, thanks. Thank you, Phil. Further discussion on the motion? Pete Hassemer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it's given me a little time to reflect here on what we're doing. I was trying to gather some thoughts for a general discussion earlier, what I was thinking on this. Um, I, I understand the rationale behind the motion, um, the explanation of the need for it. Um, unfortunately, and, and with all due respect, um, I, I will not be supporting the motion. Um, my thinking on this topic over the last few days is as we've engaged in it and in my preparation for this meeting has been to focus very hard on the purpose and need and also the set of principles that the SAMTAC was working under and looking at that purpose in need of where we're trying to go to, um, um, to, to make sure that gear switching is not impeding attainment in the trawl fishery while considering impacts on current operations. I, I applaud the analysts for what they gave us and the questions they brought before us. And I think that helped to um, focus my vision on where we want to be with this, what we're trying to achieve, and is it consistent with that purpose and need? Will it provide information to us that allows us to make a decision and select a pathway? Um, within those alternatives, there is still the no action, and uh, at some point, um, I am not committing to any one alternative over the other. But again, as I look through this, yesterday I spent some time looking through the groundfish scorecard on the APEX report for 2021. And there were a lot of fish left in the ocean that could have been harvested in a trawl fishery um, and, and in some other fisheries. But I looked at that and I remember from very early in our SAMTAC proceedings, the discussion about the trawl fishery is the mechanism or the infrastructure for getting a lot of harvesting a lot of fish in a sustainable manner and putting them into the markets and and they have constraints or have not been able to achieve that in recent years. At the same time, I see great value in having some gear switching opportunity in there. It, it brings value to the fishery. And so the, the package we have, I think is getting very close to finding this intersection between considering the impacts on current operations and investments, but finding a way to limit gear switching to some level that allows the trawl fishery to rebuild, gives them the opportunity to rebuild those markets. So at this point in time, um, I'm interested in further analysis and you know, possibly some refinement of these alternatives to make sure they're focused on achieving what we've 
laid out in the purpose and need. And I, I am convinced at this point in time that there is something positive in there that will help us to meet that purpose and need and provide some opportunity to the, to the trawl fishery to um, rebuild its markets. Um, there are questions about, is, is this the right time to do it? I don't know if you know the response is, it's never the right time or it's always the right time. I think because of the, the nature, the magnitude of the issue, how it's been brought forward, we need to proceed with action on that. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. Further discussion on the motion, Brad, uh, Brad Pettinger, and then we'll come back to Corey Ridings. Yeah, thank you, Chair Grolnick. Um, yeah, I wasn't expecting this. I'm disappointed that it's come up at this point. People talk about investments, they want to protect their investments. I think if you put a spreadsheet and you put, talk about investments in the trawl fleet and the processors that support it, the investments we're talking about are drop in the bucket. We're going through this process, and we're, part of the problem, no, not part of the problem, the, one of the reasons we're, this is going so slow and so messy is because we're concerned about those investments. And I hear worst case scenarios thrown out there is what we're gonna do. We haven't done anything yet. I saw the gap statement and people, people interpreted as far as that option three. I listened to Bob talk. Never in my wildest dreams would I have went where he was, the straw man he was thrown out there to be. This fishery has been through hell the last 20 years. You know, we've lost almost all our processing capacity. I mean, we're just barely hanging on. And do you think people are going to invest in processing if you're going to rip, if you're going to, just to stop right now? Because eventually, as people retire, people die, they, the family sells off the quota share. Who do you think is going to buy it if you can gear switch it? It's going to go to the fixed gear. I mean, why have sectors? I mean, <laughs> let's open the trawl, let's open the sectors for whiting. You know what it's going to go to? All of it to the CPs because they're the most efficient and they make the most money off it. Is that what we're here for? We have an obligation to our coast communities and the people depend on that to make a wise decision. And we're getting there. We're just not there yet. So I'm gonna vote no on this and I hope everybody else does too. And I'll stop there. All right, thank you, Brad. Uh, Corey Ridings. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks for all the comments on this. Um, I want to specifically address something Phil said, and that was that this potentially undermines the public process. And I wanted to be very clear that that is not my intent with this motion, that the public process or casting a negative shadow on the council is not at all my intent or how, how I see this. Um, we heard from multiple members of the public that no action is preferred or that they were agnostic about it. Um, so in, in, that is where this came from. Um, I just wanted to throw that out and also thank Brad for his comments. Leave it at that. Bush Smith. Uh, thank you, Ms. Ratings. And, um, and, and this is, you know, no dis disrespect to the maker of the motion or who seconded it, not at all. Um, I, I think this motion could be very warranted in September after we see the analysis. Um, but I do think that we do owe our constituents, the public, at least to see those analysis so we can make a qualified decision on um, 
on all the work that's been done to this point. I do not have the history in this um, uh, process, this particular process, gear switching. Um, but I've come to learn there's issues that um, need to be or tried to be fixed. Now, whether whatever we choose to move forward for analysis does that or not, um, I, I still think that we we owe it to everyone in the process to, to see wh where it's at and, and before we make a decision. So, um, I, you know, I, I think this motion, in my opinion, like I said, no disrespect is just three months premature. Um, and and uh, I respect both of you, but I, I will have to not, I, I cannot support the motion at this time. You know, maybe three months from now, it'll be a, be a yes. So anyway, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And All right, Mr. thank you very much, Butch Smith. Uh, Jessica Watson, followed by Krista Fenson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I wanna echo some of my fellow council members' thoughts with no disrespect to the makers of the motion and the second. But what I heard from the GAP report and public testimony, testimony was really a need for more information for people to decide where they fall out within these alternatives, no action being one of those. Um, so like Mr. Niles set, stated previously, I feel this is premature at this time and I will be wanting to look closer and considering all of the information that comes out of the analysis before um, making a decision. So. Respectfully, I will not be supporting this motion. Thank you. Uh, Krista Svensson. Yeah, no, thank you, Mr. Chair. I um, am appreciative of everybody's comments around the table. Um, and I, like Corey, am meaning absolutely no disrespect in supporting her in making this motion, uh, nor is my intent to circumvent the public um, or, or stop the process, but I do think that we needed to have this conversation. Um, and I do think that it is important that as we move forward, which I fully expect that we will be outvoted, um, I do think that it is important that we continue to bring those voices forward. Uh, I mentioned it earlier with regard to hearing about quota pounds and industry getting behind that. Uh, I think that that is important. And I think that however this vote turns out, um, I am definitely keeping an open mind in terms of what that range of analysis may be. Um, but I do, I do think that it is important that this motion came forward today so that we could have a conversation and all really get on the same place as opposed to thinking we knew where each other were. Further discussion? on the motion. Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A lot of what I would say has been said, but I will say more. Um, we have been down this path for a while, and I thought we were really making some progress here. This is a surprise, a real surprise, didn't expect it. However, being a California resident for my entire life, California used to have a vibrant trawl fishery before the disaster, before the stock crash. All our infrastructure nearly is gone. Fish are there. We've done an excellent job of rebuilding the fish. There are fish in California. I'm a member of the Monterey Bay Fisheries Trust. Was, our goal was to anchor some of this fish so it doesn't just leave. Problem is not the fish, the problem is the infrastructure. I thought we were on the right path. We we're moving, making progress toward rebuilding that on our coast. California used to, all the reports catch half of the trawl fish on the entire coast. It's just a mere shadow of that now. We've heard from our processors far and wide that round fish is what makes, what makes the wheel turn. It's what keeps the plants in business. It's why they can buy sable fish. That's why they can buy, you know, they can buy crab and they can buy shrimp and they can buy salmon. It's because you've got the ground, the, the ground fish to support those plants and those people in those communities. 
I thought we were on the path to that. COVID came, knocked us back. But there's a, there's interest in this fishery. I respect Mr. Anderson and Mr. Pettinger's comments about this is a trawl fishery. We, my goal is always has been to re rebuild our trawl fishery in this sector. Um, we had comments that gear switching was done for conservation issues. That's partially true, but I was back there during the tick committee. That's not what, that was not the impetus of this. The impetus was at the time Dover was crashing. Dover was going on the downhill trajectory. And I remember Tommy Ancona and uh, what's his name? Marion Larkin talking about, we got to get this fish out of the water. We're going to be left with this quota sitting in the water if we can't figure another way to get it out. Gear switching was in intended for trawlers. I had no idea, and I don't know anybody who did, and I was participating, that ever conceived of a, a sector switcher doing this. It's a big, it was the one of the top things in the first five-year review. And to stop this now before, before we see the end of the tunnel, that we've done a lot of work on this. And we heard a lot of testimony from people for it and against it that wanted to hear clarity on these issues that we were here at this meeting to, to, to bring clarity to, to answer questions, not to decide on whether the program is valid or not. That's the future. That's the next steps. I am, uh, I can't support this at all. I think it's really premature. I think we do a disservice to the thousands of hours that our industry and our, our council and our, our staff has put into trying to come to the, get, come to grips with this and figure a way through this. I think we were there as far as clear, getting clarity to where we can make those decisions in the end. But to stop now, I, I, can't, I can't even remotely support that. And no, no disrespect, but I can't remotely su support that. I just, and I'll be voting no on that. Thank you. All right, thank you, Bob. Is there any further discussion on the motion? Not seeing any hands, I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 The no's have it. Does anyone demand a roll call vote? I'm uh, abstaining. Oh, who's abstaining? Oh, an emphasis Achilles abstaining. And was there a request for a roll call vote? Mayor? Pardon? Oh, we do a roll call to capture the no's. So please proceed. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and council members. Um, I'm reading from voting sheet one, agenda item F5, motion made by Corey Ridings and seconded by Krista Svensson. Um, Butch Smith? No. Bill Anderson? No. Virgil Moore? No. Keely Kent? Abstain. Brad Pettinger? No. Jessica Watson? No. Corey Writings? Yes. Pete Hassemer? No. Joe Oatman? No. Marcy Aremko? Yes. Corey Niles? No. Krista Spenson? Yes. Bob Dooley? No. Mark Gorelnik? Does not vote as chair. That's right. Uh, motion fails. All right, thank you. So we are proceeding uh, with this agenda item per um, the, per the description in the agenda. 
And let's see if there is uh, further emo another motion to get us uh, moving forward. Phil Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I do have a motion to offer, and I believe that Sandra has it. And therefore, I believe it will show up on the screen very soon. Like magic. Yes. I move that the council advance the consideration of limiting gear switching in the limited entry trawl fishery and confirm the following guidance and intent relative to the questions raised in F5 attachment three, specific to alternative one, which is represented in F5 attachment two, and add a new alternative as described below. Alternative one, gear specific quota share guidance. And I'm walking through these in uh, with uh, referencing the questions that were asked of us by staff. One, with respect to classifying quota share owners as gear switching participants, what degree of linkage between quota share account owners and vessel owners should be required? Where linkages exist, how much of the quota share in the account should be converted based on that linkage? Guidance is focus on using the individual approach while maintaining the flexibility to use the collective approach depending on the outcome of the analysis. Two, on what date should the linkage between a quota share account and vessel owner be evaluated? The guidance is use the control date. Three, if a collective approach is taken and linkages are evaluated based on some date in the past, e.g., for example, the control date, what happens if a group splits up prior to implementation? Guidance, only the partner that has had a history of owning a gear switching vessel would retain that status. Four, fourth question, how might the individual collective approach and linkage date requirements be applied with respect to the individual quota participant option that requires bottom trawl landings within two years prior to implementation? And if a collective approach is taken, how would the conversion caps be applied if an overship group breaks up prior to implementation? Guidance is use the individual approach. And if that approach were used, then the other questions uh, would not be needed to be addressed. Five. If a collective approach is taken, how would the conversion caps be applied if an ownership group breaks up prior to implementation? Guidance, if a collective approach is taken and the group breaks up prior to implementation, have a cap proportional to their share of ownership of quota share as of the control date. Sixth question, under the collective approach, how is quota share owned outside the ownership group treated? Guidance, under the collective approach, the quota share owned outside the group would not qualify for group classification status. Question seven, application of criteria to trusts, non-governmental organizations, and governments. Guidance, apply the same as if, as they would be applied to all other quota share owners. Question eight, application of formulas relying on share of ownership when ownership shares on record do not add to 100%. Guidance, calculate based on reported percent of ownership. Question nine, modification of quota share control on annual vessel quota pound limits to take into account the division of Northern Sablefish allocation into two pools. Guidance, 
apply existing accumulation limits only at the aggregate northern sablefish level. Note, which is in other words, maintain the aggregate northern sablefish quota control limit, the 3%, and quota pound use limit, 4.5%, as recommended by the GAP and GMT, and do not apply adjustments to convert those into gear-specific limits. On to the new alternative. Include as a new alternative a variation on alternative one in which the resulting distribution of trawl only and any gear quota is done at the annual quota pound issuance step rather than permanently converting quota share. All other provisions of alternative one would remain the same. Last, staff discretion. In addition to this guidance, the intent is to provide council staff with the leeway to modify the language of the alternatives to reflect the intent stated. That completes my motion. Thank you very much for the motion. Is the language on the screen accurate and complete? Yes, it is. I'll look for a second, seconded by Bob Dooley. Please speak to your motion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think we recognize uh, and and we've certainly been encouraged by our staff that of the importance of making progress at this meeting. And I believe providing the guidance with respect to the questions that were posed is an important step to making that pro to achieving that progress. There's an important, it's important uh, to provide guidance that is clear and addresses the concerns of our analysts uh, that they have requested of us. I believe it would be a disservice to them if we did anything uh, uh, that was contrary to that request. We need to control our insatiable appetite for complicating or adding to what we have without a strong justification. We need to keep in the forefront of our mind the purpose and need statement and ensure that refinements are consistent and address the problems identified in that statement. I just wanted to call your attention to um, a couple of expert excerpts out of the purpose and need statement. First is participants engaging in gear switching and using northern sable fish quota that might otherwise be used in trawl gears. This may lead to uncertainty in trawl access to sable fish, thereby affecting the development of markets and infrastructure. The other the other excerpt is that I wanted to make note of is that the purpose of this action would be to keep northern sablefish gear switching from impeding the attainment of northern IFQ allocations with trawl gear while considering impacts on current operations and investments. Those two pieces in my mind are very consistent with the principles that were developed within the SAMTAC process and that were provided to this council. And I think those two excerpts uh, speak to the reason uh, that it's important for us to fully analyze this issue uh, before making a determination on whether uh, limiting gear switching or the use of non-trawl gear to harvest trawl sable fish is warranted. I'll try to quickly just run through these points. Um, and I, I would note that the responses to these questions that were posed that are, that are suggested or recommended in the, mo in the motion are consistent with those that were recommended to us by the GAP uh, and also are consistent with recommendations that came out of the GMT. Uh, the first one, um, I know we were probably looking for a, a one or the other on this uh, would be ideal. 
uh, and that is between the individual and the collective approach. I think during the discussion, uh, both at the GAP meeting and, and in listening to testimony here and, and listening to the GAP's report, uh, there's still some um, clarity that needs to be um, uh, determined relative to how the current structure of various ownerships uh, would be treated as if, if we went solely with the individual versus the collective. So the idea here is that the, the, the I, I guess if there's a, um, um, that the individual is the preferred approach if it makes sense, but we wanna make sure that we fully uh, take a look at the collective approach so that we don't inadvertently disadvantage a business um, organization uh, in a manner that we didn't intend. On the second question, the use of the control date, um, of course we've used control dates in the past. I do recall in developing the limited entry uh, program um, that um, it took a long time to develop. I think the control date was back in 2004, if I remember right, or something like that. And we didn't take our action until 2011, and that was in part uh, the basis for a lawsuit that we prevailed on. Uh, but I do think, you know, we need, I believe that if we're going to set a control date, uh, and, and which, which thereby just lets people know that um, things like catch history that are accumulated after the control date uh, uh, may not be considered, as in they might not be considered when developing the program. Um, and so I, I do think it's important to stick with the control date. On the third one, it's, it's just trying to be fair here in terms of, of ensuring that the person who brought that catch, that catch history uh, into a partnership is the one uh, that retains it if, if the partnership uh, dissolves. Um, four and five are kind of in, in a way a little bit similar, but number four, as I mentioned, use, using the individual approach would, would result in those other questions which are specific to the collective approach don't need to be answered. Um, you know, I, I think this, the idea of a pro rata, pro rata approach uh, in if that were to happen under the collective approach uh, would likely be the way we would go. But um, again, this is consistent with the gap. And, and so I chose to just use the individual approach here. Number five um, was spe a specific question relative to the collective approach, and and uh, which is why I think the the gap provided an answer, at least one of the reasons, and and uh, that is reflected here. And again, it uses that idea of being proportional to um, that the cap is proportional to their share of the ownership of a quota, of quota share as of the control date. Uh, the the sex the, excuse me the sixth one under the collective approach how is quota share owned outside the ownership group and just one wanted to be clear about that that under the collective approach the quota share owned outside the group would not qualify for the group classification status. Number seven just speaks to those other types of, of, of entities that may own quota share and that we would treat them uh, the same as we do uh, the other types of entities. Um, the eighth one was a little bit confusing to me, so I had to get an explan explanation from our analysts, and apparently there are situations where if you uh, have less than 2%, um, that, uh, that add, and they don't apply, therefore there's some instances where you don't, it doesn't add up to 100%. Um, and 
And then the last question there, the modification of quota share control and annual vessel quota pounds uh, is to take into account, how that is to take into account the division into the two pools and, and just want to make sure that we're uh, in this, we're being clear that we're maintaining the current uh, uh, limits, quota share limits and use limits. Now, with respect to the new alternative, several of my colleagues around the table um, have suggested that um, we consider an alternative that matches up with the balance of what's in alternative one uh, that would use uh, quota pounds rather than converting the quota shares. Um, I was convinced by their arguments that that would be a good thing for us to look at. Uh, I did uh, confer with the analysts to see whether this was a inordinate burden. I think they said no. Uh, I'll let them speak for themselves, but if they had said yes, I probably would not have included it. But I think, um, and there are others around the table that can speak more eloquently uh, to the to their belief that there would be advantages uh, in doing this at the quota pound level, um, and we can hear from them. And then finally, just under the staff discretion, um, just wanted to make sure that we were we were clear in giving them that uh, flexibility. I know they will use that flexibility wisely. They won't be looking to change our intent, uh, but instead if there is certain language in the alternatives that need, uh, might be modified a bit to ensure that it reflects our intent, that they be free to do that. And I would also expect that if they did that, they would point those places out when we get the results of the analysis in September. So, Mr. Chairman, that completes uh, my um, rationale for offering this motion to the council. All right, thank you very much for the motion. Let's see if there are any questions for the maker of the motion. And if there are no questions, let's see if there uh, is any discussion on the motion. Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Phil, for such a clear and concise motion. I agree with every, every word of it. I think you've captured and answered all the questions that staff needs to, uh, on this end of it anyhow, alternative one to, uh, to continue their work. And I think that was a very important component of this. As to the new alternative, I'm really happy that that was included. And as you said, it, I think it was vetted very well with staff, and I have the same understanding as as you that it, it's uh, not reinventing a wheel or anything. It should it should fit in there and shouldn't cause a lot of extra extra work. As far as uh, my view on that, I think it it could actually streamline it better. We could get to actually quota pounds rather than quota share in May. Uh, eliminate a lot of the analysis that uh, or the a lot of who owns what because it'll be in quota pounds and that seemed to be a, a way to a way to make this process a little uh, more streamlined a little a little more clear for people to understand and uh, I think it also uh, by breaking it out of the out of the quota share category, it, it makes it non non uh, sellable and and out of the at least it puts it keeps it in the lease part of it rather than as an asset and I think that's important because it could subvert wherever we end up at the end if we do establish uh, establish a, a limit on this so um, I'm pleased that that's there and I'm glad that we made those uh, those determinations and, and I'm glad, really more pleased that you included it in your motion because I wouldn't have wanted to make it separately. So I appreciate that. Uh, staff direction, I think that uh, that's, 
I trust the staff that that they will stay in the, you know in the in the in the uh, spirit of what's you know, offered here. But we you know there's always something to to make decisions about and to and to and to leave that to their discretion. It, to a certain extent, is is good. So I will be supporting this motion, and I thanks thank you for it. All right, thank you, Bob. Any further discussion on this motion? Krista Svensson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Phil, for the motion. I am very appreciative of the thought, um, the effort, and uh, all of the consideration that you put into it. Um, I'm extremely appreciative of the additional alternative that you've put in to focus on quota pounds. Um, and I, I am appreciative of the approach that the council is taking in moving forward. That being said, uh, I will be voting no um, on this motion and all other alternatives. Um, a large part of that is through the conversation this week, and, and I am so appreciative of industry coming together uh, on items that they can come together on. Um, but I mentioned earlier in, in this afternoon's conversation, I really needed some clarity around uh, conversion dates. And the response was silence. We had a 15 minute break after that. And the only person that talked to me about gear switching was Ms. Riding, which I will also say influenced my decision to support her motion. I think it is really important um, as we move forward to fold all of these items in. Uh, but the fact that we have a large group of stakeholders that brought forward a proposal where parts and pieces have been picked up, but we're not willing to consider, even including in the analysis, conversion dates from the read of the room and the people that I've spoken to in the margins, I think is unfortunate. Um, and that is the reason that I will be voting no. Um, part and parcel because it took a lot to convince most of those stakeholders to find a compromise position um, and a lot of that hinged around that conversion date so i i appreciate the thought uh, again i'm very supportive of quota pounds the majority of people that i've spoken to are supportive of uh, 29 percent as livable i'm not saying that's their favorite position um, and I think that all of them are open to talking in the future um, and, and really trying to find a path forward. But we've heard pretty consistently from a number of those members throughout this process this week that their preference is no action. Um, and my experience this week uh, indicates to me that no action for today is, is the right decision in representing them. So thank you. Thank you, Krista, for the discussion on the motion. Corey. Thank, thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Phil, for the, for the excellent motion. Just a couple of quick thoughts uh, on, on Krista's um, comments, I guess, so I have to respectfully disagree that the conversion date wasn't, wasn't thoroughly considered. Um, but I, I, I don't need to talk much about that. Um, on this new alternative, I think this is not the way I would go, but I'm, I would recognize that in September we did switch to the quota share um, perspective without much um, focus on, on the difference between the way the SAMTAC was considering it on the quota pounds. Um, so I fully understand why people are um, still of differences in views, but I, Bob, I don't we don't need to get into this now, but I, I, I will be surprised if there's any more simplicity in tracking ownership by doing this. I think the only difference that we'll end up seeing is the one that Brad has mentioned a couple times now in terms of it will affect the long-term investment or the ability of gear switchers that hold quota share to perhaps sell it. And so I'm, yeah, I'm again, wanting to see this analysis, but I don't know why a fixed gear business would support that as, as less disruptive but yeah, point main point is 
I understand why that was an area that wasn't wasn't analyzed thoroughly. Um, excuse me. And yeah, I think uh, on those questions on the individual versus collective approach, what I take most comfort in is that it looks at both ways. I don't think there was strong understanding at, among the council uh, discussions on the difference, but so we should be looking at two. There's one small part that I'm a little nervous for on the gap favoring um, if a partnership breaks up um, the, the person with the history will be recognized but the other partner won't and I won't get into too much why but we just don't really know what into, into that partnership but the bottom line is I think if that comes out as being unfair and we're really only talking about a period of time between now and whenever this conversion would happen the implementation initial allocation would happen so I have, I have no I have no doubt that the analysts, if they see some issues about fairness, will will raise it at the next step. So um, backing up to the beginning, I thank you, Phil, for putting all those thoughts together. Um, I, I believe this keeps us on 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 track. Oh, one last thought. I'm still I was hearing the thoughts about um, in public testimony about looking at a five percent and a twenty nine percent. I'm I'm still not. Um, while while 29% might be a fine overall target, I'm not positive that that's the right amount of quota share that you would create because some of it's going to definitely be trawled no matter what. So anyway, I, I did hear that 5%. I think that is outside of the regional reasonable range of alternatives at this point from the NEPA perspective. It's beyond the purpose and need of of disrupting those who invested in quota share to, to fish it with fixed gear. That said, I think we're going to have a lot better information and, and Phil and Butch, the one disagreement I'll have with you both is I, they're coming back in November, not September. So um, in November, we will uh, we'll have more information to see to see uh, really what that means to folks and, and what's fair and equal. But going on longer here than I meant to really thank you, Phil, for putting this together. And, and yeah, thanks to the analysts. Um, but I think you got a lot more work ahead, just maybe less than before we clarified this. Thank you. All right, thank you, Corey. Is there any further discussion? Pete Hassemer. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks, Phil, for the motion. I, I support that. Um, I don't suggest any changes to it. I'm appreciative that you captured um, the ability to analyze the split occurring at the quota pound level rather than quota share. I do have maybe just a a question for the analysts, uh, something that, that Corey said on the 5 to 29% that I want to make sure wouldn't be necessary to add in here by amendment or maybe through a separate motion, and it, it relates to the range. We heard in public comment um, on alternative two, there was discussion about analyzing a 5 to 29 or 10 to 29 percent range. And, and there was the, the suggestion in the GAP report to do the same for alternative one, that that was just limited to 29%. I, I, um, and when we kicked this discussion off, uh, Ms. Watson, Jessica asked a question, I think for clarification about uh, alternative two and the range that was analyzed. And though, although it was, isn't explicitly stated, I think in the alternative language itself, the response was yes, this, this analysis is capturing a range of gear switching levels. And so my question for the analysts, does that apply to alternative one also? The way our analysis is structured without explicitly stating some other level of <coughs> gear switching, does the analysis provide information to us on the impacts or effects of gear switching at levels less than 29%, if, if that makes sense? Hey, Mr. Mr. Chairman, with, with respect to the adequacy of the range, I'd like to um, ask Ms. Keeley Kent if she would like to comment on that and then um, expand as needed. Thanks. Um, so, you know, the sufficiency on the range of alternatives, we see that as a policy determination that should be made by the council collectively based on the impact analysis and the purpose and need. 
There's no bright line standard by which to evaluate whether a particular amount of gear switch landings or number of eligible permits for gear switching are, are sufficient to meet the purpose and need or to ensure fair and equitable allocations. And I'm really in looking at and thinking about, you know, reasonable alternatives, I think there's some questions that, you know, you can think about as you're evaluating them. You know, one is, does the alternative meet the objectives and fulfill the underlying need for the action? Is it technically and economically practical or feasible? And does it make common sense? All right, does that respond? Pete, do you have what you need? Um, I'm not sure, and um, I'd, I'd like to hear maybe either Jim or Jesse too about that, just what actually is captured in what we have in the way the motion is stated right now. It, as I said, it's somehow implied or built into alternative two already. Does it carry over to alternative one? Are we being informed about other ranges without explicitly stating it? Uh, Jesse. Mr. Chair, Mr. Hasmer. So in all, like we discussed, so the range of five is definitely included in alternative two. And so we'll get a uh, sense to look at what that means for the fishery over the long term in terms of having a 5% potentially like lower bound. Um, but I also think if you recall back to Jim's presentation and our analysis outline, one of the big things that we're discussing is this, um, the different scenarios and that we've previously discussed, as I mentioned to Ms. Watson, that we've looked at 0, 10, 20, and 29 or 30%. I forget what we looked at the first time. Um, we looked at a, a wide range of gear switching levels and the potential impacts to the trawl fishery under whether gear switching is constraining and whether it's not constraining. So a lot of that analysis would actually be brought into our document in terms of those assessments. So while it might not be explicitly within the alternative one description, we do have a lot of those impacts considered within the broader context of the problem. Um, and then in terms of alternative one, you're, as it's stated right now, you know, you're capped at 1.8 million or 29% of the allocation being any gear quota share. But obviously there's a lot of things to consider in terms of, or quota pounds based on um, the potential new addition. But that's not also saying that all 29% of that quota share or quota pounds could even be sweeped up and gathered by all the participants because there is going to be um, that to take into account because it's going to be spread across the 130, 60 quota share accounts that we have. And so, you know, what that looks like as well. Hopefully that helps answer your question. Okay. Yes, that, that helps. All right, is there further discussion on this motion? Jessica Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanna say that I appreciate the addition of the quota pounds under this alternative as it really speaks to what I heard from the gap and the public testimony, um, yet still maintaining that overarching direction um, of the council to acknowledge that investment in gear switchers with significant past participation. And I believe that this would standardize the qualification options under this alternative and allow the opportunity to compare this policy decision of allocation at the quota share versus quota pound level, hopefully making that comparison and the analysis easier to understand. Thank you. Anything further? Not seeing any other hands, I will call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No, no. Uh, no's from Krista and Corey. Is that correct? All right. And abstentions? Yes. Uh, Marcy Remco abstains. So the motion passes. Thank you, Phil. Uh, there are additional motions on this agenda item. Jessica. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll give Sandra a moment to bring it up. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. I move the council confirm the following statements of intent regarding the requested provisions on which council guidance is needed in F5 attachment three for the gear switching range of alternatives and request that the staff analyze alternative two according to this intent. And this number numbering follows that in that guidance document. Starting with number 10, prevent potential circumvention of qualification criteria and add provisions stated in the SAMTAC report, page A8, for exceptions that should be applied for certain circumstances of quota share account expiration and vessel replacement. For number 11, no double counting in complex ownership situations. In number 12, in complex ownership situations allow the involved owners to decide how to distribute credit for quota share accounts. For number 13, gear switching limits based on quota share should be adjusted to take into account adaptive management program AMP quota pounds dis distributions and add a safeguard statement that states nothing in these provision provisions should be construed or implemented in a fashion that allows the gear switching endorsement limit to exceed the annual vessel quota pound limit. Number 14, partial years should be included or excluded based on whichever gives the individual an improved gear switching limit. Number 15, non-endorsed trawl permits be specified as the lesser of X percentage of 10,000 pounds. In addition, the council requests council staff split alternative two based on the qualifying options of vessel or permit to reduce the complexity and confusion for the analysis. Uh, Jessica, is the language on the screen accurate and complete? It is. And I'll look for a second. Seconded by Corey Niles. Please speak to your motion. So this motion is in line with the direction of the guidance received um, in the supplemental gap report, which represents in my mind, some consensus from the trawl and fixed gear representatives on the responses to these staff questions um, covered in this motion. In addition to this guidance, similar to the guidance um, that was just put forward in the alternative one motion, the intent is to provide council staff with the leeway to modify the language of the alternatives to reflect uh, the intended to reflect the intent stated as justification. Um, I also want to express um, that my motion is meant to speak to the intent of the maker of the motion when providing this guidance to council staff on the development of the analysis. And um, speaking to that does not mean that this is an alternative that I think is preferable, just more wanting to make sure that that intent moves forward. So with regards, um, I, I also just want to state, because I'm speaking to this, um, that I want to make sure that we have everything on the table to consider with regards to information for the analysis to make the best policy decision using the best available information and provide individual participants um, the most opportunity to understand how this will impact their businesses. With regards to the individual questions and my intent, um, so for question 10, which stated out is how might the qualification criteria be adjusted to prevent potential circumvention? The intent of the original motion was not to allow circumvention of the qualifying criteria through the acquisition of qualifying permit or vessel by entities that own quota share as of the control date. Therefore, the qualification options two and three, the requirement that ownership of the quota share and vessel or permit as of and since the control date should be applied to eliminate this potential circumvention and the potential number of qualifiers to increase by the formation of new groups. And that is why with this regards to this issue of vessel that is potentially lost or upgraded or quota share account that expires before implementation, the provision stated in the SAMTAC report um, allow, speaks to the ex exceptions that should be applied. These requirements state that uh, there should be continuity of at least 50% of the ownership interest 
is needed in order for the replacement vessel or quota share account to be substituted for the originally owned vessel or quota share account without loss of qualifying opportunity. For question 11, how will the endorsement limits be determined in situations where there are one to many or many to many relationships between the qualifying permit or vessel and the quota share account? Um, regardless, there should just be no double counting. Um, for the second and third endorsement options under alternative two, the following guidance should be applied to determine the distribution of the endorsement limits among the permits where there are multiple relationships between permits and accounts. Um, so for determining endorsement limits that are based at least in part on quota share ownership, an entity should receive credit for all of the quota share in that account that they partially own. This would be similar to what was proposed for alternative one for determining endorsement limits. And I am proposing council staff to focus on using this individual approach while maintaining that high level analysis of that collective approach that was suggested in the gap report. To address the issue raised that the language of the alternative two could double count where entities that have one quota share account and multiple permits or vessels would be provided with a gear switching limit for each qualified permit or vessel. Or vessel. This is not the intent of the motion uh, as it was originally proposed um, to allow for this double counting. Uh, to address this issue, in the aforementioned situation, the credit toward the gear switching may be split among permit quota share accounts and quota share owners could be given the choice of how the quota share based credit is split among, among the permits. For situations where individuals share the ownership of both vessels and quota share accounts, the individuals would have, a, have to jointly direct NIMPS on how to distribute the resulting gear switching limits among those endorsed permits. For question 12, how should gear switching limits be determined where there is a single quota share account and multiple linked <coughs> qualifying permits or vessels? The owner or owners of each qualifying permit or vessel would have to direct NIMS on how to distribute the resulting gear switching limits among the endorsed permits. With regards to questions 13 through 14, which fall under those other alternative two issues to consider, question 13 states, should the gear switching limit formulas based on the quota share be adjusted to take into account adaptive management program quota pound distributions. The intent is to ensure that a quota share owner that gear switches is able to gear switch all of its quota pounds for the quota share it owns. Therefore, the limit should be set to the percent of quota pounds, including the AMP distributions, which would be equivalent to the quota share owned, for example, 1.1 times the quota share percentage. For question 14, should there be an adjustment to gear switching limit formulas based on gear switching history to take into account a partial year? A provision to the gear switching limit formulas based on gear switching history should include a statement that a potential year should be included or excluded based on whichever gives the individual an improved allocation. Uh, I understand based on the preliminary analysis that there are only a few individuals that this would uh, affect um, by would be affected by this provision and that overall changes in the amounts allocated for these uh, limits based on this change would be quite small in terms of the impacts on the total amount of gear switching that would be allowed. For question five, should the limits for vessels gear switching with non-endorsed trial permits be specified as a fixed amount or a percentage, a provision should be included that the limits for vessels gear switching with non-endorsed trial permits be specified as the lesser of X percentage of 10,000 pounds. The value for that percentage could be based on uh, 10,000 pounds divided by the average trawl sable fish allocation used for the baseline. Lastly, I would like to speak to my justification for splitting this alternative into separate portions. Uh, the intent here is not to change the alternative, but to separate it out based on that qualifying, qualifying asset of a vessel or a permit, given all of the complications that seem to be in the analysis by combining them. And what I'm speaking to here, having to use the term permit and vessel together, because if we split them out, it wouldn't change. Um, 
I connect, as you can tell, to the challenge we have heard in public testimony and on the council floor in discussion on the challenge of understanding the materials that have been presented to us and the alternative options and sub options um, that are outlined under this agenda item. And I echo comments commending the gap for coming to a consensus to address these questions and appreciate um, and acknowledge that industry on both sides um, for reaching out um, on their viewpoints on these to me as well. And I hope, uh, I also commend council staff um, on their presentation, their detailed reports and, and analysis outline under this agenda item. And that being said, I hope as this analysis moves forward that staff take the opportunity to continue to do a great job of trying to clarify this for us all so that we can understand the policy decisions that we are being asked to make. All right, thank you for the motion. Questions for the maker of the motion? Is, are there, is there discussion on the motion? All right, I'm not seeing any hands. Uh, so I will call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 Uh, who is I? You know what was from Krista Svensson? Uh, abstentions? Did you two? Oh, okay. Marcy abstains and Corey, were you also a no vote? Okay. So we have no votes from Krista and Corey and an abstention from Marcy Remco. The motion is carried. Thank you for the motion. Uh, is there, are there any, is there any additional, are there any additional motions to be offered or is there any further discussion? Mr. Se Dr. Seeger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and council members. Uh, and thanks for the uh, uh, thorough uh, consideration under this motion. Um, so what you've done here today is you have voted to advance your consideration of this issue. Uh, we've provided a complete and clear set of guidance on alternative one and two. Sorry. <laughs> um, on alternatives one and two, as well as a new alternative, uh, a version of alternative one that would uh, uh, use quota pounds rather than quota shares. Uh, we also have direction uh, for simplicity and clarity to uh, split alternative two into uh, two alternatives, one based on vessel qualifier and one based on the uh, permit qualifier. Uh, and I heard uh, direction that uh, the staff has some discretion to uh, modify language uh, within the, uh, that reflects the uh, intent of the uh, motion. All right, uh, Phil Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I had a question for Dr. Seeger, if I'm Please. Um, hi, Jim, how you doing? Um, the, in the JMT's report, there was some discussion about the base period. And I just wondered if you could, um, kind of give us a sense of what, if anything, might be done in terms of looking at different base periods. Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I was uh, kind of jumping the gun here just a bit in terms of the second part of your direction here was to provide any guidance on the analysis. Uh, you did have a, a GMT report uh, and an SSC report addressing uh, uh, this issue of a base period uh, that would be used for analysis. Um, the GMT uh, on the first page, third paragraph, uh, they recommend uh, use, well, first of all, the SSC recommended using some different years rather than a single average from a base period. And then the GMT took that a step further, uh, recommending uh, three years, uh, 2013, 2019, and 2021, uh, absent any other direction for, uh, from the council, uh, we would use those years unless in our examination of um, of the years, there turned out to be a better year uh, that would uh, contrast and, and illustrate something that we felt was uh, more important. Any further questions of staff or discussion on this agenda item? Corey Niles. 
Thanks, Mr. Chair. And I just would confirm with Dr. Seeger what I, thinking back to yesterday during Q&A, that those approaches, which seem great to me, are just the starting point, and you will use, I don't want to say scenario-based thinking in a very precise way, but you'll, you'll think about what might happen beyond those what we saw in those particular years as well. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, Mr. Niles. Yes, that's exactly right. These are the starting points uh, for uh, looking at the impacts, and then we look at uh, more likely qualitatively, but we look at how things might vary under under different conditions where we could spot them that there would be a substantial difference in the performance of an alternative. All right. Is there anything further on this agenda item? All right. And what do you think? Are, are we done here? I think we are now done. And again, I really appreciate all the, uh, a lot of hard work went into uh, this over the last few days uh, in particular. And uh, I appreciate uh, all the attention that was given to it. Well, it wasn't necessarily easy, but we got it done. Many thanks to staff and council members. Um, and we have completed agenda item F5. And I guess this topic will come back to us in September. Well, that will conclude. Um, wait, I'm sorry. There's actually that, uh, if I may, Mr. Chairman, that uh, uh, coincides with the tap on the shoulder I just got from my uh, my uh, co-staff member here on this. Uh, and this will be coming back to you, uh, hopefully with the full analysis in November. Uh, we have added a few things here. We don't think that that will uh, create any problems uh, getting back to November, but there is a chance that it will. And if it does, we will report to that to you at your September meeting under workload planning so you can take that into account. All right, very good. Thank you for the clarification. All right, uh, I'll turn to our executive director to see if there are any announcements. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman and council members. Um, very nice work today. Um, I don't have any large announcements, but looking ahead to tomorrow, there are a couple of large, large items. Um, top of the list, of course, is our ground fish specs. I understand that is all coming together quite well. Uh, the GMT has even adjourned their meeting, I believe. Um, so uh, we're, we're looking good there. And then we have marine planning in the afternoon, another large item. So that's what we're looking forward to tomorrow. Um, other than that, I don't have anything else in terms of an announcement, Mr. Chairman. All right, everyone have a good evening. We'll see you in the morning.